Uh, a, a little bit of confusion of getting into the actual studio, but now we are live and, uh, you know, uh, we can just start the session. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us at Pakistan User Group's event. I'll just hand thank over you to you. Input. I'll just bring your screen up and then all good. Yep. All good. Your Thanks. screen is up and all good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, Welcome to this session um, covering Dynamics 365 Commerce and Fraud Protection. Uh, my name is Patrick Short. I'm a cloud solution architect from Microsoft. Um, I cover uh, Dynamics 365 Commerce, Fraud Protection, uh, Supply Chain Management and other areas of our Dynamics ERP solution. And today I'm going to focus on uh, commerce, which is the e-commerce side of things, our B2C and our B2B. And I'm also going to talk about fraud protection. So what is Dynamics 365 Commerce? So Dynamics 365 Commerce delivers an end-to-end -end, uh, management retail functionality by a headless uh, commerce engine and through our headquarters. So it enables connected unified through our um, unified headless engine, as I mentioned. Um, and Commerce is also built to support our natively out of the box Dynamics Finance and Supply Chain Management. You can also connect Dynamics 365 Commerce to any other ERP solution and maybe a third party solution like Oracle, SAP, or any other the ERP solutions that are out there. So Dynamics Commerce supports both traditional and emerging channels. The solution natively enables install call center, um, our e-commerce solution, but it also supports emerging channels like marketplace, um, social, and also things like chat box, virtual agents, and those sorts of things. This enables uh, commerce to deliver both customer and business facing outcomes, um, creating seamless shopping experience for our customers um, automating through virtual agents and empowering store agents to deliver more customer service uh, through the different uh, components of commerce. So combining this all together, uh, we get a full unified solution that delivers uh, omnichannel experience to our customers. And of course, all this sits on top of our uh, Azure global infrastructure. Um, so it's scalable, um, and secure and reliable. And what does it give you? It gives you the ability to deploy commerce pretty much anywhere. Um, so you could have your back office in one country. You could deploy a cloud scale unit into a different country. Uh, we give you the ability to deploy hardware into a store. Um, you could have a pop-up store somewhere else. So we have different options around cloud points of sale and modern point of sale. So modern point of sale is when you install the point of sale onto a device. A cloud point of sale is directly to the internet. Um, so again, you could have a pop-up store. Sometimes you walk through a supermarket or shopping center and you see pop-up stores there and you can do that with commas as well. If we take a look at uh, some of the, the component architecture of commerce, if I start on the left-hand side here, this is lifecycle services, and this is where you deploy Dynamics 365 commerce. The next one along here is our back office. Um, this is where our call center users, so customers call up, they might wanna put an order through, um, and any back office users. Now they can connect into the Dynamics 365 commerce, but there's also the ability to other parts of dynamics included like supply chain or finance or HR. In the middle area here, we have the ability to have all the different components in store. As I mentioned before, we have a modern point of sale. Um, we also have a cloud point of sales. We can install hardware stations and we have the ability to connect through a number of different devices that's iOS or Android. And this connects into our commerce scale unit. Okay, and I'll talk about these other components shortly. Uh, over to the right here, we have our customers that can connect through our e-commerce site. Now our e-commerce site is B2C, business to a consumer or business to a customer, and also B2B, which is business to business. 
and I'll talk a little about more about those um, as we go through. So on the right hand side here is our site design administrators. So this is where we build our sites and we, they will connect into our site builder and the site builder is where we store all our pages, our templates to make up our website. Um, we would also install in here all our digital assets, things like videos, images, um, and we can also um, update and change and manage and have full controls over ratings and reviews that we have put on to our site. Moving over back to the middle here, our common scale unit also connects into other areas like a cloud powered search. So you can have advanced and smart powered search on your website. We also connect into Dynamics Fraud Protection, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Um, and then we have some smarts around commerce AI, making recommendations, best buyers, those sorts of things. And of course there's analytics, customer insights. All of these connect into our other solutions as well. We might have sales, marketing, commerce, uh, customer service, field service. Um, and also we can do the power platform, you know, power apps and power BI. So let me touch on uh, B2B for a second. So our business to business um, uh, solution. So we provide a B2B e-commerce solution um, for Dynamics 365. It covers a wide range of industries um, and we give a B2B, a B2C feel in our B2B platform. B2C was the first platform we released and now we have that B2B solution as well. So we're providing the same similar functionality, but other components that a B2B business would utilize. So if I look at some of the key features that we have in our B2B platform, because you're dealing with a, a business, so let's say I'm a business and in this case Fabricam and I'm selling fashion items, another business might want to purchase off me and sell those fashion items themselves. So as a business, I can onboard a business partner. I can review and approve that request. Then I can give that business a admin access to the uh, B2B platform, and then they can onboard additional users. They can also set things like spending limits. So let's say I'm an admin of another business. I've allowed some of my users to purchase directly from the B2B platform. Um, I can set spending limits for them. Um, ordering capabilities, there's a whole bunch of features and so forth around our ordering. Um, we can set ordering grids. We could have ordering templates. So in the example here, we're saying, okay, because I'm a business, I'm not like a consumer. So if I go to a consumer site, um, I might purchase a pair of jeans and a pair of um, shoes and maybe a jacket and a shirt. If I'm buying from another business, I'm probably more than likely going to buy in bulk. So, you know, I might want to buy a grid buy here of sunglasses and I might buy a hundred of each as opposed to being a consumer. So we can set up templates. As a business, I can also set other things like minimum, maximum and multiple order quantities. And an important one down here is I can support on account payment. So when I'm a consumer and I go to a site, I usually hand over my credit card. I might use PayPal or something like that to pay for my items. If you purchase business to business, you might have an account. So then you can put whatever you purchase onto an account and you can pay it later. So if we have a look at um, the other side of that, so we can look at our history. So once we've purchased an item, we can see what other people have brought. If I'm the administrator, I wanna see what other people in my business have brought. Um, I support through the platform account statement in invoices. So again, I can come in and go, okay, I wanna see uh, what I've been purchasing. I would like the information around how much money I've spent. We also support payment for on sales invoices. Um, so in other words, I could come back in, log back in and go, you know what, I need to pay off some of the things that I've been purchasing um, and I can pay it directly through the B2B site. Um, this also integrates to Dynamics 365 for sales. 
um, and other areas you can integrate it into other solutions as well but it fits nicely in with Dynamics 365 to sales so that's our B2B we cover B2C and B2B and shortly we'll be doing I'll go through a demo and I'll show you the platforms but let's talk about fraud protection for a second so why is Microsoft in the fraud business okay we're in the fraud business because we are among the top 10 e-tailers and we are prime target for fraudsters. Um, we found that other services didn't meet our needs, so we had to design something for ourselves. So we designed something for Dynamics, which is Dynamics Fraud Protection. We have many different um, online sites. I'm sure some of you have probably utilized some of these sites before, along with our physical stores, although there's not that many of our physical stores um, anymore. Um, considering the world we live in with COVID, most of the things are online. We have days where uh, we have revenue over $100 million, and we have days where attempted fraud is over $10 million. So we have to protect our business, and we've pretty much seen it all. You know, some examples of uh, fraud that we've seen um, in the US, we have foreclosed homes. So what was happening is people would have stolen credit cards. They will make purchases online. They'll get the items shipped to a foreclosed uh, house or building. Um, and then at the end of the day, the fraudsters would come around in a van and collect all the items that have come throughout the day and drive off. Um, so there's all sorts of fraud that can happen. Um, from a customer's point of view, the journey for them, um, if I'm a consumer and I want to sign up to a, a business, um, the first thing I would come along and do is the first component would be around identity. So maybe an anonymous user, when I first come to a site, I might create an account and then I log into the account and then I have some account activities. On the purchasing side, you would hope that all the purchasing goes smoothly um, and I pay for my items, I get my items. And occasionally there's things that happen on the post purchase. You know, there's something wrong with an item. I might have to return it, um, whatever that may be. I'm exchange an item as well. So this is a typical journey and that's a smooth uh, type of journey. But where does fraud come into this? So fraud can cause all sorts of problems. So from an identity point of view, there could be fake accounts set up. Um, there could be abuse of discounts as a business that you're providing. Um, there could be uh, fake reviews put up. On the purchasing side, there could be uh, stolen credit cards, unauthorized purchase, uh, rewards from fraud. And on the post-purchase side, there could be things like re, uh, returns fraud, abusive refunds. Um, so there's all sorts of things that uh, could happen uh, on the journey of the business and signing up, purchasing and post-purchase. So where does Dynamics 365 fraud uh, protection come in and what are the capabilities? So from the left-hand side here, we offer account protection. We have some smarts in Dynamics 365 um, fraud. So it's a smart AI technology to help pick up some of these uh, fraudster activities or abuses to a business. And they're broken down into three areas. So account protection, purchase protection, and loss prevention. So these two here, the account protection and purchase protection is all about that online activity. So that could be signing up to uh, account creation or it could be logging into your account. There's also the purchasing side. So when I go to purchase an item, is that transaction going to go through? Is the bank going to accept when I put that credit card through? Will it be accepted? Is that credit card being stolen? So there's some smart technology there to help with these uh, that side of the transaction. And the last part here is loss prevention. Now loss prevention is all about investigating potential fraud into your bricks and mortar store. So the shops you see down the street, when you walk down the street, you might see a shop. Um, this is all about digging in and analyzing the transactions in your bricks and mortar store. Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, uh, we'll start with uh, e-commerce. 
So let's take a look at our e-commerce platform. I'll just change screens here. Bring that one up. There we go. All right. Okay, so what we see here is our e-commerce platform. Now, with Dynamics 365 Finance and Operations, uh, you still need to uh, deploy through lifecycle services. For those of you who on the call know lifecycle services and how lifecycles work, I've deployed finance and operations, and I have a component here around manage, which is all around my e-commerce site. And if I go into Dynamics 365, well, that's refreshing, and that one's refreshing. Let's wait for these to refresh. There we go. Yeah. All right, well, they're refreshing. We'll jump into our uh, e-commerce site. So this is our e-commerce branded site. Now, what we can do from a Microsoft perspective is we can deploy an e-commerce site just like this one out of the box in a matter of minutes. So it doesn't take long to get these sites up and running. We've got, when we deploy uh, e-commerce called the first run experience, and we deploy, this is called a Fabricam theme. So this is the theme site that we run, and we're going to go through, have a look at what that looks like in a second. I just want to check uh, dynamics here. Okay. So on the tab manage, this is my cloud scale unit, which I mentioned during the presentation. So it's been deployed. Here's my e-commerce component. So I've deployed my e-commerce component, my site builder, which I mentioned earlier, where you do all your work on your pages and everything, and we'll see that in a second. And here's my e-commerce site. If I click on my e-commerce site, it's just going to take me here. In the back end here, I still have my Dynamics 365 retail and everything that's connected to my uh, Fabricam site is pulled through from Dynamics 365. We have a concept of online stores, which is channels. And in this case, I'm using the Fabricam as standard online. And when I set up this store as a B2B site, I set up things like payment methods. I set up my modes of delivery and my modes of delivery are things like, okay, what transport method am I using? Am I allowing pickup in store or curbside pickup? What sort of payment methods am I going to offer? Am I going to offer credit card? What about loyalty? What about rewards? Um, what are my options there? And assortment. So assortments are the items that I'm going to actually um, show to my customers um, what they're going to see um, and that'll pull through from my site. So if I jump into my Fabricam site, let's have a look at what it looks like to do an end-to-end an -end transaction through my B2C site. So you've seen up here on the right-hand side, um, I've signed in already. On the far right, you can see that I've got cart. I could do a search. So if I do a shirts on, say, shoes, the smart shirts is going to go through and it's going to start looking for things around shoes. So I'll do a search here. Oops. Go, try it again. Now, this site is sitting in the US, so it could be a little bit slower here. But here's my categories of different shoes. It says, OK, what sort of shoes are you chasing? Is it men's shoes, suede shoes, leather shoes? I'm going to select just the category of shoes down here. Now that brings up many different options. It's saying um, that I can do more refineries, I can do more filtering, I could scan through my shoes, um, or I might go, okay, I see the navigation bars up here. So the navigation options here are pulled through from Dynamics. If I go to menswear and I look at shoes, I can see my shoes here. I've got some information around my shoes. Scroll down here, I'll go, you know what? I like these shoes, they look pretty good. I can see some information. I can make some data selections here. 
I'll say, you know what, give me a pair of shoes, a regular here, a color, a brown. The other thing while that's coming through, the images are coming through down the bottom here, you can see related products and things that are related to the shoes. I'm buying shoes, so it's showing me more shoes. Down the bottom here, I can write reviews. I've got to be a customer to sign in uh, to write a review. So you can see the reviews down the bottom as well. If I go back up here, I can see my images coming through here. This is a pair of shoes I like. Some important things here in my buy box. It tells me that there's overnight shipping available. This is pulled through from Dynamics. Another important component here, it says, hey, you have the ability to buy now and pick up in store. These are the options you have. You can in-store pickup or curbside pickup. You can even find a store. So what I do, I add this to my bag first. Up the top here, it's given me a notice to say, hey, this is in your bag now. Okay, I'll quickly buy another pair of shoes. Okay, I'll just buy these sneakers here. I'll add those to my bag as well, select the size. Oops, size required, yep, put it there. Should add, let's see what that adds. Just a bit of uh, slow there. Keep going so slow, there we go, it's better. All right, yeah. Let's add that to my bag. So at the moment, I've got two things in my uh, shopping cart. I'm just going to sign in here because I'm a uh, user. Now, when I sign in, it then the case to Azure B2C to say, yes, I'm a, a known customer. I've signed in. I haven't needed to sign up. You could sign up as well. So I'm happy with this. Let's go view my shopping bag and see what I've got here. Now in here, I've got two bits of shoes. You notice that up the top here, I've got a banner that's scrolling through and it says, hey, if I buy two pairs of shoes or more, I'll get a discount. So I'm happy with the discount here. I'm going to pick up an item here. I'm going to say, you know what? I want to pick this up in store. I can't wait for it to be posted to me. So let's have a look. I can see, okay, the store information, when it's open, availability, it's in stock. Yes, I will. I'll pick that up in store. Okay. So now we're looking here at the top here. It says you pick up. You're going to pick this up at San Francisco store, and this one's going to be shipped to me. I'm going to check out. So once I've checked, come to the checkout. You notice on the right hand side here, shipping hasn't been calculated yet. It's telling me, hey, by the way, you want to pick this up in store. As a business, I've got pickup dates and pickup times. So I can set that up in Dynamics. I'll set that up in the back end to say, hey, I'm only allowing um, people to come and pick up either curbside or inside uh, in store at certain times. So if I come here, I can make a selection um, as a customer. I'm going, I'm going to pick that up at that time. The other item is going to be shipped to me. It's telling me this is where it's going to be shipped to. Now at the top right hand side, my shipping still yet to be calculated. So I'll come down here and go, yep, I'm happy with that. No, I want these overnight. I save and continue and this will update my shipping. Now that shipping information is again, again coming from Dynamics. I come down to payment method type and I can put in a gift card if I want to do a gift card. Um, or I can use a credit card. So I've got one on file here that I'll use. I'll save and continue. Okay, I'm happy with everything I've got. I can see more information about my cart. I can go and edit my cart if I want to. I'm happy with everything there. I'm going to place my order. So now we've got confirmation. I've got confirmation and order number. I could have a QR code. So what could happen is I could drive to the store if it's a curbside pickup or in a, uh, if I'm parked in the uh, car park, 
um, a shop assistant could come out and scan the barcode, have my order. They could tell me, put it in the boot of the car. So then there's that contactless uh, type of shopping. It's telling me here the details, pick up in store, uh, the time I'm supposed to go into the store to pick it up, it shows me the item. This is the one getting shipped to me. So if I look on the other side of that, as a business, I would go through, there's a number of batch jobs that would be running. As a customer, I've walked into the store and I've said, I'm here to pick up my item. So this is my cloud point of sale you're seeing once it um, loads up, as opposed to the modern point of sale. Remember the modern point of sale, uh, you install it on a device. In this case, it's a cloud point of sale. So I've come into the store. There's a number of different ways you can find the order. If I'm a cashier in the store, I can see the items that I need to go and get throughout the store. You can see some of these are already picking, packed and so forth. This has been accepted. It tells me the delivery date and time for uh, items to be picked up. So we're gonna select this one right here and we're gonna go pick up. It's telling me that I'm picking up my leather lace-up boots. That's okay. And I'll pick this item up. So at this point in time, um, you have the ability to use the available payment method, which is the payment method we used at the start when I was the consumer and I used the credit card. You also have the ability as a cashier to ask the customer if they would like to use a different payment method. So they might want to pay with cash or a different credit card or wherever it may be. I'm happy with that. I'm just going to use the one that's on file and off we go. Okay, I'm going to pick the item up. It's going to bring it to uh, the cashier terminal. I can see all the information I need. In this case, uh, two items. I'm only here to pick up the leather boots. Um, and I'm happy with that. It's going to go on the credit card and I finish off this order. So that gives you the the end to end process. But quickly before we go to show you how easy it is to edit a page. So everything you ju I've just shown you is out of the box. There's no customizations. There's no extensions. That is completely out of the box. It's pretty easy. Down on the left hand side here, we have different options, pages, products, fragments and so forth. So it's pretty easy to edit things and you can just come in here. For example, my homepage, if I come in here, I can change things directly from here. So it gives uh, everyone the ability or the site authors to come in here and make changes. The great thing about making changes in here, you can preview things before you actually publish them to a live site. So there's lots of options in here to do things. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough time today to get into the details of uh, everything, but I'll quickly show you here. You saw the carousel. This is my home page I'm looking to edit. I've actually already got it into edit, but if I come down here to my carousel block, okay, I can see the different carousel that are running through. And you can see that I've got some text up the top here. If I wanted to change something there, I can easily change it. Say hello. Okay, and you can see it's changed in my carousel. My carousel is still scrolling, but you can see it's changed right here. Hello, everyone. But my live site hasn't changed. It's my live site. I'm still um, scrolling through. I haven't updated my live site. So I come back here. I have the ability to preview this. So I can preview this. Uh, Fabricam in a preview mode. Make sure it's previewing. This one's gone back. Okay. Yeah, it's taking a bit of time today, but that's okay. All right. So while that's waiting, because we don't have too much longer, I want to make sure that everyone gets to see fraud protection. So let me jump to fraud protection. I'll just bring that up on my screen here. Okay, so this is Dynamics 365 fraud protection. So in fraud protection, as I mentioned before, 
Um, when you come in here, there's information around how you connect things. There's information around you might want to take a tour and so forth. When I did my PowerPoint presentation, I talked about the online components around account creation, there's account logins, there's purchase as well. So if I go to fraud protection, there's some smarts in here. For example, there's a bot score. So there's an AI for us. There's um, smart AI technology that scores things. So for example, if I'm creating an account, I can have a bot score and it'll automatically create a bot score for me. I can also set up rules. Now, an example of a rule is something like, I've got a rule here called risky countries. And what that means is I have certain countries, let's say I'm a business in the EU and I'm not allowed to trade with certain countries or people from certain countries aren't allowed to purchase from me. So you see here, I have a user on embargo country list. So what that means is if there's a user trying to create account or trying to log into an account from one of these countries that I've said you uh, I can't trade with, then that is rejected. Okay, and what that means on the right hand side here, you can see a, a lot of this, it's called payload sample. This is a sample of the payload that would be sent from my e-commerce site to fraud protection. And what does that mean? So let me show you what that means. I have a, uh, just trying to find my store, here we go. This is my uh, store. I've got a, a very simple store that I've got running in memory. I've signed up, I've gone to the top and said, I want to register as a user. In this case, I've said, filled out the information and I'm set off on Cuba. Now, Cuba is one of the countries that I, is an embargo country. So when I hit account protection APIs, it's going to run and it's going to send that information to fraud. And down here, before I get there, it's telling me straight away, um, you're rejected by fraud protection. And what's happened is that when I've done the sign up, it sent a request to fraud protection with the payload, you see the information here. It's picked up that the place I've got country region of CU, which is Cuba. And the fraud protection response on the right hand side here, has gone through that, it's found a rule that says reject any countries that are on the embargo list. So Ford has done its job. It's put a risk call around this, but I've set up a rule back in Ford that said, let me just get out of that one. Find fraud, it's gone on me again. There we go. So I set up a rule that says, if you're on that embargo countries list, you will be rejected. So you can see there how the fraud protection can help with the account creation site. If I go to account login, it's very similar. We've got some smart AIs here as well to say, hey, there's people logging in. Down the bottom here says, is any rules being hit? No, there hasn't been any rules. So the people or the consumers logging in, it's all good at this stage. But again, I could have rules around my account login, okay? And it could be countries, it could be all sorts of things. It's up to the merchant to make those rules. Okay, so if I go back to account creation, you would have seen that got rejected. So if I go down the bottom here, it tells you here, risky country rule. There's been six attempts from country. Um, so you can see that rule's been pushed into play. All right, so let's look at the purchasing side. So these again, still this online component. So if I go to purchasing, there's the purchasing dashboard, which will come up in a second. And it gives you some information around what transactions are happening in your business. There's also the ability to set rules around purchasing and there's the ability to diagnose some of the data. So just waiting for this to load and load in a second. And then we'll start digging into some of these uh, different areas. So if I take a look up the top here, it's still pulling through. This is my scorecard.
up the top, it's going to say volume of transactions. It's going to show me approval rates. It's going to show me a bank acceptance rate and any chargeback. Now, chargebacks, things where a consumer has said to the bank, um, I'm sorry, but that charge shouldn't be against my credit card. And then that's pushed back to the merchant. And the merchant has to not only they might lose a stock, they also have to uh, pay for the refund back to the bank. Okay, so that's running a little bit slow through there today, tonight. We'll let that keep going while I look at the rules. So again, you can set up rules in here. Um, you can see a rule here that says anything around jewelry, high, high end stuff or high end things that a merchant might be selling, you could set up a rule. Um, and again, we're back to embargo in countries where I can't sell to certain countries. So if someone tries to purchase a jewelry from me, they're rejected. So there's some rules there you can set up as well. So I'll just jump back here to see if the uh, scorecards come up. Oh, well, that's going. We'll jump into diagnose and we'll look at some of the data that we have. All right, so what we can see in here now, this is just sample data, but you can get all sorts of data. You can upload historical data from uh, merchants or from a business. So in here, we have the dollar value of our reported transaction. So as a business, this is USD. Um, if we work along here, it says total value dollar reported fraud events. So fraud protection is saying there's about 47K USD of fraud. Okay, there's some other information along here as well. What we want to do is jump down to here. It tells me by count or by value. It says, okay, the risk score range. So our smart AIs put some risk scores around some of these transactions. So I'm going to say, okay, I'll put in 50 here. Show me everything around 50. So what it's saying is the red is saying that, hey, these are more than likely fraud transactions. The green ones are non-fraud transactions. So as a business, you can start looking over these and go, oh, okay, some of that's fraud. Is it a lot of fraud? Okay, $17 or 17, sorry, counts as opposed to value. I can change the value if I wanted to. Down the bottom here, you can look at your model performance and you can go, okay, what happens on the left is reject all transactions, accept all transaction. If I reject all transactions or close to, if I go down the bottom here, it says number of fraudulent transactions rejected, 1,149 out of the 1,500. As a business, that's probably not a good idea. On the value side of things, that's terrible. I'm going to reject $28,000 or more of transactions based on uh, some of the fraud. Now, not everything's fraud. This is just showing what potential fraud can be. So not everything up the top here in red is fraud. It's just showing the merchant and business of things that you should investigate. So if I look at, if I use my slider and say, look, anything with a risk score, let's say around 80, what will that do to my business? Well, that's only going to reject 14 transactions and it's going to be $166. So as a business, that's probably a pretty good thing. You go, okay, so I might make some rules that any risk scores that come back over 80 and above, we will not allow those to go through. Now down the bottom here, I can see my top five risk factors. There could be frauds picking up. There's some suspicious IP addresses. IP addresses could be known addresses, which caused problems before. There's uh, risky prepaid uh, cards that have been used and a couple of other options here. All right, so the last one I wanna talk about is loss prevention. Now I mentioned before the first three here are all about those online transactions, all about the uh, e-commerce site that you might be utilizing, um, about uh, customers signing up or logging or doing purchase. So that's all online. The last one here is loss prevention. Now loss prevention is all about your bricks and mortar stores and looking at transactions within those stores. So you can upload, you can go to a business and go, can I have your historical transactions? And you can upload these transactions into fraud protection. A fraud protection will go away and run certain rules um, over those transactions and see where there's potential to be fraud. Now, if I take a look at this here, 
I see my loss prevention. There's some data that I've uploaded already. It's telling me the revenue opportunity based on staff data. So this is the staff side of things. On the other side here, it's based on terminal data. So, you know, as a business or as a merchant, you have cashiers that come in and there could be 10, 15 people using the same device. Whereas uh, there might be staff that use, use a single device. So you start digging into the data here a little bit. We've got our risk score range, which has been associated by our machine learning and AI. So I'm not interested in zero, but I'm probably interested in everything from about 500 and above. And I can start digging in here. And it's telling me that my staff count by month and score bin is saying, hey, this is unlikely to be fraud, but this here looks like very likely to be fraud. So if I start going, okay, November 2018, looks like a lot of fraud in these places. I drill down a little bit further here. I can see staff and terminals, some information around the score counts. I look down here at staff ID. Obviously, I haven't got names associated with this. But if I go down a little bit further here on the right-hand side, I see a maximum score. So that's my maximum risk score, which is 999. I see average score and how many times this has happened. Now, if I'm a merchant, I'm a business, and I'm looking into this data, I'll be going, oh, this one's happened five times. So let's look into this staff member. So I'll click on this staff member. And I start digging into this staff member to find out what's going on. Now, this staff member could be, it could be a simple not being trained very well. It could be lacking some training, um, or it could be actually really could be fraud. So we start looking down here and we can see, look, average score out of 999 is 748. Now that's quite high. So you start digging further and you go, okay, so the staff score is high. The average score of the entire population, which means all my other staff members is quite low compared to them. So if I look at September, it's very high. I start digging into how we've got those uh, numbers or percentages, and you can see here there's some reasons. Cash to card return ratio, no, that looks okay. Discounted items sold with no discount. So this staff member has been giving discounts on an item when there was no discount available. I go down here, I can see, okay, return ratio. So there's a lot of returns coming back in with this staff member, okay? Then there's without, uh, without versus a receipt. So again, the staff members bring in returns and the customer's got no receipts. I jump down here, I can start digging into these areas more if I wanna dig into the areas more. And another important thing down here, you can see that these are the transactions over the last six months for this staff member. And you can start digging down further. You can see a lot of returns here um, and so forth. This one here has got a purchase amount for this transaction of zero, but they've come in and we've given them $1,600 back without anything being purchased. So again, this is obviously fraud, fraud on the consumer side, maybe not the staff side. So it could be some training for the staff. Uh, one last thing here is you see this little icon, icon here. It's basically saying, hey, by the way, this terminal that this staff member has been using is also highly ranked as a risk. In other words, that terminal is a problem as well. And it could be good reasons for that. If you go to any stores where returns are always go to the same area, that could just be normal. But again, it's it gives the merchants and the business uh, a tool to look into things more. So just wary of my time there. Um, so that gives you a bit of an idea on fraud and also our e-commerce uh, platform. That was great. That was great overview, Patrick. Right, I'll just and jump. I think I've got two minutes it. to go. Let me just jump back here. Come on, am I still good? Yeah, that's great. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, perfect. So that was a very great overview, Patrick. And I really enjoyed myself being a, a retail consultant as well. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we are just on time and we have our next speaker in line, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll leave you by asking just one simple question. Uh, sure. Then what will be your message after, after 
um, showing these you know functionalities around fraud production to the clients who have finance and operations, but they are not onto D365 commerce um, functionalities with respect to e-commerce and fraud production. Good question. So you don't need Dynamics 365 Commerce or any Dynamics solution. So Dynamics 365 Fraud Protection is a standalone solution. So you can use it with any other uh, ERP or other e-commerce solutions, Shopify, uh, Manigo, uh, the other ones. Um, so it's a standalone solution. So yeah, great question. You don't need finance and operations or commerce to use fraud protection. That's great. I think that will help a lot of um, customers in the industry because that's something, you know, with uh, with the situations now where people are more, uh, you know, getting more footprints digitally on their business, that will be a great um, advantage. Thank you so much, Patrick, and no hoping I'd to like see to you see, soon uh, again. No yeah, problems yeah. at all. Thank you very much, and thank you for the invite. Thank you so much. All right. So with this, uh, we have... Uh, now our next speaker with us um, and uh, if you live in Pakistan or in the region uh, and you use LinkedIn you must have to know Ali so Ali yeah. is with us Ali how are you? I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful to you to give me a chance to present myself here so uh, thank you Thank you so much, Ali. So, um, I will you hand over karunga. I think your session will be mostly in Urdu. So, we will be able to do the power BI. Mixture, mixture hai English or Urdu. I plan to do English. Mein hai. Lekin, uh, let's see, Urdu is not going to be English. Mein chahe, mixture is going to be English. Because in Dubai, we will English. We will communicate with the Dubai. So, we will see English. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it to you. Thank you so much. Yes. I am going to share my screen and uh, sure. and uh, this is and I am uh, uh, off the cam. So you can see my Perfect. screen. I'm, uh, so again, I'm uh, thankful to all of you to joining this boot, boot camp and I uh, got opportunity to present myself here. Uh, welcome, Ahlan was Ahlan. So who am I? My name is Ali Reza Zaidi, or currently I'm working for a business expert girl in the Middle East region, Dubai region, and I was MVP for 2013 to 2018 for five years. And you can reach my website tech.alirazaidi.com. I usually share whatever I learned and experience on my, uh, my, my website. Twitter handler is Ali Reza Zaidi, and I'm now working on my YouTube channel, upload whatever I experience, learn and share on this, my YouTube channel. And this YouTube channel is also, link is available here. My primary focus is supply chain. I'm sometimes I'm doing trainings. I'm a technical consultant, functional consultant, financials, and primary focus Power BI platform, uh, for Power Platform is Power BI. So I'm currently working in, uh, in Dubai, but I am Pakistan based so what you learn about to learn is session can that up kya seekho ke yeah what i am going to share first is why what why and why uh, what why and how power bi a very brief uh, introduction definitely then i will share you okay uh, what comes with the d65 for finance and operation and try my best to share at least two uh, dashboards that comes with d65 for finance and operations then will I go for how to connect with DCT5 for finance and option, uh, operations, uh, con options, what are options are available, entity store, uh, OData feeds, Excel add-on, something, all those things. And then I go for uh, QA, a question answer session. So possible some questions, so I will answer all those questions. So this is the agenda where I'm sharing you. So first question is, what is Power BI? So as per my understanding, Power BI is a suit of business analytics tools, a group of suit of applications as well as services that uh, that help us to help end user to just a minute. Where goes my uh, that that help end user to produce a stunning or good uh, Power BI dashboards. So if you search on Google, Magic Quadrant analytics and business intelligence so you found this dash uh, this screen this uh, uh you found uh, this uh, quadrant and it shows that microsoft power bi is among the leaders 
So this uh, this picture, this diagram, or this quadrant is shared by Gartner. And who are Gartner? Gartner is basically an advisory firm hai, that helps IT consultant, managers, supply chain, uh, whatever the, those guys who are responsible for taking the scenes, they give them a guideline. So how they make it? They have uh, some feedback from uh, IT consultants, managers, supply chain, who are the responsible, they uh, query them to get some feedback from there. And from there, they are ma uh, making these reports. And these reports are basically are uh, used for Just a minute. These reports are basically used for the analysis how product works in a market and helps to different decision making uh, object uh, bodies to take decision that we have to use this uh, product or not. So again, I'm asking again why we have a Power BI. So it uh, according to Gartner, twenty to fifty thousand organizations are using. Uh, Power BI and Fortune 500, 97 percent of Fortune 500 are using Power BI. Uh, now, data source. We talk about data sources. More than 350 data sources available in Power BI. And if you want to connect with any type of almost any type of uh, data source, the connector is available in Power BI. Aap kisi ka naam le, if you take name of data source, that is functionality is already available. So you Connect with uh, connect with data data source or fetch data with no time. Then it's a so simple. It's a so simple that it said that if you have expertise in Excel, then you can make stunning dashboards and reports based on uh, in Power BI. And more interestingly and more powerful features that you are either you have to ship a graphic report banate or PBX file, then you can share that file to, uh, directly to anyone. If you don't want to publish it or if you publish it then without no effort it's available on laptop it's available on tab it's available on mobile without any efforts it will be available to any type of device that can be accessed so that is the most uh, uh, enhanced feature then it's a part of already if you're familiar with excel or microsoft office then its interface is very uh, comfortable comfort most of the users are comfortable with due to they are already working excel word or like all like these applications then it's a part of d65 suite of uh, applications it's a part of our already embedded dashboards in it so what are the components of power bi majorly it says a three but as per for our concern it's a two one is Power BI Desktop. I will share you share you when my screen and uh, explore all those things. So Power BI Desktop is a tool that will be going to install on your machine. It's available for creating data analysis and report creation. It has in, a powerful feature like Query Editor, and it's free, almost free, up to one GB is free. If you go for one more than one GB, then you have to go for a purchase pro version. Otherwise, uh, if you have a data for one GB, it holds data for one GB and it's almost free. Then comes a Power, Power BI service. Power BI service is a cloud version of Power BI and we can edit report at some extent, not much detail uh, as in Power BI desktop it, um, because it is lack of query editor. Major purpose for Power BI service is to share and distribute reports. This picture will uh, give you a little more uh, you can say uh, experience about uh, uh, in this picture will be shared more detail about how Power BI works and how what is the possible architecture of it. Suppose I have a three data sources. One is in Excel, second is DB2, and third is SQL Server. So we consume these data sources into Power BI Desktop and create reports. We will perform our transformations. We add, remove columns, we merge data, and whatever the result we want to. Uh, create we we create in power bi and then we make a visualizations and may, these reports will be published on to the power bi and we publish it and goes to powerbi.com and from there you can access it on mobile tablet and desktop so this is the simplest architecture or you can say that this way the power bi works so if uh, let me go for my 
desktop i will share you in more detail so this is the power bi desktop it has uh, now I'm, uh, it has three screens first screen is about where you is it called report designer jahan par aap different visualizations drop karte ho aur usko connect karte ho you can connect with the different data sources and make a stunning visualization and if you see these are the list of this is the canvas <coughs> where you uh, design the, your report and this is the visualizations all those tools are available from there you can drag any type of uh, chart you you can drop on this screen and here is the field or you can see that these if i am um, select this field uh, this uh, you can say this view is uh, view then this is the calendar or fields which you can select any uh, it shows the fields that is dropped or connected with this screen then comes a query window and query window uh, is a where then when you connect with the data so and uh, data source and data fetch into the power bi and here data is, is hold into the inside the power bi where you can transform any column for example some places date and times are coming and you did not require time so you can transform it and then some places uh, uh, there is digital uh, um, digit value or real value so you don't want a uh, digits or digits so you can convert into whole and uh, whole numbers and similarly you can add and remove different types of calculations for example some calculated columns and some calculated measures i will share you in upcoming slides what the difference between the uh, calculated columns as well as what is the difference between the uh, between the cal uh, measures measure call measurement so the, uh, and then comes uh, calendar uh, then comes a uh, model window in model window we can even uh, one thing i miss even we can create a custom tables with query in this query window for example if i go to this calendar and here you can see i mentioned a uh, query and at a result i got a custom table so all those operations which required to transform a data we we have to do here in query window and then comes a uh, model so here we make a relationship between different tables uh, for example parent child relationship in a simple word if you are working as a layman and if you are a it consultant or have a background for it or knowledge then primary foreign key and primary key relationships you can define here and this here whatever relationship you define this is the basics for creating a filters for example if if i, if I go here you can see data is modified uh, shapes are changing with respect to where i select so all those relationships all those uh, visualizations and changes are happened due to these uh, uh, relationship or uh, primary key second uh, primary key or foreign key relationships between created between the tables so this is the power bi desktop and now i'm going to share you what is the power bi.com which are already shared where we deploy our uh, uh, where we deploy our dashboard and include or show uh, our mobile or in our d65 for finance and operation for example if i go back and publish this report and is asked me that where you want to publish so i uh, currently i'm working on a free account and i connected my environment with uh, or with, with the help of on prem connector to the powerbi.com uh, if you want to learn so you go to my youtube channel i shared recently that video i recorded during when i configuring that uh, environment to cloud or with the help of on prem connector to powerbi.com so you can see when i select and save it uh, it show me that it's already there okay it's already there uh, so i say replace it so it show me that report is successfully deployed and if i go to powerbi.com this is the workspace and where this report is there and here you can modify after usually what happened when we deploy any report to production server uh, 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 powerbi.com and then we connected to a production server 
so we have to change the data source because during development we have connection with our local vm so you can modify from here and this is the powerbi.com and from here let me show you how can i connect it with uh, you can say manage gateway and it is currently it is connected with my you can see uh, it is already connected with my local machine so from if i go to my d65 environment and here i create a power bi da uh, dashboard uh, custom my uh, workspace and here is option that i can download report connect with that report into my power bi uh, into my d65 environment so this is the report i uploaded recently and i check it and if i save it and after i'm going to refresh my workspace it is there and if i click on it You can see that report is running from my D65 for finance and operation environment. Similar way, we can modify and up, update, uh, upload these reports into the power, uh, into the D65 for finance and operations. So I'm going back to my uh, presentation. So before going into the uh, depths, uh, let me explain a few questions I already um, uh, asked in a previous presentations and very uh, for terminologies that we have to use while working with the Power BI. So first of all, what is the difference between the dashboard and the report? So dashboard is uh, uh, is is used for is a single screen that is used for higher management. It focuses on the different areas of a business in a single screen for example cfo here or company owner here they want to just see what is the performance of sales purchase and what is the cost of production but they don't want to go in the depth of how this these things will be uh, operate uh, behind the scene so the, at their screen a single screen there is no drill down usually not a drill down and no filters they just open that screen and watch that what is the performance is coming and just refresh and uh, what is the performance coming for y2d yesterday uh, last year current day uh, current year current month last month so it's a single screen that's called dashboard it's in uh, then uh, then comes for a report so report is basically for a middle management and it uh, it has a drill down it has a filters and primarily focus on the specific area for example sales manager did not interested in purchases they are only uh, interested in the sales area of a business for example which route uh, what is the uh, product sales what is the comparison between the last year and uh, and even they go to drill down that want to see that which territory which area has the most sale and which areas did not have a specific sales or up to the, up to the mark so they can take immediate actions to improve the sales area so they are more than one pages and they have the same views they have the same tags same graphics that uh, create a single report and uh, then comes for example this is the example and here he want to see a different parameters and different filters and on these filters these reports will be uh, changed and they will be on a multiple screen then comes a one a, a question usually asked what is the calculated columns and what is the measure so calculated columns is a very simple that if you have a custom table uh, you have a table into power bi so you want to calculate something per row level for example, in a current example, I mentioned that if you have information of employee, that you have information of employee and you want to calculate the, uh, the experience of each employee and you want to show on a report. So you have, you required a calculated, fun a calculated column based on the DAX function. For example, there's a date difference between uh, joining date and today uh, as per year it shows the experience that each employee has its own experience in a raw level but what about uh, uh, what about the measurements the measurements is also calculated and these these are the base of aggregated level for more than one row 
suppose i want to check the sales department uh, sales sales margin of a specific territory specific region specific segment so i got i create a cadex formula that is divided some sales gross margin some and then some by a sales measurement and it is the based on the segment or a division or specific region or specific area so uh, uh, calculated columns is based for each row and but the measurement is based on the sum or calculations based on multiple rows so this is the bas basic difference between the measurements and uh, you can say uh, uh, um, you can say calculated column and measurements so now what comes with the d365 for finance and operations microsoft provide more than 24 embedded dashboards into workspaces and these 24 dashboards has 124 reports my friends all these dashboards are available on powerbi uh, powerbi.com you can download it and then you can modify it and upload as per uh, as per requirement original dashboards which are already embedded uh, you can modify a little bit but if you want to uh, do extensive changes then definitely you have to download from elsewhere and uh, any question uh, if you want to download and then uh, all dashboards uh, dashboards are available on lcs and upload to powerbi.com so i am again for for uh, for uh, i have to show at least two dashboards that i recently uploaded uh, on, so first of all, the recruitment da da dashboard. So what are the recruitment? In DTC5 for finance and operation, there, there is a, for when they hiring a pupil, they create a recruitment project. And against recruitment projects, job is posted either in a look employee uh, dashboard, employee portal, or uploaded into uh, LinkedIn. And from there, they got uh, applica applications and from selection, uh, for selection from these applicants interview conduct and finally some selected and some some rejected so for this uh, what microsoft provided i'm going to power bi dashboards and here is recruitment recruiting dash dashboards as i'm working on a local vm so i downloaded these dashboards and all these dashboards are available if you go on LCS and shared asset library, you found all these dashboards are available here. These are the uh, dashboards are available and you can download it, modify it, and whatever you want, you can do these this dashboards and then upload to the as per you show. Uh, I show you on the previous window. And if you have a local uh, local VM, you can modify. Most of the times, we are working on a local uh, hosted VMs that are not on a cloud. Then you have to use on-prem connector to connect with your VM and then uh, load these 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 dashboards and modify them. So I uh, already downloaded downloaded it and modified it. So and I deploy these dashboards into my local vm and i'm going to power bi dashboards and this is the recruitment dashboard so first report is applicant analysis so you can see applicants by job, five jobs I got against, uh, there will no job detail, then consultants based, based on Contoso data. And uh, uh, for a consultant, we have uh, five applicants. In machine operators, we have uh, four applicants. Marketing executive, we have uh, two applicants. And these are also shows if you have properly configured the data into your d 5 for finance and operations then data will be uh, come as accurate as possible and for example they even have analysis for that from where the applicants come for example 14 applicants come from a web company uh, some magazine or some media daily times they mention then it comes for 
no mention, uh, no, no name is there and weekly new three applicant and from some recruiter it has two and from the geographical area it's also mentioned that from where the applicants are coming and then comes applicant application applicant statuses it shows us that uh, for example if you see a green four are confirmed if for comes from external applicant and then two are confirmed from the employees that that comes with the some kind of reference for other employees or uh, uh, applications are up, uh, uploaded by uh, employees and one is rejected from employee and here are three applicants are rejected and then 15s are received but no interviewed and six are interviewed and all those application applicant statuses are shown in this grid and here you can see it comes from multiple legal entities. So if you go for applicant demographic as per gender, as per level, educational level, and its statuses, then it shows that the one uh, applicant comes from male and they come for the, uh, you can say female is one and then male is one. And then 45 and uh, with the age of 45 to 55, two applicants are come under 25, four are females and 17s are male. And similarly, if you see the education graph, then it shows the bachelor, high school, one is uh, bachelor and threes are inter threes are interviewed are uh, from bachelor group and eight received but did not respond and one is rejected. Similarly, for high school education, two are confirmed, one is employed and one is interviewed one is no received but no interview and two are rejected similarly these applications are come and then uh, if we see for recruitment analysis then recruiting analysis then it shows some costs uh, which including to hiring employees bad hires good hires or something this is information shown here that two applicants uh, uh, out of 25, one applicant is hired and good, bad, there is no data. So all are uh, hired applicants, but no analysis for uh, bad. And then comes uh, costing of how much they invest on the uh, hiring. And then comes recruitment project. Project, I already show, uh, already share you that in this five we create recruitment project. So if they, if they are showing uh, the analysis that for one recruitment project three uh, three open openings are for one consultant project one opening for east one opening for west machine operator two all those recruitment and then position analysis and these recruitment projects some projects are started some cancelled everything is shown here and these are the applicant applicant by uh, projects, but application uh, recruitment projects are showing a total number of applicant projects are 14. So this is the uh, recruitment dashboard. Then I will I want to share about just a minute. Now I have a 20 minutes, so I think I have to switch back instead to go more detail of uh, out of the box dashboard. I think I go to show you how to connect with the D65 of finance and operations. Uh, then for this, I am going back to my slides and then show some technical mixture of technical and functional areas. So. Oh, So how to integrate with VC5 for finance and operation? The ways we, we, we have to get data from DC5 for finance and operations. What are the ways we are using data from DC5 for finance and operations? And we make dashboards as per our requirement or we can modify dashboards. So they have Microsoft provided almost as per my understanding and my knowledge for uh, that I have experience or work that has four. There are multiple modes, but uh, th these are the most important. O data fields. I'm showing, uh, showing you O data fields means you have uh, O data fields. Then comes entity store. Then comes bring your own data. 
and then excel add-on with the help of excel add-on you can get data for you know, odata endpoints is a rest based service and that allow to integrate with list five for finance and operations microsoft did not provide a way to uh, directly access to uh, uh, their tables in a DC5 table. So they provide a mechanism that called data entities. Their advantage over data entities is that uh, one is that is a security. Nobody can access directly to the tables. And then is, uh, you can say, no, non normalized data. For example, if you have a sales, uh, you want to uh, share something on a report on the sales, and then in the system have a two tables, sales order and sales line. So why you have to uh, give them a two data entities why not you create a view based on uh, based on sales order and sales line so they got a single uh, set of data non normalized data so, uh, for their reports so they have you have functionality to create uh, data entities so again i'm going to my vm the dashboard i already show you this is based on data entities. So what I did, Microsoft provide so to avoid some sample data or some uh, or out of the box organization data or something. So I what I did, Microsoft provide a sample uh, Excel sheet uh, on. So what uh, so what I did, from, I download the sample Excel sheet from cloud. Um, from Microsoft link, you can find this sim sample Excel sheet. If you write on a Google that sample data for Power BI, you found the Excel sheet that is already provided by Microsoft. So what I did, I built a data entity. I built a custom table on it. And this is the compile ta uh, table, uh, all fields. And then I built a data entity. And this is data entity. And if you go for data entity properties here is one uh, property that is called is public when you select is public that th this is will be available on cloud and with the help of data uh, import export framework i fetch all data into my table and if i go to this this table uh, this data is come from power bi or uh, from d65 for finance and operation data entities so if I go here, let me for just for quick overview, here is the references. This is the old data field, which I shared. And if I click on it, I shared all. It relatively, when, when it fetch data, it's relatively slow. But when you deploy the reports and when you go on a production environment, then this screen will be not required. You already entered into, into your Power BI. And from there, you uh, you are manipulated or already uh, fi finalized report is there. So this report, some people are asking that this screen is uh, relatively slow because it is connected to my local VMs. And I have very uh, limited resources. And VM is installed on my. Uh, local VM. So um, I, I want to show that because here all possible entities in this five for finance and operations will be shown. So these are some entities you can search it and around 3000 data entities are already available in dc5 for finance and operations a huge library if you have a custom tables and if you have a custom logic then you can build on it so i already selected it so so that data comes from from that data entity that is imported into dc5 for for avoiding any company data or any data conf confidential data so i imported all those things and if uh, so, so here uh, i build the dashboard so this is the way first way to connect with uh, d65 for, uh, for for finance and operations then again i'm going to these are the all steps i mentioned data you put url then you select required and then comes the entity store microsoft provide a way that is uh, near to real database that they said uh, near near to real database uh, fetch from uh, near to uh, 
real transactional database to whatever the transaction happened that that goes into the our aggregated entities uh, there is a database separate to uh, where they already your transactional data uh, database then there is a separate they provide a database and after a specific time it extract data and goes into that uh, database that is used for uh, for analytical reports and that database is not accessible to the end user so there will be no extra cost on it so this is the transaction database this is uh, screen is uh, more uh, explanatory so this is a transaction database after sometimes uh, after sometimes it job is uh, uh, execute and a background and that fetch data from transaction database and fetch into the entity store and from we can do a direct query and fetch data and design into our power bi and design reports on it and in uh, amazingly this is this this is so fast as compared to uh this is so uh, fast as compared to you write a custom uh, etl uh it is so fast uh, that you can imagine it's very fast process so no Im impact on any uh, delay on data fetch and goes into data entities and again if i go to the data and uh, my environment if i open the database because i'm currently working on my local vm so this is the data entity store database and it is very adjacent to db data and data uh, dw data entities and if i go for a technical prospect these are in aot these are aggregated dimensions aggregated measures their whole sciences behind that you can you can work on it you can understand uh, understand and this uh, i create for this custom uh, data entity to store and for our for a functional side or of what uh, where you can configure it uh, if we go into system administrator module and here is the entity store where it goes entity store these are the data entities which uh, which available and works behind the uh, out of the box dashboards which i shared you here and there are already if you have properly configured vn a uh, configured environment then these are the dashboards that on back end they are they, they are using these data entities and you need to refresh these data entities after a specific time so for this you you have to uh, update full refresh and you have to select and for example for testing purposes i last time i refreshed this uh, this dashboard on 7 26 so so i have uh, you you can schedule schedule these dashboards uh, these these data entities and and if you see currently uh, i configured on my local vm so this is the uh, my dashboard i downloaded it and from uh, currently is pointed to my local database so i modified it and with the help of on-prem uh, dashboard i deployed into powerbi.com and downloaded into my vm and they are connected to these dashboards are connected with the help of on-prem connector it uh, connected to uh, deployed on power bi and then i downloaded it so you in this way you can modify it these, these reports for example you have to con first step is you have to on connect to on prem so uh, any change you do, did in any uh, data entity uh, that aggregated data entity or entity store that can be reflected easily on your dashboard and then you deploy uh, and test and then finally those uh, changes will be goes to production server so this way the, you can connect with uh, entity store and more interestingly these entity stores can be deployed on azure data lake the purpose for azure data lake is uh, possible fast uh, retrieval of data and then because we are unable to access the data entities directly into the uh, because the production server we have not access for a dashboard uh, for direct access so we sometimes there is here is an option that we can deploy these data entities to azure data lake major purpose uh, what i understand that if uh, in in uh, uh, in real environment there are other sources than dt65 for finance and operations uh, in ecosystem so if you want to merge some data from there then for that reason you have to migrate or import this entity store appointed to data entity store instead to install uh, where the transactional database you can install it separate into uh, your data lake 
Then comes B O Y D. Bring your own data. I practically see one of presentation. I was uh, sitting that uh, one company comes and they show a uh, separate their own data warehouse, and they are claiming that we this data warehouse works with both Microsoft Business Central and as well as works with. D65 for finance and operations. So uh, if you have your own data warehouse, then you have certainly go for bring your own database approach that Microsoft provide you on a cloud and a your service where you deploy your custom data warehouse and you perform some extra um, extract transform and load either uh, either with connecting with uh, your the entity store or you are consuming the o data fields or somehow the other you it's up to you they can fetch data and update data into your data warehouse that 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 again i'm saying that why we go there for that either we have to go for a third party solution or we have a multiple data sources other than this 65 for finance and operations in a practical environment or ecosystem for that purpose we go for custom data warehouse and sometimes we have to build data marts or small data warehouse targeting very specific area so for for that approach we we we, we can go boyd or bring your own data approach and third and last is excel add-on it's a, it's some kind of very slow low level or specifically focus on a specific portion. So that is also based on uh, data entity. And if you go for, again, I'm going to my environment and okay, I'm have only 10 minutes, oh, five minutes. This is the Excel, Excel add-on. And for Excel add-on, you first of uh, enabling Excel add-on on your Excel environment. First of all, you go to insert and from store and from here you mention the dynamics if i click on it it show me the the microsoft dynamics office add-on and you can add click on add it and then for you have to go and enable here again microsoft dynamics and from here you have to go office integration somewhere and here you have to initialize registered app, app, uh, initial separate registration after that when you go here and connect with it you have to you have to enter the server location URL. Then you have to connect with your credentials and you will find something this. If you click on a designer and I already connected with the same data entities I created in a previous, uh, show you previous step, you can add table. And here is the list of data entities are available, which you want, you can select. And in this and then you have to add some fields, for example, uh, Suppose I want to go for a customer. Let's see what will become. Okay, so I'm going for a user group next. So these metadata and fields are already uh, field. I have to select uh, add and. Sim a similar way, a uh, separate Excel sheet will be created. Either you, most of the end user are expert in Excel. So if you give them uh, this opportunity, this option, then they can download this uh, data into the Excel and manipulate on this Excel. Either they create directly reports inside the Excel on this data, or this Excel will be used as the data source for their Power BI, uh, Power BI to build their own dashboards. So, so Kamar, this is from all my all from my side. And any question, anything you have, uh, so I can I can uh, represent. So that's all from my side about D65 for finance and operation and Power BI.
Thank you so much, Ali. That was a very great, you know, like not only the overview, but you went in, into the detail of uh, many things. And I think I enjoyed your session a lot. Um, and we are on the clock. So I'll just I'll just ask one simple question to you. Um, what's your take? Like when we try to implement Power BI with uh, the finance and operations in your experience, what can be the one or two, you know, like major challenges that we face uh, and which will sort of and not make us realize the uh, optimum benefits out of this implementation uh, basically i have to face two uh, two things basically first of all the the, uh, the entity store implementation is little little complex and mm. the more less less uh, documentation uh, is available so that feature is I, I i don't think so they people are usually used to extend the out of the box dashboards so one challenge is that and uh, so microsoft must have some sample more detail about that area uh, so we have the only option for for that option is reverse engineering so you have to reverse engineering how microsoft do and then we, we are going to implement uh, so that that the only challenge i faced uh, while working for one uh, here in uh, in a business expert gulf we have some uh, dashboard for uh, regarding for financials so for that we have to do uh, this challenge we have to face that we did not got too much uh, detail uh, information about uh, entity store so because uh, when we go for a custom solution that we have to do some etl and some for populate the custom tables into the dst5 and connect uh, so that is more ex expensive as, as as compared to uh, calculation times and bad jobs so so little uh, more details is required for uh, uh, this so I'm recommended that if you go for a power um, data warehouse approach for the city five for finance and operation then we have to use entity store because it's more faster in in terms of data fetching and uh, only required data is goes into the uh, analysis a business intelligence itself that what is required that can be fetched from the uh, power bi so that that is uh, my answer that you have to go for a power uh, data entity store as compared to go for uh, connecting to the directly or data fields or data fields only works for if you have a small amount of data but if you have a, a enterprise uh, level data warehouse that calculation ytd uh, year to date year to month calculations yeah. compared to then you have to go for uh or data feeds uh, sorry entity store so that okay. that that's that's all <laughs> from my side and uh, that's, that, that was a good advice actually yeah and um, yeah, so I would really like to thank you, Ali. Yeah, bye. And you have participated in this event. Uh, it's my I pleasure. It's my honor. I'm hoping to see you soon yeah. again on our platform. Um, and have a nice rest of the evening. What time it is at your place now? Uh, I'm in Dubai. It's uh, 12.39. Oh, cool. Cool, cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure to join all of you. I'm thankful to you all. Thanks. All right, so um, now we will just take a few minutes break. And after the break, we have a very amazing session uh, from Satya Kejriwal. And Satya will be basically um, getting you guys through an exploration of the landed cost module, which is a very new module, a new set of sort of functionalities within Dynamics 365 Finance and Operation. Um, and our good friend Satya is there back in the lobby. So I think within next, uh, uh, just about next 10 minutes uh, we will you know uh, bring him live and he will be uh, he will be there with you so just stay tuned I'll just play a promo and then you know uh, within a few minutes we'll come back with Satya thank you so much if you have any questions till now any comments you can go on wherever you're watching so if you are watching on YouTube you can just put your comments there and those are available to us and we can show them to the speakers and uh, also if you have uh, if you are watching it on LinkedIn or if you are watching on Facebook, you can just uh, go to that post and put your comments uh, below the post, and we'll be here to you know show them to the speakers, and we make sure your uh, questions are answered towards the end of the session. So thank you so much for tuning into this day three broadcast of Pakistan User Group, uh, and we'll be back in about eight minutes from now. Thank you.
Hello, and we are back live now. Um, I'll just uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Satya Kejriwal. He is uh, based in Sydney, and he will take you through uh, some blended cost module functionalities. Uh, just a quick heads up again, if you have any questions for Satya, feel free to post them on the YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook, wherever you are watching this broadcast, into your comments and then we'll take those questions uh, towards the end. So let me add Satya in. Hi, Satya, how are you? Hey, Kamar, I'm good, and how are you? I'm great, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and giving your time for Pakistan User Group and this amazing event. No problem, my pleasure. Cool, so yeah, you. I'll just leave the floor for you um, and all good. And once you'll share your screen, I'll just bring it up on the main display thank you so much yeah just uh, give me a minute let me try to share my screen here not a problem i'll be here to confirm that oh, Zabardas, I can I can see your screen here or about the screen here. Um Mary presentation the Griapko. Well cool. This is now visible uh, to the audience or Apko B is main frame page I want to say. All good. So I'll go backstage now and I'll I'll just keep reminding you keep mm -hmm. time ka, and then <laughs> not a problem. I'll come back. Okay, thank, thank okay, you very cool. much. Thank you. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, friends uh, from wherever you are. मुझे पता है मेरे बहुत से दोस्त इंडिया से, पाकिस्तान से, ऑस्ट्रेलिया से और पता नहीं कहाँ कहाँ से ये प्रेजेंटेशन अभी देख रहे होंगे। तो सभी को नमस्ते। तो आज का हमारा सेशन होगा लैंडिंग कोर्स पे। लैंडिंग कोर्स जो कि एक नया मॉड्यूल है D365 में कुछ लोगों के लिए नया ना हो पीपल हु केम फ्रॉम DXC और सेबल वर्ल्ड बिकॉज़ ये मॉड्यूल सेबल 37 द्वारा डेवलप किया गया था फ्यू इयर्स बैक दे हैव डन लॉट ऑफ इंप्लीमेंटेशन ऑन लैंडेड कोस्ट देन सेबल वाज एक्वायर्ड बाय DXC DXC एंड माइक्रोसॉफ्ट बॉट दिस मॉड्यूल फ्रॉम DXC सो इट्स नॉट न्यू मॉड्यूल इन द इंडस्ट्री इन द uh, D365 as such, but micro, in Microsoft, you will see it uh, as a new module. But many people are aware of these functionalities um, right now. Okay, so before we go into D365 landed cost, which I will tell you about it. My name is Satya Kejriwal. Uh, by profession, I am a chartered accountant. मैं इंडिया से हूं मैं फिलिपींस ऑस्ट्रेलिया में रह चुका हूं काम कर चुका हूं प्रोजेक्ट मैंने मेनली ऑस्ट्रेलिया साउथ ईस्ट एशिया इंडिया और यूएस में किए हैं रिसेंटली मैंने एक बुक लिखनी शुरू की थी नॉट रिसेंटली एक्चुअली मैं 4 साल से लिख रहा था तो अभी थोड़ा-थोड़ा करके अभी वो 4 साल बाद फिनिश होने वाली है so I'll be releasing that book uh, very soon, next month. Uh, after this session, if you have any question about landed cost or in general about uh, D365, feel free to email me on uh, this email ID. Uh, I also have a blog. If you uh, want to go through my blogs, there are a few blogs uh, I uh, generally write. Uh, one blog in a month, kind of. You can also follow me on uh, LinkedIn. Right, so this was something, uh, some uh, brief about myself. Okay, so let, let's talk about landed cost now. Okay, what is landed cost? Why is it required? Let's let's deal with these two uh, definitions or these two questions first. What is landed cost? So landed cost, what is it? This is a very basic ek, uh, concept of accounting ka, ya costing ka, hum kahe, ya logistic. Ka. तो जब भी आप कुछ परचेज करते हो 
किसी वेंडर से और वेंडर मान लो है वो चाइना में या यूएस में और आप बाय कर रहे हो ऑस्ट्रेलिया में तो परचेज प्राइस के अलावा आपको फ्रेट इंश्योरेंस और बहुत से ऐसे खर्चे देने होते हैं बहुत से चार्जेस देने होते हैं विच आर नॉट बेसिकली पार्ट ऑफ योर लाइक नॉट डायरेक्टली लिंक टू द परचेज ऑर्डर प्राइसिस बिकॉज कंटेनर कॉस्ट है जैसे कंटेनर कॉस्ट या फ्रेट कॉस्ट इट्स पर कंटेनर इट्स नॉट पर परचेज ऑर्डर और नॉट पर आइटम ठीक है ऐसे इंश्योरेंस है इंश्योरेंस भी की वैल्यूएशन जो होती है वो बेस्ड ऑन द वैल्यू ऑफ द इन्वेंट्री होती है ठीक है तो यू कैन नॉट इजिली अप्लाई दिस ऑन द परचेज ऑर्डर चार्जेस तो वाइज इट रिक्वायर्ड इसकी रिक्वायरमेंट है बिकॉज सी आई एम ए चार्ट अकाउंटेंट आई हैज सीन दिस पीपल स्ट्रगलिंग इन दिस एरिया वेरी मच तो इसकी रिक्वायरमेंट अकाउंटिंग स्टैंडर्ड या इंटरनेशनल अकाउंटिंग स्टैंडर्ड या इन जनरल आप बोले तो आई एफ आर एस के हिसाब से आपकी जो स्टॉक की कॉस्टिंग है दैट शुड बी परचेज प्राइस प्लस ऑल द कॉस्टिंग फ्रेट इंश्योरेंस और स्टोरेज ऑन द पोर्ट जो भी आप चार्जेस पे करते हो जब तक कि इन्वेंट्री आपकी वेयर हाउस में लैंड ना कर जाए तो इसको लैंडेड कॉस्ट इसलिए कहा जाता है कि इट इज बेसिकली ऑल द कॉस्ट इनकर्ड टिल द पॉइंट इट इज लैंडिंग इन द वेयर हाउस ठीक है उसके बाद में जो भी खर्चा होगा वेयर हाउस में लैंड करने के बाद में जैसे आप कोई रेंट पे कर रहे हो वेयर हाउस का या सेलिंग uh, एक्सपेंस आप पे करते हो कोई इलेक्ट्रिसिटी पे करते हो तो दैट इज नॉट लैंडेड कॉस्ट एट ऑल दैट यू कैन नॉट लोड दैट कॉस्ट टू द इन्वेंट्री कॉस्ट ठीक है Why is it required? तो आप ये समझ ही गए होंगे कि अकाउंटिंग स्टैंडर्ड या आपकी जो कॉस्टिंग मॉडल जो भी आपकी रिक्वायरमेंट है उसके हिसाब से आपको चाहिए ही चाहिए वट इज शिपमेंट कंटेनर फोलियो ये कॉन्सेप्ट कुछ है जो मैं चाहता हूँ कि आप उससे अवगत हो जाए आप विच यू मेक योर सेल्फ अवेयर ऑफ एंड विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट दिस वेरी सोन वट इज एफ ओ बी एफ ओ बी ये टर्म है डिलीवरी टर्म्स में आती है बहुत सारे कंसल्टेंट है जिनको पता नहीं होता है तो इसलिए मैंने स्पेशली यहाँ पे डाला है कि एफ होता क्या है एफ एक डिलीवरी टर्म है एंड देर आर मोर डिलीवरी टर्म्स लाइक सी आई एफ एंड देर कैन बी वेरिएशन ऑफ दिस टू राइट फ्री ऑन बोर्ड फ्री ऑन बोर्ड बेसिकली एफ इसका मतलब होता है कि जैसे ही आपकी शिपमेंट मान लो चाइना से निकलती है ओनरशिप उस शिपमेंट की आपकी हो जाती है बायर की हो जाती है ठीक है उसके बाद का जो खर्चा है सारा बायर को देना होता है ठीक है तो दिस इज द मेन रीजन दिस लैंडेड कॉस्ट मॉड्यूल केम इन द पिक्चर कि एक तो चलो इसके बारे में और डिटेल में बात करेंगे इसके बाद में पर एज ए कंसल्टेंट एफ जब भी आपको कोई आपका यूजर बोलता है कि दिस डिलीवरी टर्म्स इज एफ सो डोंट गेट कंफ्यूज सो जस्ट गो टू गूगल रीड अबाउट दिस जस्ट गो टू गूगल रीड अबाउट शिपमेंट कंटेनर फोलियो इमेज में जाके देखिए कि कंटेनर होता है क्या है शिपमेंट होता है इवन इफ यू हैवेंट सीन द कार्गो या कंटेनर रियल लाइफ में आप गूगल पे जाके सब कुछ देख सकते हैं मतलब सो सो दैट यू कैन रिलेट टू दो कॉन्सेप्ट इजीली सिनेरियो की बात करें कि लैंडेड कोस्ट से क्या पॉसिबल है इट्स इज लिटिल बिट बोरिंग राइट नाउ बट आई बी टेकिंग यू इन द सिस्टम एंड आल शो यू एवरीथिंग लाइव इन द सिस्टम नाउ तो बहुत जल्दी से बात कर लेते हैं इसकी कि यह एक बार छोड़ी मैं अगले स्लाइड में इसको डिटेल में बात करेंगे टॉप थ्री फीचर्स ऑफ लैंडेड कोस्ट तो जो भी पिछली स्लाइड पे विच आई मेस्ट आई एम कवरिंग इट हेयर एज माई टॉप थ्री लाइक माई बेस्ट पिक और वट आई सी लाइक जो भी पॉसिबल नहीं था लैंडेड कोस्ट आने से पहले और अब पॉसिबल है ठीक है सबसे पहला इनवॉइसिंग ऑफ पीओ लाइन्स बिफोर रिसीविंग तो ये आपको पता है कि डी थ्री सिक्स फाइव में और इन एनी आर पी फॉर दैट रीजन आप पीओ की इनवॉइसिंग या ऑर्डर की इनवॉइसिंग रिसीविंग से पहले नहीं कर सकते राइट right? पर लैंडेड कोस्ट आने के बाद में आप ये पॉसिबल है आप इनवॉइस कर सकते हो पीओ को बिफोर रिसीविंग एंड आई टेल यू हाउ एंड वाई ओके ट्रैकिंग ऑफ शिपमेंट आपका जब शिपमेंट रस्ते में है आप उसको ट्रैक कर सकते हो यू कैन अपडेट द डेट्स 
और जैसे आप डेट अपडेट करते हो शिपमेंट की शिपमेंट के अंदर जितने भी परचेज ऑर्डर की लाइंस हैं उसकी एस्टिमेटेड डिलीवरी डेट अपने आप चेंज हो जाती है विच इज लाइक वेरी ब्यूटीफुल फीचर ऑफ दिस मॉड्यूल ठीक है इसको भी हम सिस्टम में लाइव देखेंगे एडजस्टमेंट ऑफ इन्वेंट्री कॉस्ट बेस्ड ऑन एक्चुअल चार्जेस ओके दिस इज द अल्टीमेट गोल ऑफ लैंडेड कॉस्ट हम लैंडेड कॉस्ट प्रोसेस की शुरुआत करते हैं एस्टिमेटेड कॉस्ट से कि जब शिपमेंट स्टार्ट होता है तो हम बोलते हैं कि चलो तीन हजार डॉलर लगेगा फ्रेट का एक हजार लगेगा इंश्योरेंस का पर जैसे आप शिपमेंट पहुंचता है योर एक्चुअल कॉस्ट कैन बी डिफरेंट फ्रॉम द एस्टिमेटेड कॉस्ट तो जो डिफरेंस है उसकी भी कॉस्टिंग होनी चाहिए उसकी भी कॉस्टिंग इन्वेंट्री पे जानी चाहिए ठीक है हाउ सिस्टम हैंडल्स इट दस अगेन ए वेरी वेरी ब्यूटीफुल फीचर ब्यूटीफुली डेवलप्ड थिंग इन द सिस्टम अगेन विच इज नॉट पॉसिबल बिफोर ओके तो अभी हम जो मैंने बात की उसको फिर से देख लेते हैं एंड टू एंड और इसी को हम एक एग्जाम्पल के साथ में सिस्टम uh, में देखेंगे आई स्पेंड मे बी फाइव टेन मिनट्स अबाउट ऑन दिस प्रोसेस and next 20 minutes uh, in the system in live demo and then we'll we'll uh, take your questions if you have any okay so as you know process starts with creation of the purchase order okay purchase order to mera jo example hai jo bhi live mein banane wala hu purchase order jo buyer hai buyer australia mein hai melbourne mein and uh, seller hai He is in US, Long Beach. Okay, तो ये शिपमेंट बेसिकली स्टार्ट होगा अमेरिका से और विल बी रिचिंग ऑस्ट्रेलिया राइट राइट सो प्रोसेस स्टार्ट फ्रॉम परचेज ऑर्डर तो परचेज ऑर्डर बनाया वेंडर के नाम का जो कि अमेरिकन वेंडर है उसके बाद में क्या होगा जी उसके बाद में जैसे आपने मान लो टू थाउजेंड क्वान्टिटी का परचेज ऑर्डर बनाया ठीक है तो इट्स नॉट रियली नेसेसरी कि 2000 की 2000 क्वांटिटी या पूरा स्टॉक आपका एकदम से रेडी हो जाए तो जितना भी स्टॉक रेडी है जितने भी मान लो दस परचेज ऑर्डर हैं दस के दस परचेज ऑर्डर में से कुछ लाइंस कुछ क्वांटिटी जो भी अवेलेबल है शिपमेंट के लिए दैट यू कैन लोड ऑन दिस शिपमेंट तो अगेन जो नए कंसल्टेंट है uh, जो मैं बोल रहा था कि वट इज शिपमेंट वट इज कंटेनर तो यहाँ देख सकते हैं कि ये शिपमेंट है या वॉइस इसको हम वॉइस बोलते हैं इसमें लैंडेड कोस्ट मॉड्यूल में और ये कंटेनर uh, हैं जिसके अंदर जो बहुत छोटे छोटे दिख रहे हैं पर एक्चुअल uh, में uh, बहुत बड़े कंटेनर होते हैं ठीक है जी uh, तो ये शिपमेंट स्टार्ट हो गया इसके बाद में जैसे शिपमेंट स्टार्ट हुआ जो मैंने पहले कहा था एफ ओ बी एफ ओ बी मीन्स फ्री ऑन बोर्ड एज पर द कॉन्ट्रैक्ट विद वेंडर वेंडर बोलता है कि जैसे ही मैंने शिप कर दिया मेरी कोई रिस्पॉन्सिबिलिटी नहीं है यू आर द ओनर ऑफ दिस होल शिपमेंट ठीक है तो इसलिए इट इज रिक्वायर्ड फ्रॉम अकाउंटिंग परस्पेक्टिव कि मैं इसको इन्वॉइस कर दू इस स्टेज पे ठीक है तो यहाँ पे आप इन्वॉइस करेंगे जो पहले कह रहा था कि इन्वॉइसिंग बिफोर रिसीविंग ठीक है तो दिस इज ए न्यू फीचर यहाँ इन्वॉइस होगा अकाउंटिंग वाइज लाइबिलिटी आपकी क्रिएट हो जाएगी वेंडर के नाम पे इन्वेंट्री डेबिट हो जाएगी पर इन्वेंट्री रिसीव नहीं होगी बट यू कैन स्टिल सी द इन्वेंट्री कहाँ पे गुड्स इन ट्रांजिट वेयर हाउस में एक गुड्स इन ट्रांजिट वेयर हाउस बनाना पड़ता है बेसिकली इट्स अ वर्चुअल वेयर हाउस या हम बोल सकते हैं कि जैसे ये शिपमेंट दिख रहा है यही आपका वेयर हाउस है ठीक है तो इन्वेंट्री आपको दिखेगी कि इस वेयर हाउस में है नेक्स्ट टू मंथ्स या वन मंथ जितने भी टाइम में शिपमेंट में है ठीक है तो आ, इसके बाद में आप इन्वेंट्री देख सकते हैं गुड्स इन ट्रांजिट वेयर हाउस में ओके जी इसके बाद अगेन यू कैन रिलेट टू दिस पिक्चर दिस पिक्चर इज फ्रॉम द सीज कैनल इफ यू रिमेंबर एक पिछले दिनों में एक आपका बहुत बड़ा शिप फंस गया था स्वीज कैनल में जिसकी वजह से पूरे वर्ल्ड का सप्लाई चेन हिल गया था ठीक है तो दिस इज वेरी कॉमन तो ये तो बहुत ही एक यूनिक एग्जांपल था पर जनरली पांच पांच दस दिन का डिले इज वेरी कॉमन इन शिपमेंट ठीक है तो 
जो मैं पहले बोल रहा था कि ट्रैक द वॉइस ट्रैक द शिपमेंट अगर आप शिपमेंट पर जाके डेट अपडेट कर देते हो तो आपके सभी लाइंस की एस्टिमेटेड डिलीवरी डेट अपने आप अपडेट हो जाती है इसके बाद जब वो शिपमेंट पहुंचता है ऑस्ट्रेलिया यू रिसीव द वॉइस ऑन द डेस्टिनेशन पोर्ट तो रिसीविंग यहाँ पे है इनवॉइसिंग यहाँ पे है तो दिस इज बेसिकली रिवर्स अब क्या होगा हम एक्चुअल वेंडर का इनवॉइस तो पहले प्रोसेस कर चुके हैं देर इज नथिंग पेंडिंग हेयर बट कुछ इनवॉइस अभी भी पेंडिंग होंगे जो कि रिलेटिंग टू फ्रेड एंड इंश्योरेंस एंड अदर चार्जेस फ्रेड फॉरवर्डिंग चार्जेस जो भी होते हैं ठीक है तो क्योंकि पहले हमने एस्टिमेशन किया था इस टाइम पे अब हम एक्चुअल इनवॉइस लेंगे तो हो सकता है वो इनवॉइस डिफरेंट हो अमाउंट अलग हो तो उसका भी जो डिफरेंस है दैट शुड बी लॉडेड ऑन द इन्वेंट्री कोस्ट ठीक है। ओके तो बिफोर वी जंप इन टू डी थ्री सिक्स फाइव लाइव डेमो यू मस्ट बी थिंकिंग यार इसके इससे पहले हम कर कैसे रहे थे इससे पहले हम हैंडल कैसे कर रहे थे तो आई एम इन इन दिस इंडस्ट्री सिंस लास्ट फिफ्टीन ईयर्स तो जैसे हमने uh, इसको हैंडल किया है लैंडिड कोस्ट कॉन्सेप्ट को बिकॉज अकाउंटिंग वाइज एवरीबडी नीड लैंडिड कोस्ट मॉड्यूल अभी आया है पर लोग पहले से भी कर रहे हैं कैसे ना कैसे मैनेज कर रहे हैं तो जैसे हम करते थे टू एस्टिमेट द कॉस्ट एंड एलोकेट द कॉस्ट हम परचेज ऑर्डर पे चार्जेस का कॉन्सेप्ट यूज करते थे तो परचेज ऑर्डर जैसे बनता था परचेज ऑर्डर पे चार्जेस अपने आप ऑटो कैलकुलेट होते थे और एलोकेट हो जाते थे पर अगेन देर इज अ लिमिटेशन की बहुत लिमिटेड वहां पे अपोर्शनमेंट के मैथड है और एक इट यू कैनॉट एडजस्ट द चार्ज एक्चुअल चार्जेस लेटर ऑन ठीक है बहुत ही कम्बरसम प्रोसेस है विदाउट इफ यू डोंट वॉन्ट टू गो इन टू कस्टमाइजेशन दूसरा ओनरशिप लेने के लिए कि जैसे मैंने पिछले दिन बात की कि यहाँ पे जब इन्वॉइसिंग करते हैं तो ओनरशिप ट्रांसफर्स तो ओनरशिप लेने के लिए हम क्या करते थे कि उस पी ओ को रिसीव कर लेते थे एक एक वर्चुअल वेयर हाउस में उसके बाद में वहां से ट्रांसफर ऑर्डर बना के हम ट्रांसफर करते थे ठीक है हाउ वी टू हैंडल एंड आई नो यू यू गाइस आल्सो मस्ट हैव डन सिमिलर थिंग्स ओके नेक्स्ट लैंडेड कोस्ट वर्सेस ट्रांसपोर्टेशन मॉड्यूल एक क्वेश्चन आता है जो भी आप में से ट्रांसपोर्टेशन मॉड्यूल के एक्सपर्ट हैं दे माइट बी नाउ थिंकिंग कि यार ट्रांसपोर्टेशन मॉड्यूल भी थोड़ा बहुत कुछ ना कुछ ऐसा करता है ठीक है तो माइक्रोसॉफ्ट की वेबसाइट पर जाके आप देखेंगे डॉक्स डॉट माइक्रोसॉफ्ट पे तो माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने एक बहुत अच्छा कंपेरिजन दिया हुआ है कि लैंडेड कोस्ट में क्या है कॉन्सेप्ट क्या है और टीएमएस में क्या था ट्रांसपोर्ट में क्या था और ये तो सब कहानी है मतलब यू कांट शो दैट टू क्लाइंट डेफिनेटली यू कैन बट क्लाइंट विल से कि हम मेरे को इससे क्या फाइनल कंक्लूजन क्या है विच मॉड्यूल शुड आई यूज टीएमएस और लैंडेड कोस्ट तो उसका आंसर है माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने दिया हुआ है कि लैंडेड कोस्ट फॉर इनबाउंड ऑपरेशन कि जब इनबाउंड जब कर रहे हो जैसे परचेज कर रहे हो अमेरिका से ऑस्ट्रेलिया तो यू शुड यूज लैंडेड कोस्ट और टीएमएस uh, आप आउटबाउंड ऑपरेशन के लिए यूज कर सकते हैं ठीक है तो लाइक बोथ कैन को एग्जिस्ट बोथ द मॉड्यूल्स पर आई थिंक इनके रोल डिवाइड हो गए हैं ठीक है लैंडेड कोस्ट डेफिनेटली विल नॉट वर्क फॉर आउटबाउंड ओके सो लेट्स टॉक अबाउट वेरी लाइक आफ्टर ऑल दिस कॉन्सेप्ट कि हम लैंडेड कोस्ट को अब इनेबल कैसे करेंगे क्योंकि लैंडेड कोस्ट जनरली आपको दिखेगा नहीं इसको आपको इनेबल करना पड़ेगा तो एस यू नो कि फीचर मैनेजमेंट करके एक वर्क स्पेस है वहां पे जाके आप नए नए फीचर एक्सप्लोर कर सकते हैं और आपको इनेबल करना पड़ेगा उस फीचर को तो लैंडेड कोस्ट भी एक इट केम एज ए फीचर तो यू कैन इनेबल इट देर एंड उसके बाद में एक लैंडेड कोस्ट मॉड्यूल के अंदर जाके देन यू टू एक्टिवेट दिस शो लैंडेड कोस्ट फीचर्स इसके बाद लैंडेड कोस्ट से रिलेटेड फील्ड्स आपको परचेज ऑर्डर पे दिखने लगेंगे हर जगह डिलीवरी टर्म्स में एक नया रेडियो बटन टॉगल बॉक्स है गुड्स इन ट्रांजिट मैनेजमेंट तो उस डिलीवरी टर्म्स जो हमने बात की फ्री ऑन बोर्ड तो जो भी डिलीवरी टर्म्स आप यूज करेंगे उस परचेज के लिए वहां पे आपको गुड्स इन ट्रांजिट एक्टिवेट करना पड़ेगा 
only then those uh, purchase order will be part of your landed cost module uh is agla ek aur change hai warehouse pe warehouse par aapko ek goods in transit warehouse uh, set karna padega basically this is the warehouse jo which will hold the inventory for those two months jab wo uh, inventory uh, in transit hai theek hai ek under delivery warehouse requirement hai iske bare mein hum baad mein baat karenge फिर एक फाइनेंस uh, कंसल्टेंट्स के लिए इम्पोर्टेंट uh, थिंग uh, uh, दो नए पोस्टिंग प्रोफाइल हैं सेकंड ओनी काउंट सी है विच इज फॉल अंडर परचेज ऑर्डर टैब अंडर पोस्टिंग इसके अलावा भी uh, कुछ कुछ सेटअप हैं आई एल नॉट गो इन डिटेल ऑफ एवरीथिंग कोस्ट टाइप कोस्ट टाइप बनाना पड़ेगा जो भी फ्रेट इंश्योरेंस जो भी चार्जेस लगते हैं वो आपको डिफाइन करने पड़ेंगे क्लियरिंग अकाउंट डिफाइन करना पड़ेगा शिपिंग कंटेनर जो भी शिपिंग कंपनी है दैट विल बी वेंडर मास्टर पे ये सेटअप है कि ये वेंडर शिपिंग कंपनी है ओके okay? और ये सबसे इम्पोर्टेंट सेटअप uh, है लैंडेड uh, कोस्ट का जहां पे आप बोलते हो कि uh, इसको बोलते हैं ऑटो कोस्ट सेटअप कि अगर कुछ भी कुछ भी इन्वेंट्री या कोई भी शिपमेंट इस पोर्ट से यूएस लॉन्ग बीच से ऑस्ट्रेलिया मेलबर्न अगर ट्रेवल करता है तो बाई डिफॉल्ट ये ये दोनों कॉस्ट इस पे लगा दे तो फ्रेट थ्री थाउजेंड का फ्रेट लगा दे एंड फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द अमाउंट एज ए इंश्योरेंस लगा दे ठीक है तो ये आप एज ए टेम्पलेट भी डिफाइन कर सकते हो कि इस पोर्ट से उस पोर्ट पे अगर कुछ भी जाता है तो ये कॉस्ट लगेगा और और भी बहुत से इसमें इसमें आप वेलेशन लगा सकते हो कि इस शिपिंग कंपनी से आएगा तो ये कॉस्ट होगा और उस दूसरी शिपिंग कंपनी से आएगा तो कॉस्ट डिफरेंट होगा विच इज वेरी कॉमन थिंग Okay, now as I said, we will will go in the system now and see a live demo. I have created a scenario here where um, we have two items, right? And uh, purchase order quantity two thousand four thousand. I am shipping half of the quantity again. Very valid scenario. Ki pura ka pura purchase order ship nahi hoga kabi bhi uh, most probably. Or <coughs> इसलिए हम कुछ कुछ क्वांटिटी वहां से पिक करेंगे और लेंगे पीओ से और इसको शिप करेंगे वहां से ठीक है शिपिंग का वॉल्यूम इतना है जो कि रेशो वन फोर रेशो क्यों चाहिए आपको क्योंकि जो भी फ्रेट है इंश्योरेंस की एलोकेशन है दैट कैन बी ऑन डिफरेंट बेसिस तो हम इसकी बात करेंगे जो मैंने यहाँ अच्छा इस पर बात कर लेते हैं ऑटो को सेटअप पे की ऑटो को सेटअप क्या होता है कि जैसे मैंने फ्रेट थ्री का फ्रेट है फिक्स अमाउंट है पर जो इसकी अपोर्शनमेंट है दैट इज बेस्ड ऑन द वॉल्यूम ऑफ दो आइटम्स राइट विच इज वेरी लॉजिकल क्योंकि जो भी आइटम जितना स्पेस लेगा उस रेशो में आप उसको अपोर्शनमेंट कर दो ठीक है ऐसे ही इंश्योरेंस है इंश्योरेंस की परसेंटेज पांच परसेंट है पर अपोर्शनमेंट जो होगी वो वैल्यू के बेसिस पे कर रहे हैं ओके सो दैट्स माई एग्जाम्पल एस्टिमेटेड शिपिंग फ्रेड कैलकुलेशन insurance is here and uh, apportionment is here in the ratio of 14 which is the shipping volume uh, insurance is uh, based on this 16 which is a shipping value ratio and that becomes my landed cost if you see my shipping value was 600000 here right so i add the freight 600 insurance 30000 total cost becomes 6 30 600 ठीक है छह लाख तीस हजार छह सौ और ऐसे ही आपकी जो दूसरी आइटम है उसकी कॉस्ट इतनी हो जाएगी वो सब तो ये बेसिकली लैंडेड कॉस्ट का कॉन्सेप्ट है बट दिस इज ए एस्टिमेटेड लैंडेड कॉस्ट इसके बाद में जब एक्चुअल फ्रेट आता है आपका एक्चुअल फ्रेट का इनवॉइस आएगा फोर थाउजेंड का जो एस्टिमेट आपने थ्री किया था पर फोर आता है तो उसकी एलोकेशन करोगे तो आठ और बत्तीस जो की अलग है छह से और चौबीस से ठीक है तो इसके बेस पे अब जब एक्चुअल कॉस्ट निकाल तो एक्चुअल कॉस्ट कैन बी डिफरेंट नाउ देखो छह लाख तीस हजार आठ सौ जो कि डिफरेंट है छह लाख तीस हजार छह सौ से ठीक है तो दैट्स द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ एडजस्टमेंट ऑफ द चार्जेस लेटर ऑन राइट सो लेट्स गो इन सिस्टम नाउ आई ओ वन परचेज ऑर्डर रेडी Right. Um, 
तो ये मेरा एग्जाम्पल है परचेज ऑर्डर नंबर थ्री थर्टी टू एक ही परचेज ऑर्डर मैंने दोनों आइटम डाले हुए हैं तो 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 प्रोसेस अगेन लैंडेड कोस्ट ये आपका नया मॉड्यूल है लैंडेड कोस्ट जो कि फीचर मैनेजमेंट से एक्टिवेट करना है तो सबसे पहला स्टेप है गो टू ऑल वॉइस ठीक है वॉइस इसको आप शिपमेंट भी बोल सकते हैं और पूरा शिपमेंट बना रहे हो अभी उसके अंदर कंटेनर बनेंगे ठीक है तो शिपमेंट यूएस टू ऑस्ट्रेलिया बुकिंग रेफरेंस डाल दीजिए वेसल वेसल स्टैंडर्ड डिफाइन कर सकते हो कि वेसल का टाइप क्या है साइज क्या है तो ओशन स्टार अगर हम डाल रहे हैं वो आई डी जर्नी टेम्पलेट जर्नी टेम्पलेट एक डिफाइन करना पड़ता है सेटअप आई आर नॉट गोइंग डिटेल ऑफ दिस बट जर्नी टेम्पलेट बेसिकली से टॉक्स अबाउट कहाँ से कहाँ आपका शिपमेंट जा रहा है और क्या क्या एक्टिविटी होंगी इसमें ठीक है तो मैंने चार एक्टिविटी डाली कि लोड कार्गो कार्गो लोड करना पड़ेगा फिर ये ट्रैवल करेगा फॉर फ्यू डेज देन कस्टम होगा फिर लोकल ट्रांसपोर्टेशन होगा ऑस्ट्रेलिया में ठीक है मोडल डिलीवरी फोर्टी शिपिंग कंपनी शिपिंग कंपनी जो मैंने कहा था कि वेंडर पे एक शिपिंग कंपनी डिफाइन करनी पड़ेगी एंड दिस इज योर वॉइस सेटअप ओके वॉइस सेटअप बन गया हैडर नाउ नेक्स्ट स्टेप विल बी टू लिंक द पी ओ लाइन्स राइट कौन कौन सी आइटम इसमें जा रही है तो मेरा पीओ है थ्री थर्टी टू तो पीओ सेलेक्ट करता हूँ अब एज आई सेड की आल नॉट शिप एवरी थिंग इन माई एग्जाम्पल माई पीओ वॉज फोर थाउजेंड एंड टू थाउजेंड क्वान्टिटी इफ यू गो टू माई पीओ फोर थाउजेंड टू थाउजेंड आई विल जस्ट शिप हाफ ऑफ दैम ओके शिप टू थाउजेंड फ्रॉम हियर थाउजेंड फ्रॉम हियर ओके स्टेप And next step is add to staging list. Sorry. Add to staging list and click on view staging list. So basically, यहाँ पे आप क्या कर रहे कि here you are. Sorry, I looks like I shipped. I put all of them, but I'll not. Uh, तो मैंने सब कुछ डाल दिया है पर वी कैन ऑलवेज रिमूव इट ठीक है तो ये टू थाउजेंड वन थाउजेंड क्वान्टिटी है नाउ आई नीड टू पुट दीज इन टू कंटेनर अब कंटेनर इट कैन गो फिट इन टू वन कंटेनर इट कैन फिट इन टू मल्टीपल कंटेनर राइट सो नाउ आल पुट इन टू वन कंटेनर जस्ट कीप इट सिंपल शिपिंग कंटेनर सेलेक्ट दिस कंटेनर टाइप फोर्टी फीट शिपिंग डेट लेट से टूमोरो नंबर एंड क्लिक ओके ठीक है ये मेरा शिपमेंट कंटेनर बन गया अगर मल्टीपल कंटेनर होते तो आई कुड सी ऑल द कंटेनर्स इन दिस लिस्ट ओके लेट मी कम आउट ऑफ दिस एंड रिफ्रेश सॉरी एंड रिफ्रेश हियर सो दिस इज माय न्यू शिपमेंट और न्यू वॉइस ओके एट दिस स्टेज Uh, what will I do next? Next uh, thing I can check is the voice cost. Automated cost कितना है जो हमने पहले बात की थी थ्री थाउजेंड फ्रेट था और फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द वैल्यू इंश्योरेंस था बट हाउ मच इट बिकम्स इन टोटल आई गो टू जनरल एंड क्लिक ऑन कोस्ट इंक्वायरी तो यहाँ मैं देख सकता हूँ कि ये मेरी एलोकेशन कैसे हो रही है <coughs> फ्रेट की एलोकेशन जैसे इसने की सिक्स हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी फोर हंड्रेड अगेन मेरे एग्जाम्पल से देखे हैं तो सिक्स हंड्रेड एंड ट्वेंटी फोर हंड्रेड वन और फोर के रेशो में दोनों आइटम में डिवाइड कर दिया इसने और ऐसे ही इंश्योरेंस uh, का भी एलोकेशन कर दिया थर्टी थाउजेंड एंड वन एटी में ठीक है दैट्स हाउ इट इज अलोकेट सो दिस इज एस्टिमेटेड कोस्ट ओके नाउ नेक्स्ट नेक्स्ट स्टेप इज आल गो टू वॉइस गो टू दिस वॉइस अपडेट एंड क्लिक ऑन डॉक्यूमेंट सो यहाँ पे ये चीजें कॉन्फिगरेबल है कि डॉक्यूमेंट रिसीव एक स्टेटस अपडेट कर सकते हो कि डॉक्यूमेंट सारे रिसीव हो गए एंड आई क्लिक ऑन इन ट्रांजिट ये इन ट्रांजिट है नेक्स्ट स्टेप है इनवॉइसिंग ओनरशिप शिपमेंट स्टार्ट हो गया है नाउ यू कैन टेक ओनरशिप ऑफ द शिपमेंट ठीक है <coughs> तो आपका दोनों आइटम यहाँ पे वन थाउजेंड टू थाउजेंड क्वान्टिटी एंटर दॉइस नंबर वॉइस अपडेट मैच स्टेटस मैच स्टेटस गेट्स पास्ट 
hopefully now passed <clears throat> or uh, now you can invoice it uh, one important thing is the default this status should be the ordered quantity here okay by default it will show you the received quantity okay normal behavior then you have to change it to ordered quantity okay now i can post it <clears throat> by the time it's posting let me open some other screens in the other tab so you can see what's the behavior um accounting wise okay so the invoice ho gaya to is status changed to invoiced okay let's open vendor master so <clears throat> invoice ho gaya now it is on the on the transit basically shipment start ho gaya so it will stay there for one month two months right now next thing what will you do is you just track track the uh, dates okay इस स्टेज पे लेट मी गो बैक टू द ओरिजिनल परचेज ऑर्डर परचेज ऑर्डर पे भी कुछ कुछ मैजिक हुआ है दैट्स अगेन अ वेरी गुड गुड फीचर तो जब भी आप परचेज ऑर्डर रिपोर्ट्स कुछ भी डेवलप करवा रहे हो तो इस चीज का ध्यान रखना पड़ेगा आपको कि परचेज ऑर्डर की लाइंस यहां पे स्प्लिट हो जाती हैं ठीक है यू नो द परचेज डिलीवरी डेट स्केड्यूल दैट्स दैट कम इन द पिक्चर हियर तो मेरा परचेज ऑर्डर नंबर है 332 332. Here you go. <clears throat> तो मैंने दो लाइन बनाई थी यहाँ पे 2000 4000 की बिकॉज आई शिफ्ट ओनली हाफ ऑफ दैम इट स्प्लिट दैट लाइन इन टू टू राइट फर्स्ट लाइन को फोर्थ एंड फिफ्थ में कन्वर्ट कर दिया इसने और यहाँ पे इसने डेट भी अपडेट कर दी होगी इफ यू गो टू द डिलीवरी इसकी कोई कंफर्म डिलीवरी डेट नहीं है पर दूसरी लाइन की अगर देखें तो इसकी एक डेट आ गई होगी जो कि अभी आएगी लेट मी शो यू हाउ इफ यू गो इन टू द ट्रैकिंग इन द वॉइस ट्रैकिंग एंड क्लिक स्टार्ट डेट यू टू say this shipment started on 1st of august right to so, setup jab uh, uh, kiya gaya tha inka legs ka and activities ka behind this uh, journey template where we define the 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 lead time ki ye shipment 37 days tak uh, yahan pe hoga ek din loading mein lagega teen din custom mein char din लोकल में तो इसके हिसाब से सिस्टम ने कैलकुलेट करके बोला कि 13 सितंबर को दिस शिपमेंट विल अराइव इन ऑस्ट्रेलिया राइट 13 सितंबर को तो ये डेट आई नीड टू सी नाउ ऑन द पीओ लाइंस ओके इसको रिफ्रेश किया नाउ क्लिक ऑन दिस लाइन क्लिक देयर इज नो डेट हियर क्लिक ऑन दिस लाइन दिस शोस मी 13th ऑफ सितंबर राइट सिमिलरली ऑन दिस लाइन आल्सो यू कैन सी 13th ऑफ सितंबर अगर मैं बोलू कि अभी ये शिपमेंट क्या है डिले हो गया है ये सेल्स कैनल में फंस गया है ठीक है तो ये एट सितंबर की बजाय हमारे हिसाब से थर्टी सितंबर को वहां पहुंचेगा ठीक है तो ये देखना कि ये थर्टी सितंबर से चेंज होके फिफ्थ ऑफ अक्टूबर हो गया है अभी यहां जाऊं और अब रिफ्रेश करूं तो ये सभी डेट चेंज हो जाएगी थर्ड लाइन चेंज टू फिफ्थ ऑफ अक्टूबर तो जब आप मास्टर प्लानिंग रन करोगे या कोई जो भी एटीपी कैलकुलेशन रन करोगे तो दिस विल बी वेरी हैंडी दिस इज रिक्वायर्ड राइट अदरवाइज योर मास्टर प्लानिंग विल फेल ओके सो दिस वाज अबाउट ट्रैकिंग सो यू कीप ऑन अपडेटिंग दिस डेट्स इट विल कीप ऑन अपडेटिंग द पीओस नाउ व्हाट नेक्स्ट यू नो सी द कॉस्ट इंक्वायरी वी ऑलरेडी सीन द कॉस्ट इंक्वायरी वी इनवॉइस already now let me just show you quickly the uh invoice <clears throat> what invoice got got posted and then i'll show you the inventory transaction as well okay so mera vendor hai that um here i go to the transactions <clears throat> transaction mein ye dekhi mera invoice uh उट 
तो ये मेरा शिपिंग वैल्यू ये थी मतलब मेरा वेंडर को लाइबिलिटी मेरी फोर्टी फोर पॉइंट टू मिलियन की लाइबिलिटी बनेगी ठीक है विच इज दिस ओके इफ आई क्लिक ऑन द बाउचर देन यू विल सी द अदर साइड ऑफ द अदर थिंग्स एज वेल तो सो दिस इज अगेन वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग माई लाइबिलिटी इज फोर पॉइंट टू मिलियन माई फिनिश गुड इन्वेंट्री इज नॉट फोर पॉइंट टू मिलियन राइट वाई बिकॉज माई फ्रेड इंश्योरेंस विच इज टू हंड्रेड थर्टीन थाउजेंड दैट्स ऑल्सो एडिड राइट सो टू थ्री थाउजेंड माई फ्रेड टू हंड्रेड टेन वॉज माई इंश्योरेंस राइट सो दैट्स एडिड इन माई इन्वेंट्री ओके दैट बिकम सो माई इन्वेंट्री इज डेफिटेड विद फुल अमाउंट माई लाइबिलिटी इज क्रिएटेड विद फोर पॉइंट टू मmillion. this amount uh, for freight insurance that goes in a clearing account for the time being right so it will get cleared when i um, get the actual invoice for freight and insurance okay so this was about <clears throat> invoicing uh if i go to at this stage to see where my inventory is sitting go go to my own hand list and find out uh, those items let's see just one of them let's say this one okay so you can see that two warehouse is one hand which is my main po warehouse this is my goods in transit warehouse okay so my inventory is sitting at in in this warehouse right now okay if i click on transactions here you can see so there are more transactions i created this morning About this, so my two thousand inventory sitting here. Uh, this is the value three point seven eight, which is three point seven eight. This one, right? So that's included, including my landed cost, my freight and insurance, right? That's the that's the thing we want to see on the accounting and inventory side. Okay. So if this is clear, let's move to the next stage, which will be receiving in the uh uh. warehouse right in the australia warehouse so receiving can be done using normal warehousing advanced warehousing is also supported um in this landed cost so mobile device and all everything uh, works I, i'll go with the simpler one uh, so there is a button here receive goods in transit <clears throat> okay and uh, you can select both say okay and that's received okay as soon as it is received you will see this moves out of the goods in transit warehouse and goes to your main warehouse okay so your goods in transit is gone and uh, your main warehouse has more inventory now okay 2000 arrives here okay <clears throat> so the inventory is received now the last step last step will be the receiving of the uh, actual invoice of the freight and insurance for that again is a very uh, big customization i would say done which is a kind of unique customization so yeah you need tax invoice general banana padega yahan pe or you will select that uh, freight forwarder or jo bhi jo bhi company aapko service provide kar rahi hai tumne case mein ye company thi <coughs> this uh, 1002 इनवॉइस डेट एज्यूमिंग की इनवॉइस डेट इसकी ये है टैक्स इनवॉइस नंबर इसका ये है और मेरे एग्जांपल के हिसाब से एस्टीमेट मेरा थ्री थाउजेंड का था पर एक्चुअल इनवॉइस मान लो फोर थाउजेंड का आता है ठीक है तो फोर थाउजेंड का मैंने यहाँ पे एंट्री डाली एंड देन इंटरेस्टिंग थिंग इज ना गो टू फंक्शन सिलेक्ट वॉइस कॉस्ट यहाँ पे मेरे को वॉइस सेलेक्ट करना है कि जो मेरा शिपमेंट का नंबर था वॉइस का नंबर था विच इज नाइन एंड क्लिक ओके Now another pop up comes up. I will say कि ये कौन से कौन से चार्ज का एक्सपेंस आया तो आई विल से कि फ्रेड का इनवॉइस आया मेरा एंड हाउ मच इज इट फोर थाउजेंड इज इट आई एम अलोकेटिंग होल फोर थाउजेंड तो यू कैन सी दिस विंडो हेयर रिमेनिंग इज नथिंग ओके क्लिक ओके एंड सो फोर थाउजेंड आई एम बुकिंग नाउ एंड क्लिक ऑन पोस्ट एज सुन एज आई पोस्ट इट show me two lines here debit and credit separately in two lines <clears throat> right so that got split now now we need to see the impact of this uh, on the inventory you can see before uh, my inventory cost was uh, this 37 3.7 million 
which is this after adjustment that should change to 3.783 before it was 7 3.72 right so let me refresh it that goes change to 3.783 right and if you want to see the details click details how much in the like original PO and how much is the adjustment <clears throat> so you can see here this is my original 3.6 is the original PO amount and uh, adjustment is 1.83 this adjustment is including the this last adjustment and also includes the freight uh, and insurance both <clears throat> okay so now my actual cost is also loaded on the item right that was the whole purpose of doing all these things so my inventory is sitting at this value now okay cool so i think uh, i'm done with my presentation that was the whole uh, like end-to-end -end, uh, cycle if you have any question, you can uh, start giving me here. Thanks, Satya. Uh, I, it was a great session. And uh, I just recall my landed cost knowledge. My question was, I asked my clients, and it's a good opportunity to share at this stage. Um, नहीं नहीं मुश्किल सवाल नहीं है मेरे ख्याल में वो एक एक मेरे ख्याल में एक डिस्कशन टाइप पे सवाल से ज्यादा ठीक है तो वो माइक्रोसॉफ्ट किस तरह उसको देख रहा है आंसर ही पता है ये डिस्कस कर रहे हैं ठीक है आंसर मुझे पता है लेकिन मैं अभी भी कंफ्यूज्ड हूं ठीक है आंसर बिल्कुल मुझे पता है लेकिन मैं कंफ्यूज रहता हूं उसमें तो मैंने कहा एक ऐसे लैंडेड कॉस्ट के जो कंसलटेंट है उनसे अगर मैं बात करूं क्वेश्चन ये है कि जब हमारे पास हमने ये रिस्क एंड रिवॉर्ड ट्रांसफर्स हो गए और इनवॉइस हमने पहले बना ली ठीक है और वो गुड इन ट्रांजिट में हमारे गुड्स जा चुके हैं ठीक है उसके बाद जब हम इसको रिसीव करते हैं वेयर हाउस में एक महीने बाद ठीक है तो मेरे जो क्लाइंट था उसने एक बहुत मासूमाना सवाल पूछा उसने कहा कि जब मैं इसको रिसीव कर रहा हूं तो क्या इस पे कोई डॉक्यूमेंट बनता है जब मैं कोई रिसीव कर रहा हूं वेयर हाउस के अंदर रिसीविंग का प्रोसेस तो वही है जैसे नॉर्मल रिसीविंग होता है मतलब आप एएसएन की बात कर रहे हो कि एएसएन बनता है उसके अगेंस्ट में रिसीव कर पाऊं नहीं आ, मैंने जो देखा वो ये था कि जैसे हम जब इसको रिसीव करते हैं ठीक है तो जी, हमारा नॉर्मल पीओ में तो जीएन का डॉक्यूमेंट बनता है ठीक है लेकिन आ, जब मैं इसकी रिसीविंग कर रहा हूं तो प्रोडक्ट रिसीट का वो डॉक्यूमेंट नहीं बनता ठीक है हालांकि वो गुड इन ट्रांजिट से ट्रांसफर हो जाती है गुड्स मेरे वेयर हाउस के अंदर तो क्या इसके अलावा कोई आपने अपनी पास स्टीम इंप्लीमेंटेशन में कोई ऐसा डॉक्यूमेंट देखा जो कि मैं कस्टमर को रेफर कर सकूं कि यहां से जाके देखूं मैं ट्रांजैक्शन से जाके तो देख सकता हूं ठीक है इसके बारे में आप मुझे कुछ बताएं कि आपने ऐसा कोई डॉक्यूमेंट देखा या मैं मैंने भी एक्सप्लोर नहीं किया कि यहां पे वो डेफिनेटली वहां पे बनता तो होगा पाथ माइट बी डिफरेंट जो आप बोल रहे हैं कि कहीं पे जाके बनता है पर क्योंकि रिसीविंग तो ये नॉर्मल रिसीविंग है ठीक है आई एम नॉट श्योर एग्जैक्टली कि यहां पे बनता है कि नहीं बनता है पर आइडियली बनता है नहीं बनता हो तो बन सकता है अगर क्लाइंट को कुछ ऐसा चाहिए तो आई हैव एंड एक्सप्लोर इट ठीक अच्छा एक और मेरे सवाल ये था कि फॉर एग्जांपल हम जो है कभी-कभी ऐसा होता है कि हमारे जो थर्ड पार्टी वेंडर्स होते हैं ठीक है वो बहुत देर में हमें इनवॉइसेस भेजते हैं ठीक है तो एक पहले इनवॉइस आई फिर हमारे पास फिर एक इनवॉइस आई और एक ऐसे वक्त में इनवॉइस आई जब इन्वेंटरी वो बिक चुकी थी वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन तो आप फाइनेंशियल पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू से किस तरह आप इसको क्लाइंट uh, uh, को अपने प्रपोज uh, करेंगे right. क्या करें वो वेरी गुड क्वेश्चन तो यहां पे क्या होता है कि जब uh, अगर इन्वेंटरी अगर वो बिक चुकी है सेल हो चुकी है तो डेफिनेटली आप उसकी कॉस्टिंग नहीं चेंज कर सकते कोई उसका फायदा नहीं है चेंज करने का ठीक है तो सिस्टम कैसे हैंडल करता है उसको क्लाइंट मतलब पहली बात तो आप वही बोलोगे कि यार जल्दी से जल्दी इनवॉइस आ जाए वही अच्छा है ठीक है इस इस मुश्किलात में क्यों जाना है मतलब कि एडजस्टमेंट करोगे पर सिस्टम कैसे हैंडल करता है इसको कि जो इन्वेंटरी बिक चुकी है मान लो जैसे 2000 में से 1000 बिक चुकी है उसकी कॉस्ट को अफेक्ट नहीं करेगा पर जो इन्वेंटरी है उसकी इन्वेंटरी पे वो प्रोपोर्शनेटली ऐड कर देता है कॉस्ट लैंड जो भी एडजस्टमेंट है ठीक है और जो रिमेनिंग है जो बिक चुकी है उसको वो वेरिएंस में लेके चला जाता है ठीक है दैट्स हाउ सिस्टम वर्क्स गुड और वो फिर ईयर एंड पे आप फिर उसकी एडजस्टमेंट वेरिएंस से निकाल के अकाउंट पे फिर जिस पे भी पोस्टिंग करनी है आप वो पोस्ट कर सकते हैं एग्जैक्टली एग्जैक्टली 
वो अल्टीमेटली कॉस्ट ऑफ गुड सोल्ड हेड में ही आता है कहीं ना कहीं वो कहीं ना कहीं कहीं नहीं जाएगा मतलब जो अकाउंटेंट करते हैं कि उसको ग्रुपिंग कॉस्ट ऑफ गुड सोल्ड अकाउंट उसमें ही करके रखते हैं क्योंकि अल्टीमेटली है तो वो आपका कॉस्टिंग ही तो कोई ट्रांसफर नहीं करते वो सही 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 तो ये आ, आपके पास जो है क्या कहते हैं ये आपने एक बड़ा अच्छा फर्क बताया कि लोगों को जो कि बड़ा मुझे बड़ा अच्छा लगा जो आउट बाउंड ट्रांसपोर्टेशन को लिंक कर रहा है और इन बाउंड जो है वो लैंडेड कॉस्ट को कर रहा है तो क्या लैंडेड कॉस्ट कभी ऐसा सिनेरियो आया कि आउट बाउंड के भी ऑर्डर डील कर रहा हो या सिर्फ स्पेसिफिकली ट्रांसपोर्टेशन मॉड्यूल ही उसको डील करता है लैंडेड कॉस्ट डेफिनेटली आउट बाउंड नहीं करता है ठीक है ट्रांसपोर्टेशन अगेन इस आई एम नॉट ए ट्रांसपोर्ट एक्सपर्ट बट ट्रांसपोर्ट मैंने देखा है कि बहुत ही मुश्किल मॉड्यूल है कॉन्फिगर करने करने के लिए एंड आई डोंट सीन की मेनी पीपल यूज इट ठीक है अगर जो ट्रांसपोर्टेशन जो आपके अगर लोग फ्लीट मैनेज करते हैं या इन आपके इंटीग्रेशन है फ्रेड फॉरवर्ड के साथ में तो दे यूज इट जो जो मिनिमम फ्रेट कैलकुलेशन करके किस फ्रेट फॉरवर्ड को फॉरवर्ड को वर्क को दिया जाए उसके लिए वो जरूर यूज करते हैं पर आई एवं सीन की मेनी पीपल यूज इट इवन फॉर आउट बाउंड इट्स इट्स अ कॉम्प्लेक्स थिंग और कुछ ना कुछ वो थर्ड पार्टी सिस्टम यूज कर रहे होते हैं इंस्टेड ऑफ डी थ्री सिक्स फाइव टी एम एस सही 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 तो आप अब जो यहाँ पर आपने जो है अगर मैं आपसे बात करूं जहां पर आप बेस्ड हैं ऑस्ट्रेलियन मार्केट में इधर ज्यादातर मैंने देखा है कि चाइना से काफी इंप्लीमेंटेशन हो रही है लैंडेड कॉस्ट की तो क्योंकि चाइना से इनकी इंपोर्ट ज्यादा है तो इसी तरह कुछ ममालिक जैसे पाकिस्तान और इंडिया है ये जैसे पाकिस्तान इंडिया से बहुत ज्यादा इम्पोर्ट करता है और चाइना से इम्पोर्ट करता है तो उधर भी ये लैंडेड कॉस्ट की इम्प्लीमेंटेशन काफी स्टार्ट हो गई है क्योंकि लोगों ने अपने मॉड्यूल्स बनाए हुए थे तो आपको कैसा एक्सपीरियंस रहा इंप्लीमेंटेशन के दौरान इसका कि आपको कैसा फील हुआ कि माइक्रोसॉफ्ट की ये प्रोडक्ट जो लैंडेड कॉस्ट का एडोन आया है ये क्या आपके हिसाब से पूरी क्लाइंट की चीजों को कैटर करता है नहीं मे, मेरे ख्याल से बहुत कुछ चीजें कैटर हो गई हैं आई एवं सीन की इसमें क्या अभी मिसिंग है कोई हो सकता है पोर्शनमेंट का मैथड कुछ रह गया हो एक मैं भी एक प्रोजेक्ट कर रहा हूँ उसमें उसमें कुछ सिनेरियो आया था जो कि एफ ओ बी की सिनेरियो नहीं था दैट इज अ सी आई एफ सीनैरियो राइट कि बायर इज इज पेइंग फॉर इंश्योरेंस एंड फ्रेट राइट और उसका जो फ्रेट एंड इंश्योरेंस है दैट इज नॉट बेस्ड ऑन द शिपमेंट दैट्स बेस्ड ऑन द कंटेनर पर कंटेनर तो उसमें भी मतलब ये हैंडल कर लेता है ठीक है उसको और जैसे बड़े बड़ी हम मशीनरी ऑर्डर करते हैं उसमें ठीक है हमारे क्लाइंट है बेसिकली ही इज इंपोर्टिंग ट्रक्स फ्रॉम जापान राइट तो ट्रक को आप कंटेनर में नहीं डाल सकते ठीक है तो ट्रक तो ऐसे कंटेनर शिपमेंट के ऊपर ही ऐसे रखे हुए आते हैं कंटेनर नहीं होता है वो पूरे शिपमेंट के अंदर ही रखे होते हैं तो इसमें कंटेनर इज ए मैंडेटरी स्टेप आप पहले वॉइस बनाते हो फिर आप कंटेनर में डालते हो आइटम्स को ठीक है तो उसको हमने मैप कर दिया कि यार कंटेनर आपको करना ही पड़ेगा तो बोलते हैं कि जैसे इनवॉइस बनते हैं एक शिपमेंट के दस इनवॉइस हैं तो मैंने कहा चलो इनवॉइस इज इक्वल टू वन कंटेनर तो मैंने उसको वैसे मैप कर दिया ठीक है तो अभी okay. एक दो सिनेरियो okay. वैसे आए हैं बट वी समाउ हैंडल इट अभी तो कुछ uh, लगता नहीं कि देर इज समिंग आउट साइड ऑफ दिस दिस इज रियली ह्यूज आई आई विल से जैसे इनवॉइसिंग करना पहले और परचेज ऑर्डर की डेट्स अपडेट होना अपने आप ठीक है स्प्लिट हो जाना वो डिलीवरी डेट का दैट्स दैट्स रियली गुड ठीक शुक्रिया सत्या बहुत बहुत और एक आखिरी सवाल है मोहम्मद आमिर नाजिम का है हमारे पास जो कि हाउ करेंसी एक्सचेंज इंपैक्ट दिस प्रोसेस ड्यूरिंग इंटरनेशनल शिपमेंट तो जब आप ये चार्जेस uh, डिफाइन करते हो तो वहां पे That can be defined on any currency. कि जैसे आप चाइना से कुछ ला रहे हो तो हो सकता है कि फ्रेड फॉरवर्ड चाइना का हो तो आपका ऑस्ट्रेलियन डॉलर में आपका मेन इन वॉइस है पीओ है आप फ्रेड uh, इंश्योरेंस आप दे रहे हो चाइनीज यू एन में और uh, कोई कोस्ट आप मान लो अमेरिकन डॉलर में दे रहे हो ठीक है तो इट कैन इट कैन हैंडल दो डिफरेंट करेंसीज इन द चार्जेज लेवल ठीक है और करेंसी एक्सचेंज रेट आप डिफाइन कर सकते हो पैरामीटर में एंड इट बेस्ड ऑन दैट इट विल टेक अप द द एक्सचेंज रेट 
डेफिनेटली जब आपका एक्चुअल इनवॉइस आता है उस टाइम पे तो वो जो स्पॉट रेट होगा उसको वही वाला एक्सचेंज रेट लेगा वहां पे ओके ठीक है तो मतलब नॉर्मल जैसे इनवॉइसिंग एक्सचेंज रेट होता है वैसे ही चलता है इसमें भी सही सही ओके सत्या थैंक यू वेरी मच इट वाज रियली अ प्लेजर हियर टू होस्ट यू एंड यू आंसर्स ऑल द क्वेश्चंस एज़ वेल एंड थैंक यू फॉर कमिंग टू टू हिंदी बूट कैंप 2021 सी यू नेक्स्ट टाइम अगेन थैंक यू वेरी मच अमर for giving this opportunity hope uh, ki ye har saal hota rahe aur hum har saal yahan pe kuch na kuch uh, mulakat karte rahe theek hai shukriya uh, satya ab hamare agle speaker uh, maujood hain theek hai jo hamare ek waiting lobby mein hain aur aapke bade jaane maane dost bhi hain wo to hum unka session dekhe bagair aap jaiyega nahi zarur zarur thank you very much ओके सो नाजरीन अब हमारे साथ मौजूद हैं रचित गार्ज हेलो रचित हाउ आर यू हेलो अमर मैं बढ़िया हूँ आप बताएं बहुत मजा आ रहा है इस इवेंट में या yeah, uh, बहुत ही जबरदस्त सेशन हो रहे हैं बहुत ही इंफॉर्मेशन इंफॉर्मेटिव टॉपिक डिस्कस हो रहे हैं तो uh, मुझे आज यकीन है कि आप भी कुछ एक नई चीज लेके आए होंगे हमारे लिए और मैं तो बड़ा एक्साइटेड हूँ आपके सेशन के लिए थैंक यू माफ फॉर दैट आज मैं एक्चुअली एक बहुत ही नई चीज़ पे बात करने वाला हूँ जिसका नाम है डायनामिक्स 365 सिक्सटी फाइव इंटेलिजेंट ऑर्डर मैनेजमेंट और ये ऐप अभी जनरली अवेलेबल होने वाली है अगस्त में तो आई थिंक दिस इज द राइट टाइम टू टॉक अबाउट इट सो आई एम रियली एक्साइटेड फॉर दिस सेशन एज वेल तो मैं टाइम ज़ाया किए बगैर आपको ये स्टेज देता हूँ बेस्ट ऑफ लक थैंक यू अमार अच्छा माई स्क्रीन अमार एक बार बताएंगे स्क्रीन दिख रही है कैन यू सी माय स्क्रीन अमार ऑल गुड रजत ऑल गुड ओके परफेक्ट ऑल राइट स्वागत है सभी का ये सेशन मैंने हिंदी में चूज किया करने के लिए तो कोशिश करूंगा कि मैं हिंदी में ही बोलूं uh, लास्ट टाइम भी जब ये हिंदी उर्दू इवेंट हुआ था तब मैंने एक सेशन दिया था हिंदी में और डिफिकल्ट uh, होता है uh, हिंदी में एक प्रोफेशनल सेशन देना क्योंकि हम इतने यूज टू होते हैं इंग्लिश में uh, सारे प्रोफेशनल काम करने के लिए बट आई विल ट्राई माय बेस्ट तो सबसे पहले मैं थैंक यू बोलना चाहूँगा सारे स्पॉन्सर्स का गुरु ग्रुप बार हेड uh, जो कि मेलबर्न uh, में ऑस्ट्रेलिया में काफ़ी वेल नोन कंपनी है डायनामिक स्पेस में माजिक ग्लोबल का जिन्होंने इस इवेंट uh, को स्पॉन्सर किया और हम सबको ये प्लेटफॉर्म अवेलेबल कराया जिसके थ्रू हम सब कनेक्ट होके इतनी ज्यादा नॉलेज शेयरिंग कर पा रहे हैं सो आई विल कंटिन्यू विद द थीम स्वागत है सबका वेलकम तो सबसे पहले इस इवेंट में सबसे मजा इस मजे की बात ये हो रही है कि हर कोई अपने होम टाउन की और अपने देश की बातें कर रहा है तो मैंने सोचा मैं भी थोड़ा सा बताऊं कि मैं कहाँ से हूँ अपने ओरिजिन के बारे में तो मैं बेसिकली बिलोंग करता हूं सिटी ऑफ ताजमहल आगरा को तो वो जो यहां पे रेड डॉट दिख रहा है यहां पे बेस्ड है मैं आगरा में ही बॉन्ड एंड ब्रॉटअप हुआ हूं पूरी एजुकेशन इंजीनियरिंग आगरा से करी है बहुत फाउंड मेमोरीज हैं बहुत अच्छी सिटी है ताजमहल जिस के लिए फेमस है आगरा जनरली लोगों को ताजमहल फ्रंट से देख देखने की आदत है लाइक मोस्टली पिक्चर्स में फ्रंट है बट जो पिक्चर मैंने यहाँ प्रेजेंट करी है वो बैक साइड है ताजमहल का और आप देख सकते हैं कितना खूबसूरत दिखता है दिस इज द यमुना रिवर बैक बैक साइड से यमुना रिवर जाती है और यहाँ पे काफी इवेंट्स ऑर्गेनाइज होते हैं तो बहुत अच्छा लगता है जब भी कोई इवेंट होता है आप पीछे से ताजमहल दिखता है उसके खाने की बात आई थी मोहम्मद आलम ने आम की बात करी थी तो मेरे को भी याद आई आगरा की बेड़ी और जलेबी जो कि वहाँ का बहुत ही फेमस ब्रेकफास्ट है मजे की बात यह है कि आगरा में मिलती है आस ज्यादा जाओ तो मिलती नहीं है तो We do actually crave uh, a lot for it. Uh, एक टाइप की इट्स अ मिक्सचर ऑफ पूरी एंड कचौड़ी इट्स नॉट एज सॉफ्ट एज पूरी एंड इट्स नॉट एज हार्ड एज कचौड़ी तो उसके बीच का है और इसके साथ जो आलू की सब्जी होती है बहुत स्पाइसी होती है इसलिए लोग इसमें दही डाल के खाते हैं जिनका टेस्ट थोड़ा लेस स्पाइसी होता है और इसके साथ जाती है जलेबी 
प्लस फेमस है आगरा का पेठा वर्ल्ड वाइड फेमस है यहाँ भी मिलता है खाते हैं हम लोग अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट आगरा का लेदर इंडस्ट्री इज क्वाइट बिग देर आर मैनी मैनी इंडस्ट्रीज जो कि लेदर मैनुफैक्चरिंग स्पेशली शूज बनते हैं काफी वर्ल्ड वाइड एक्सपोर्ट होते हैं तो दैट वॉज अ बिट अबाउट माई बैकग्राउंड फ्रॉम वेयर आई कम अगर कोई भी आगरा का ट्रिप प्लान करता है तो लेट मी नो आई विल बी मोर देन हैप्पी टू ऑर्गेनाइज समथिंग फॉर यू गाइज देयर Uh, बात करते हैं मेरे प्रोफेशनल एक्सपीरियंस की तो दोस्तों मैंने डायनामिक्स uh, uh, 365 फाइनेंस एंड ऑपरेशन अब नाम हो गया है बट uh, जब मैंने जॉब स्टार्ट करी थी इन द ईयर 2005 दिस प्रोडक्ट वाज कॉल्ड एज डायनामिक्स ए तो उस टाइम पे ए वर्जन 3.0 था उसके बाद माइक्रोसॉफ्ट uh, का एक कंटिन्यूड फोकस रहा इस प्रोडक्ट पे प्रोडक्ट इवॉल्व होता रहा टेक्नोलॉजी के साथ मैच्योर होता रहा और जो लोग इस फील्ड में काम कर रहे थे उनको मजा आने लगा क्योंकि एक पूरा इकोसिस्टम था उस प्रोडक्ट को मैच्योर करने के लिए कस्टमर्स में एक पैशन था इस प्रोडक्ट को यूज करने का तो हो गया लाइक आई आई एम वर्किंग फ्रॉम 2005 इन दिस स्टार्ट किया था एज एन एक्स प्लस प्लस डेवलपर मोस्टली टेक्नोलॉजी साइड से मेरा टच रहा है रिसेंटली थोड़ा सा आर्किटेक्चर एंड सोल्यूशन साइड में भी इन्वॉल्वमेंट रहा है बट मोस्टली आई एम इन टू द टेक्निकल साइड ऑफ डायनामिक्स थ्री सिक्सटी फाइव फाइनेंस एंड ऑपरेशन कम्युनिटी एंथुसियास्ट हूँ लाइक माइंडेड पीपल फैजल अमर कमर ये लोग हैं यहाँ पे सब तो बहुत मजा आता है कम्युनिटी एंगेजमेंट्स में ग्लोबली एम वी पी से बात करने में और ग्लोबली डायनामिक्स कम्युनिटी के लोगों से बात करने में बहुत अच्छा लगता है और उसका रीजन ये है कि हर कोई अपनी नॉलेज शेयर करता है एक दूसरे के साथ तो दैट इज दी ब्यूटी ऑफ माइक्रोसॉफ्ट डायनामिक्स कम्युनिटी तो अगर आप ये सेशन लाइव देख रहे हैं या बाद में देख रहे हैं और आप डायनामिक्स कम्युनिटी फील्ड के हैं तो आगे आइए बहुत अच्छे अच्छे यूजर ग्रुप्स हैं ग्लोबली उसमें पार्टिसिपेट कीजिए अपनी नॉलेज को शेयर करिए क्योंकि इतना कुछ है सीखने के लिए आप अकेले सब नहीं सीख सकते एक दूसरे के एक्सपीरियंस से सीखेंगे तो जल्दी सीख जाएंगे During my tenure, I have worked with companies like uh, Tectura uh, to increase, uh, which was merged with Columbus. Then I came to Australia in 2013. Uh, uh, was working with Sable 37, which was DXC ne acquired. Kiya. Then I worked with Infosys, and now I am working with PwC Australia. I live in Melbourne. If you follow me, you will know that I like QR codes. So, if you follow me, you will know that I like QR codes. कोई भी लिंक शेयर करना होता है तो उसका मैं क्यूआर कोड शेयर करता हूं तो यहां पे क्यूआर कोड्स हैं मेरे ब्लॉग के आ, मेरे लिंक हैंडल के और ट्विटर के तो अगर आप चाहें तो स्कैन करके मुझे मुझसे कनेक्ट कर सकते हैं यूजर ग्रुप्स की बात आई थी तो आई एम एक्टिवली पार्टिसिपेटिंग इन दीज थ्री यूजर ग्रुप्स ए एन जी डी थ्री सिक्सटी फाइव फिनॉप्स टीम विच इज अ प्लेटफॉर्म फॉर कनेक्टिंग डायनामिक्स प्रोफेशनल इन ऑस्ट्रेलिया एंड न्यूजीलैंड पाकिस्तान यूजर ग्रुप जिसका मैं पार्ट हूँ इस इवेंट में भी ऑर्गेनाइजिंग uh, कमेटी का पार्ट हूँ uh, बहुत अच्छा ग्रुप है बहुत अच्छे लोग हैं बहुत मजा आ रहा है इस इवेंट में और हमने रिसेंटली एक महीने पहले लॉन्च किया है डायनामिक्स 365 यूजर ग्रुप फॉर इंडिया तो ऑब्जेक्टिव ये है कि हम लोगों को एक साथ लेके आए वी आर नॉट ट्राइंग टू बिल्ड समथिंग इन पैरल बट कुछ ऐसा करें कि हम ग्लोबली डायनामिक्स के यूजर्स को कनेक्ट uh, कर पाए so that is the objective uh, i'll move forward uh, considering trying time uh, just a quick uh, thing i want to talk about dynamics 365 user group india is ki ek mahina ho gaya hai launch kiye hue we have already 200 plus members in this group uh, yahan pe qr codes hain uh, twitter handle ke aur linkedin handle ke to please scan kare and hame join kare aur ek session aane wala hai dynamics 365 finance and operations ki इंटीग्रेशन के स्टडीज को लेकर जो कि प्रेजेंट करेंगे आशीष श्रीवास्तव जो सिडनी में रहते हैं विद अ ग्रुप सो डू प्लीज ज्वाइन अस इन दिस जर्नी एंड एनकरेज अस टू टेक इट फॉरवर्ड चलिए अब आते हैं अपने टॉपिक पे कि इंटेलिजेंट ऑर्डर मैनेजमेंट क्या है तो हम जो एजेंडा है आज का उसमें हम बात करेंगे कि ये ऐप है क्या डायनामिक्स 365 सिक्सटी फाइव इंटेलिजेंट ऑर्डर मैनेजमेंट इसके कंपोनेंट्स क्या हैं इसके आर्किटेक्चर क्या है इसका ट्रायल एनवायरनमेंट आप कैसे डिप्लॉय कर सकते हैं एक झलक देखेंगे इस एप्लीकेशन की जो मैंने ट्रायल एनवायरनमेंट में डिप्लॉय करी थी और बाद में लेंगे क्यू एन ए क्वेश्चन एंड आंसर कुछ होते हैं तो।, तो दोस्तों इंट्रोडक्शन सेशन है और इसमें मेरा ऑब्जेक्टिव ये है कि जो कॉन्सेप्ट है वो क्लियर हो जाए राइट right. तो अभी मेरा क्योंकि मैंने भी बहुत ज्यादा डीप डाइव नहीं किया बट जो मैंने आर्किटेक्चर समझा है वो मैं नॉलेज सबके साथ शेयर करना चाहता हूं ताकि 
जब ये ऐप जनरली अवेलेबल होती है ऑगस में तो हमें पता हो कि ये है क्या तो दोस्तों स्टार्टिंग करेंगे हम कि ये समझने के लिए कि ऐसा क्या हुआ कि माइक्रोसॉफ्ट को एक नई एप्लीकेशन लॉन्च करनी पड़ी विद फोकस ऑफ सप्लाई चेन मैनेजमेंट इन माइंड राइट इसकी क्या बिजनेस वैल्यू है और क्यों ये मॉडर्न है ये आप देखेंगे जब भी डायनामिक्स 365 इंटेलिजेंट ऑर्डर मैनेजमेंट की बात होगी ये वर्ड जरूर आएगा कि ये मॉडर्न है और लेटेस्ट टेक्नोलॉजी पे बिल्ड है अडेप्टेबल है तो क्यों है ये हम जानेंगे आज के सेशन में तो सप्लाई चेन इंडस्ट्रीज का सबसे बड़ा प्रॉब्लम आज की डेट में ये है कि सप्लाई चेन अब बहुत कॉम्प्लेक्स हो चुकी है इतने ज्यादा थर्ड पार्टी प्रोवाइडर्स हैं इतने ज्यादा ई कॉमर्स मोबाइल एप्स वेरियस टेक्नोलॉजी चैनल हैं जिसके ऑर्डर लेसिंग को भी मैनेज कर बड़ा का अगर आप एक है सब ये हर क्लाइंट का चैलेंज हो जितने भी इंप्लीमेंट करी या इन्वेंट्री हैवी क्लाइंट्स रहे हैं बट चैलेंजिंग इतना टफ होता है क्यों डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन सेंटर से करना है डिलीवरी प्रोवाइडर के थ्रू करना है uh hi rachit sorry to interrupt i think you are on mute um so ek dafa unmute kar lenge ha ji perfect uh Can you hear me now yes absolutely ab main aapko sun pa raha hu to aap ki awaaz bilkul theek aa rahi thi jab aapne thoda sa hmm pretext diya uska and then maybe we try turning off your video uh, video to so, thodi si bandwidth bhi achhi ho jayegi and voice ka issue nahi hoga okay. thanks okay okay am i audible now abhi clear hai yes yes that's good okay theek hai to aage chalte hain doston to intelligent order management ki business value ye hai ki aap order fulfillment ke andar ye intense kar raha hai isliye iska naam hai intelligent order management ये आपके ऑर्डर के फुलफिलमेंट के फ्लो को ऑप्टिमाइज करता है कैसे करता है वो हम अभी बात करते हैं ये आपको इनसाइट्स देता है जिसके ऊपर आप एक्शन ले सकें इनसाइट्स आजकल हम सभी सुनते हैं पावर बीआई है डेटा एनालिटिक्स हैं और वो इनसाइट्स आती हैं बट वो इनसाइट्स अगर एक्शनेबल होती हैं तो उनका वैल्यू अलग ही होती है तो इंटेलिजेंट ऑर्डर मैनेजमेंट में जो इनसाइट्स आती हैं वो एक्शनेबल होती हैं प्लस इसकी सबसे बड़ी खासियत है कि आप इसको कॉन्फ़िगरेशन के थ्रू अडेप्ट चेंज कर सकते हैं अकॉर्डिंग टू योर सप्लाई एंड डिमांड तो अब इसको मॉडर्न क्या बनाता है ये इवेंट बेस्ड इकोसिस्टम पे बना इट इज ड्रिवन बाय इवेंट्स सबसे बड़ी मेजर पॉइंट है कि आपको अपनी एग्जिस्टिंग एप्लीकेशन को रिप एंड रिप्लेस नहीं करना ये मेरे मेरे लिए नया वर्ड है मैंने पहली बार सुना है शायद सेल्स uh, के लोगों ने पहले सुना हो बट This is the beauty. You don't have to rip and replace your legacy application. आपके पास करेंट एप्लीकेशन है सप्लाई चेन की आप उसके साथ इंटेलिजेंट ऑर्डर मैनेजमेंट को ऑनबोर्ड कर सकते हैं तो इट्स नॉट अ कॉस्टली फुल रिप्लेसमेंट ऑफ योर लीगसी एप्लीकेशन इसको फ्यूल करता है पावर करता है आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस तो ये जो एक्शनेबल इंसाइट्स हैं ये आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस के थ्रू आ रही है इसमें तो इट्स नॉट ओनली रिपोर्टिंग इट्स पावर्ड बाई आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस जो ये हम बात करते हैं ड्रिवेन बाय इवेंट इट्स बेस्ड ऑन दी पावर ऑटोमेट पावर ऑटोमेट इज द प्लेटफॉर्म विच गिव्स यू दैट इकोसिस्टम तो दोस्तों आगे बढ़ते हैं जल्दी से इसके आर्किटेक्चर के बारे में बात करते हैं 
अब क्विक व्यू कि ये डायनामिक्स 365 फैमिली में फिट कहाँ होता है तो अगर आपने लेटेस्ट डायग्राम देखा होगा तो माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने इसका लोगो रिलीज किया है इट इज सिटिंग इन द डायनामिक्स 365 फैमिली और ये बना है पावर प्लेटफॉर्म पे वेन आई से पावर प्लेटफॉर्म मतलब अंडर द हुड डेटा इज स्टोर्ड इन डेटा इट इज अ मॉडल ड्रिविन एप तो जो लोग सीई uh, साइट से हैं पावर प्लेटफॉर्म के एक्सपर्ट्स हैं दे विल बी हैप्पी टू नो इट इज अ मॉडल ड्रिविन एप intelligent order management is based on power platform it's a model driven app it is built on dataverse and there are few very unique things which are called uh, like fulfillment optimization and order orchestration to ye hum dekhte hain kaise hota hai to concepts ki baat karenge components ki baat karenge to what are the key components to jo yahan pe is uh, slide pe hai ye hai key components intelligent order management ke application which is your model driven app providers ye kya hai abhi hum baat karenge but agar aapko summary chahiye key component or terminology har jagah intelligent order management mein ye terms aayenge providers orchestration inventory visibility service fulfillment optimization and insights to so let's to so app ka kaam kya hai app hai user interface like it's like meaningful right app is the user interface ye aapki model driven app hai build on power platform isko aap extend kar sakte hain customize kar sakte hain jaise ki aap kisi aur model driven app ko customize karte hain app ka fayda ye hai ki hai business users ke liye yahan se aapko single view of your complete supply chain milega aapki current state kya hai fulfillment ki orders multiple channel originate hote hain एग्जाम्पल यू कैन हैव ई कॉमर्स वेबसाइट इलेक्ट्रॉनिक चेंज जहां ऐप से ऑर्डर रहे हैं टेलीफोन ऑर्डर्स प्लेस कर रहे हैं देर कैन बी मल्टीपल चैनल जहां से ऑर्डर्स आ रहे हैं वो सारे लैंड होके आपको इस ऐप में दिख जाएंगे उसको इनेबल कौन कर रहा है प्रोवाइडर्स वेन आई टॉक वेन आई से प्रोवाइडर आवर ऑटोमेट कनेक्टर्स तो बेसिकली क्या होता है कि कोई भी थर्ड पार्टी एप्लीकेशन है जिससे आप कनेक्ट करना चाहते हैं उसका एक पावर ऑटोमेट में कनेक्टर बनता है और उस कनेक्टर के थ्रू है प्रोवाइडर दो तरीके के हैं फर्स्ट पार्टी प्रोवाइडर एंड अ थर्ड पार्टी प्रोवाइडर फर्स्ट पार्टी प्रोवाइडर वो होता है जो माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने पब्लिश किया है इस एप्लीकेशन के लिए फॉर एग्जाम्पल आपका डायनामिक्स 365 के प्रोवाइडर्स माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने रिलीज किए हैं ऑर्डरफुल करके एक ई कॉमर्स इंजन है जिसके माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने प्रोवाइडर्स फुलफिल किए हैं रिलीज किए हैं तो ये हैं फर्स्ट पार्टी प्रोवाइडर्स थर्ड पार्टी प्रोवाइडर्स वो होते हैं जो बेसिकली माइक्रोसॉफ्ट इको के बाहर के होते हैं और यहाँ पे है वेंडर्स के लिए एक अपॉर्चुनिटी मार्केट में ये अपॉर्चुनिटी है आप अपने एप्लीकेशन के कनेक्टर्स बनाए और इसको पब्लिश करें पावर ऑटोमेट के इको में प्रोवाइड अब प्रोवाइडर के अंदर सब पार्ट क्या होते हैं कनेक्शन कनेक्शन क्या करता है आपको अलाउ करता है टू कनेक्ट टू एन एप्लीकेशन बिजनेस इवेंट ये वो ये बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है बिजनेस इवेंट होता है कि जो एप्लीकेशन आपको अपना प्रोवाइडर दे रही है वो क्या क्या बिजनेस इवेंट कर सकती है इट्स अ लिस्ट ऑफ ऑल द बिजनेस एक्शन दैट एक्सटर्नल एप्लीकेशन कैन डू नाउ एक्शन इज डिफरेंट नाउ एक्शन इज एंड बिजनेस इवेंट आर डिफरेंट एक्शन इज की एक वर्क जो उसे करना है फॉर एग्जाम्पल बिजनेस इवेंट हो सकता है कि ओके okay, ऑर्डर को मार्क कर दो एज कंप्लीट और डिलीवर्ड बट एक्शन हो सकता है कि मुझे एड्रेस uh, वैलिडेशन करना है तो एड्रेस वैलिडेशन इज डिफरेंट टू अ बिजनेस इवेंट पैरामीटर्स एडिशनल इंफॉर्मेशन होती है जो कि आप इन चीजों को पैरामीटराइज कर सकते हैं एंड ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन तो इसके बारे में डिटेल में डॉक्स पे लिखा है बट प्रोवाइडर इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट कॉन्सेप्ट इन योर इंटेलिजेंट ऑर्डर मैनेजमेंट क्विकली बात करेंगे नेक्स्ट स्लाइड पे ऑर्केस्ट्रेशन uh, फ्लो ये है बिजनेस यूजर्स के लिए यहाँ पे हम क्या कर सकते हैं अपने ऑर्डर की जर्नी को मॉडल कर सकते हैं यूजिंग अ यूआई देर इज अ फ्लो डिजाइनर इट्स लाइक क्रिएटिंग अ विजियो डायग्राम वेर यू कैन से आई वांट टू फर्स्ट वैलिडेट माय एड्रेस देन आई वांट टू डू समथिंग एल्स यू कैन कन्फिगर योर ऑर्डर ऑर्केस्ट्रेशन जर्नी मतलब ये यहाँ पे हम इन्वेंट्री की बात नहीं कर रहे हैं यहाँ पे है उसकी जर्नी ऑर्केस्ट्रेशन कैसे ऑर्डर फुलफिल होगा कब जाएगा कहाँ जाएगा क्या क्या स्टेप्स होंगे ये है ऑर्केस्ट्रेशन और ये एक यूजर फ्रेंडली फ्लो डिजाइनर है एप्लीकेशन के अंदर जो कि बिजनेस यूजर्स यूज कर सकते हैं कन्फिगर करने के लिए तो यहाँ पे आप देखेंगे ये मॉडर्न क्यों है राइट इन्वेंट्री विजिबिलिटी सर्विस ये एक हाईली स्केलेबल सर्विस माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने पब्लिश करी है जिसके थ्रू आपको एक सिंगल 
व्यू मिलेगा आपकी इन्वेंट्री का अक्रॉस ऑल लीगल एंटिटीज तो इसकी भी कन्फिग्रेशन ऐप के अंदर होती है हम अभी देखेंगे लास्ट थिंग इज लास्ट टू थिंग्स फुलफिलमेंट ऑप्टिमाइजेशन फुलफिलमेंट ऑप्टिमाइजेशन क्या होता है अभी ये देखो टर्म बहुत यूनिक है फुलफिलमेंट ऑप्टिमाइजेशन इज अबाउट फुलफिलमेंट स्ट्रैटेजीज की ऑर्डर में जो आपकी इन्वेंट्री सप्लाई हो रही है वो फुलफिल कौन करेगा डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन सेंटर से होगी लोकल वेंडर से होगी कहाँ से मेरा इन्वेंट्री फुलफिल हो रही है तो फुलफिलमेंट ऑप्टिमाइजेशन इज डिफरेंट टू योर ऑर्केस्ट्रेशन ऑफ योर जर्नी जो मैंने पहले कॉन्सेप्ट बताया था इसके लिए माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड ऑर्डर मैनेजमेंट करके एक माइक्रो सर्विस बनाई है जो कि ये यूज करता है और ये सारा सेटअप फुलफिलमेंट ऑप्टिमाइजेशन का माइक्रोसॉफ्ट डेटावर्स में सेव होता है जो कि अभी हम देखेंगे इनसाइट्स पावर बी आई इनसाइट्स होती हैं और यूनिफाइड क्लाइंट इंटरफेस इनसाइट्स होती हैं पावर बी आई के जो इनका एक क्विक डायग्राम देख लेते हैं कैसे काम करता है क्योंकि इसमें एक छोटा सा कैच है जो माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने डॉक्स की वेबसाइट पे बताया हुआ है कि हुआ क्या एक्सटर्नल एप्लीकेशन से डेटा आता है डेटावर्स में बना उसके बाद ये इनका इंटरनल फ्रेमवर्क है जहां पे डेटावर्स से डेटा जाता है डेटा लेक में वहां पे वो डेटा लेक से डेटा जाता है एक एनालिटिक्स प्लेटफॉर्म पे ताकि उसके ऊपर हम ए के एल्गोरिथम्स चला सके और उसकी पावर बी की के बनती हैं और उसको वापस वो डेटा लेक में लाते हैं डेटा लेक से वापस ये पावर बी वर्क स्पेस में दिखा के आपको रिपोर्ट दिखती है तो आप देख रहे हैं जो डेटा आया उसके ऊपर डेटा लेक में जाके एनालिटिक्स होती हैं और वो वापस आके दिखता है तो यहाँ पे ये सब मॉडर्न प्लेटफॉर्म यूज हो रहा है डेटा को एनालाइज और करने का और इसी की वजह से आपके ऊपर एक्शनेबल इंसाइट आपको मिल पा रही है अभी क्या है इसमें कैच कि माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने पब्लिश किया है कि आप आउट ऑफ बॉक्स बीआई कैपेबिलिटीज आ रही हैं उनको आप कस्टमाइज नहीं कर सकते और ये जो डेटा डेटा लेक में जाता है ये आप एक्सेस एक्सेस नहीं कर सकते लेकिन अगर आपको अपनी कस्टम पावर बीआई डैशबोर्ड बनानी है तो यू हैव एक्सेस टू द डेटावर्स और डेटावर्स से डेटा आप खुद ले जाके अपने डेटा लेक में करके उसके ऊपर पावर बी कर सकते हैं क्विकली देख लेते हैं कुछ ग्लिम्स ऑफ दी पावर बी आई डैशबोर्ड विच आर अवेलेबल इन द प्रोडक्ट सॉरी आई क्लिक टू वाइज बट लेट्स टॉक अबाउट दिस सो बेसिकली इसमें यहाँ पे ये पावर बी आई डैशबोर्ड है जहाँ पे आप देख सकते हैं कि कौन से ऑर्डर्स में वैलिडेशन फेल हुआ है किस रूल की वजह से फेल हो रहे हैं कौन से क्या स्टेटस है तो आप यहीं से इन सब चीज़ों का एक्शन ले सकते हैं अनदर पावर बी आई चार्ट इन दी एप इज हेयर जहाँ पे आपको सिस्टम मॉनिटरिंग आउटबाउंड इनसाइट्स हैं यहाँ पे आप देख सकते हैं कि कितने रिक्वेस्ट आ रहे हैं इनबाउंड या आउटबाउंड कितने एक्टिव कनेक्टर्स हैं क्या उनका सक्सेस रेट्स है right? इसमें आपके पास मैप्स की कैपेबिलिटी भी है यू कैन आल्सो सी दी जर्नी ऑफ योर ऑर्डर्स हाउ योर कैरियर ट्रैकिंग इज स्टोरिंग द इन्फॉर्मेशन ऑफ योर ऑर्डर्स तो यहाँ पे आप कैरियर ट्रैकिंग कर सकते हैं ये कैरियर ट्रैकिंग कैसे हो रही है अगेन पावर uh, ऑटोमेट के कनेक्टर्स हैं जिनके थ्रू आप इन्फॉर्मेशन एक्सचेंज कर सकते हैं और अगर आपको मैप इनेबल करना है तो पावर मॉडल ड्रिवन एप्स में एक सेटिंग होती है टू इनेबल बिंग मैप इन योर एप्लीकेशन वो आपको इनेबल करना पड़ेगा अगर आपको यहाँ पे मैप्स देखना है तो क्विकली बात करते हैं ये सब था बिजनेस वैल्यू अभी हम बात करते हैं अंडर द हुड आर्किटेक्चर की तो दोस्तों ऑन दी होल सॉरी I'll just go one slide back. Uh, so on a high level, if you see, हो क्या रहा है ऑर्डर का सारा डेटा मल्टीपल सोर्सेस से आपका एक डेटावर्स में आ रहा है और यहाँ पे आप क्या कर रहे हैं बिजनेस यूजर्स ऑर्डर की ऑर्केस्ट्रेशन को कन्फिगर कर रहे हैं और फुलफिलमेंट स्ट्रेटेजीज डिफाइन कर रहे हैं एंड दिस इज वेयर योर इंटेलिजेंट ऑर्डर मैनेजमेंट इज टॉकिंग टू एक्सटर्नल सिस्टम्स again via power automate connectors and telling them to do something that i want my order address to be validated first then i have to go to next step to ye jo business events aur jo connectors ka ecosystem hai providers ka concept hai wo yahan pe hai aur ye opportunity hai market mein agar aap isv hain ya aap ek vendor hain ya aapka ek e-commerce platform hai aap yahan pe connector banaye apna aur publish kare to definitely it will get picked by the customers उसके बाद क्या होता है यहाँ पे फुलफिलमेंट हो रहा है राइट सो दैट्स इन अटशल अबाउट योर सप्लाई चेन तो टेक्निकल आर्किटेक्चर की बात करेंगे तो जो की कंपोनेंट्स हैं जो कि ड्राइव कर रहे हैं इस होल एप्लीकेशन को वो मैं क्विकली बात कर लेता हूँ पावर क्वेरी पावर क्वेरी इज अ टूल बाय माइक्रोसॉफ्ट 
to extract your data from various sources, transform and load it into various sources. So it is not only for data words. Aap isko data lake mein bhi bhej sakte hain, Excel mein bhi bhej sakte hain. In short, it is the modern, uh, you know, data ETL tool, data ko extract, transform or load karte hain. Bhoat powerful hai. Isme jo language use hoti hai, query ki use kehte hain, M query. So under the hood, it uses M, M, M language to publish data in data words from your multiple systems. Uh, second major component hai, jo ki is uh, application ko drive kar raha hai, Power Automate. I think it's not a new concept. Everyone knows about it now. Ki ye ek connector based ecosystem hai, right? Aap connectors ke through external system se baat kar sakte hai. You can talk to them, you can exchange data, you can trigger their events. To ye sare cheeze aapko Power Automate enable kara raha hai. Third major component hai is application ka Dataverse. So Dataverse is the only myth I want to break here is it's not a not just a database. It has a lot of capabilities, security, hai, logic, hai, built-in data, hai, storage, hai, integrations. So these slides you have seen before, but if you haven't seen it, I just wanted to talk about Dataverse. Ki dataverse is the Dataverse. Dataverse is a very powerful platform going forward. Everything is you know, getting centralized at Dataverse. So you should read about it. So Dataverse is what is helping us to give that elasticity of storing big amount of data under the hood. Third major component is AI Builder. AI Builder is a power platform ka ek strong pillar which is very mature and mature in very speed. Mein mature ho raha hai. Recently, kuch, I think Forrester and Gartner ki reports came out where AI Builder is a leader uh, gaya hai is space. Mein. So basically, AI Builder क्या करता है कि आपके data को analyze करके it can do prediction, it can do object detection, आपकी uh, form processing कर सकता, it can identify text from the invoices. So basically, AI Builder is driving all the actionable insights and it is working on the data which is getting generated. So if we look architecture, देखेंगे, तो basically three major components हैं data pipeline. Data pipeline का काम ये है data लाना और भेजना. Uh, orchestration engine यहाँ पे हम orchestrate कर रहे हैं services को और उसके बाद insights तो AI builder का काम यहाँ insights में है power automate का काम data लाना और orchestrate करने में है dataverse is across the stack azure is across the stack अब यहाँ azure है मतलब you get all the security compliance scalability and uh, other things which comes with uh, azure तो जो सॉल्यूशन डिजाइन कंसीडरेशंस थे माइक्रोसॉफ्ट के इस ऐप को बनाते टाइम कि इसकी जो ऑर्डर जर्नी है वो हम मॉडल कर पाए वो बिजनेस यूजर डिफाइन करे अगर हमारे ऑर्डर जर्नी के लॉजिक चेंज हो रहे हैं तो हमें आईटी के पास जाने की जरूरत ना पड़े एक्शन बेस्ड इकोसिस्टम हो कनेक्टर बेस्ड इकोसिस्टम हो स्केल आउट कर सके हम कॉन्फिगरेशन नॉट कोडेड ये हर जगह है आजकल लाइक एवरीवन वांट्स टू कॉन्फिगर थिंग्स एंड गिव इट इनटू द हैंड्स ऑफ बिजनेस यूजर तो वो इसकी है ब्यूटी की यहां पे आप कॉन्फिगरेशन कर सकते हैं काफी इंटेलिजेंस है इनटू द प्लेटफॉर्म तो आई थिंक व्हाट आई हैव टोल्ड डन अ लॉट ऑफ टॉकिंग तो आई विल क्विकली शो यू हाउ द ऐप लुक्स लाइक अगर आपको ट्रायल एनवायरमेंट डिप्लॉय करना है तो बेसिकली आपको जाना है इस वेबसाइट के लिंक पे dynamics.microsoft.com intelligent order management एंड क्लिक करना है फ्री ट्रायल पे सो आई विल जस्ट क्विकली शो यू हाउ दैट लुक्स लाइक एंड विल टेक यू टू द ऐप फॉर अ क्विक डेमो लेट मी जस्ट स्किप एंड ब्रिंग अप माय ब्राउजर अह एक और बात दोस्तों ये इस ऐप का अनाउंसमेंट इसी साल इग्नाइट में हुआ था so it is very fresh. Uh, GA is happening in August. So it's about to come. So let me know when you can see my screen. I think you can already see it. So this is our home page. When you deploy the trial environment, deploy karte hai, this is what you get. So basically, you have to go to the trial environment. You have to click on the link. You have to click on the link. You have to click on the email address. Dena hai. Uh, you can create a new own account, on Microsoft account here without uh, going into credit card details. So when this becomes done, you will have a trial environment for 30 days. Ke liye. Once you get that trial environment, friends, you have made your address from the address. You can see it in your power portal. It becomes a subscription in a environment for 30 days ka free trial. And you will see the Intelligent Order Management ki app in preview mode. And you will see this model driven app. So when I said 
this is a, a model driven app uh, this is from where i came to know that it is a model driven app to ab agar model driven app hai to aap agar technical hai aap jaake iske under the hood dekh sakte hain kaise forms design hai kaise uh, data connectors ke through data aa raha hai isme but we will quickly see the app now to hota kya jab aapke paas app aayegi you come to the home पेज और यहाँ पे पे आपके पास सारे ऑप्शंस हैं कि आपको जो की चीजें कंफिगर करनी है उसका यहाँ स्क्रीन होता है कि यू हैव टू कंफिगर सेटिंग्स यू कैन हाउ डू यू मैनेज योर कनेक्टर्स हाउ कैन यू मैनेज योर सेटअप फॉर थर्ड पार्टी फुलफिलमेंट प्रोवाइडर्स हाउ कैन यू मैनेज योर ऑर्केस्ट्रेशन ऑफ जर्नी तो ये सब रहता है यहाँ पे आप ये वाली स्क्रीन लेफ्ट साइड से भी देख सकते हैं क्विकली मैं आपको दिखा देता हूँ कुछ की स्क्रीन तो हमने बात करी थी कि ऑर्केस्ट्रेशन फ्लो बिजनेस यूजर्स कंफिगर कर सकते हैं तो अगर मैं ऑर्केस्ट्रेशन फ्लोज में जाता हूं तो व्हाट यू विल बी एबल टू सी हियर इज हाउ द सैंपल फ्लोज व्हिच आर गिवन बाय माइक्रोसॉफ्ट लुक्स लाइक इट्स इट्स वेरी इंट्यूटिव इट लुक्स लाइक अ फ्लो चार्ट लाइक अ विजुअल यू कैन गो एंड जस्ट क्रिएट योर ओन इट्स जस्ट टेकिंग सम टाइम टू लोड जस्ट गिव इट अ मिनट सो so, जैसे यहाँ पे आप देख सकते हैं सैम्पल ऑर्डर ऑर्केस्ट्रेशन फ्लो है आप अपने खुद के भी नए बना सकते हैं और ये जो फ्लो होता है इसमें की इम्पोर्टेंस uh, होती है प्रोवाइडर्स एंड कनेक्टर्स की तो यहाँ पे आके सारी चीज़ें मिलती हैं एक दूसरे से राइट right? तो जब आप फ्लो डिज़ाइन करते हैं तो आपके पास आपको ये बताना पड़ता है कि आप किस पर्टिकुलर कनेक्टर की बात कर रहे हैं और आप उस कनेक्टर के कौन से इवेंट को या एक्शन को इन्वोक करना चाहते हैं यहाँ पे राइट तो अगर आप देखें कि मुझे ऑर्डर हेडर वैलिडेट करना है पहले तो यहाँ पे आपको एक्शन टाइप और इवेंट देना पड़ेगा और यहाँ पे आप यहाँ पे बेसिकली यू आर कन्फिगरिंग कि आपको करना क्या है इस स्टेप पे राइट सो यू कैन एड न्यू स्टेप्स इन बिटवीन यू कैन बेसिकली क्लिक ऑन एड आई मीन बहुत सेल्फ एक्सप्लेनेटरी यूजर एक्सपीरियंस है यहाँ पे यू कैन डिफाइन वॉट पॉलिसी यू वॉन्ट यू वॉन्ट टू एड इन टू दिस फ्लो what type of action you want to add what are the other things which you can do to aise karke business users jo ki jinhe pata hai ki mere ko kaise apna fulfillment karna hai ya order journey design karni hai they can select the right uh, block uh, it's like uh, creating a flow chart to so, aise karke aap apni puri order ki fulfillment journey ko define kar sakte hain this is where business users are getting that power to define the uh, order flow सॉरी ये सिस्टम थोड़ा स्लो है अभी रिस्पॉन्ड नहीं कर रहा बट अगर आप देखेंगे तो यहाँ पे आप देख सकते हैं कैसे आप डिफरेंट डिफरेंट कंडीशंस कन्फिगर करके पूरा एक टॉप डाउन हायर की डिफाइन कर सकते हैं कि आपका ऑर्डर का फ्लो कैसा होगा फ्लो के अंदर ये पॉलिसीज हैं बिजनेस इवेंट्स हैं आई जस्ट क्विकली सी वी कैन ओपन इट जस्ट बींग माइंडफुल ऑफ टाइम तो आप यहाँ पे डिफाइन कर सकते हैं डिफरेंट पॉलिसीज ये पॉलिसीज बिजनेस इवेंट्स ये सब ड्राइव करते हैं आपको दे आर गिविंग यू द इनपुट फॉर द फ्लोज सो यहाँ पे आप डिफाइन कर सकते हैं क्या क्या पॉलिसीज हैं आपको जो चाहिए जस्ट अ क्विक व्यू ऑन द सैम्पल डेटा अगर आप देखें यहाँ पे uh, एक सेल्स ऑर्डर्स का व्यू है यहाँ पे क्या होता है कि ऑर्डर्स जो कि uh, आ रहे हैं मल्टीपल एक्सटर्नल एप्लीकेशन है वो सारे आपको यहाँ दिखेंगे दिस इज योर सेंट्रलाइज व्यू तो नो मैटर वेयर योर ऑर्डर गॉड जनरेटेड इट गॉड जनरेटेड इन एन ई कॉमर्स प्लेटफॉर्म और थ्रू अ मोबाइल ऐप और थ्रू ई डी आई यू कैन सी कम्प्लीट ऑर्डर डिटेल्स हेयर विद डिफरेंट स्टेटस इज अमाउंट करेंसी सिमिलरली यू कैन ऑल्सो डिफाइन योर प्रोवाइडर्स कैटलॉग हेयर तो अगर आप अभी देखेंगे प्रोवाइडर कैटलॉग में माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने बाय डिफॉल्ट डायनामिक्स के साथ प्रोवाइडर कनेक्टर दिया है और एक ऑर्डर फुल करके थर्ड पार्टी ई कॉमर्स प्लेटफॉर्म है उसके साथ एक प्रोवाइडर कनेक्टर पब्लिश किया है वन की थिंग दिस एप्लीकेशन कैन वर्क विद एंड विदाउट डायनामिक्स 365 तो आपका जो क्लाइंट है जरूरी नहीं है कि वो डायनामिक्स थ्री के कस्टमर हो तभी वो ये यूज कर सकते हैं ऐसा बिल्कुल नहीं है तो यू कैन वर्क ऑन दिस एप विद और विदाउट डायनामिक्स थ्री सिक्सटी फाइव तो जब आप एक प्रोवाइडर को कन्फ्यूजर करने जाते हैं यू हैव टू क्लिक ऑन एड प्रोवाइडर एंड यू हैव टू एग्री टू सम टर्म्स एंड कंडीशन एंड डिफाइन सम क्रीडेंशियल्स और वो सारे कनेक्टर फिर एक बार कन्फ्यूजर हो जाते हैं तो डेटा स्टार्ट फ्लोइंग इन राइट सो बेसिकली इट्स ऑल कन्फ्यूगरेबल वंस यूर एप गेट्स इन टू योर हैंड यू कैन configure the connectors you can configure your flows uh, we'll quickly see how this looks like 
तो बेसिकली मैंने ऑर्डर फुल पे क्लिक किया था उसके बाद यहाँ पे मेरे को कनेक्शन दिख जाएंगे ऑर्डर फुल के एंड देन आई जस्ट हैव टू एंटर सम की इन्फॉर्मेशन एंड देन बेस्ड ऑन दैट आप यहाँ पे देखें कनेक्शन के अंदर यहाँ इवेंट्स हैं एक्शन हैं तो दीज आर द थिंग्स विच आई टॉक इन द बिगनिंग स्लाइड अ कनेक्टर इज नॉट ओनली हेल्पिंग यू टू जस्ट कनेक्ट एंड ट्रांस यू नो एक्सचेंज सम डेटा यू कैन ऑल्सो invoke the events into your external application through these events so this is where you can say when you are designing your orchestration journey that system a you do this system b you do this then only my order will get fulfilled so this is like a centralized controller of your complete supply chain um just uh, last two minutes hain to agar aapko aur padhna hai to microsoft ke docs pe uh, iska page available hai जहाँ पे उन्होंने काफ़ी अच्छे से समझाया हुआ है अगर आपको कस्टम कनेक्टर बनाना है तो आप देख सकते हैं देर आर सम सेशंस विच हैव बीन डिलीवर्ड बाय द माइक्रोसॉफ्ट टीम एज वेल ऑन दिस टॉपिक विच आर अवेलेबल ऑन माय इग्नाइट तो मोहम्मद आलम ने भी इस ऐप के बारे में बात करी थी इग्नाइट सेशन में जैसे मैंने बताया इग्नाइट में अनाउंस हुआ था और इसके साथ भी लेकलन कैश विग्नेश एंड द होल टीम ऑफ माइक्रोसॉफ्ट दे हैव पब्लिश फ्यू मोर सेशन ऑन दिस ऐप to do check out these apps um, i'll just switch back to my presentation for uh, because i have one more qr code to abhi apna ye hai okay so we'll go to the next slide um to ye tha humne dekha doston app kaisi dikhti hai um what i have also done is i have uh, consolidated all these रेफरेंसेस विच यू कैन चेक आउट तो अगर आप देखेंगे माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने काफ़ी अच्छे से पब्लिश किया हुआ है डॉक्स है इग्नाइट के सेशंस हैं यूट्यूब पे भी अगर आप सिंपल सर्च मारेंगे आपको दिख जाएगा कि जो कस्टमर्स हैं जिनके साथ माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने पार्टनर किया है टू चेक दिस ऐप उनकी कुछ केस स्टडीज पब्लिश हैं प्लस माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ने अपना कॉन्टैक्ट इन्फॉर्मेशन भी दिया हुआ है जहाँ पे आप बात कर सकते हैं इफ यू इफ यू वॉन्ट टू ट्राई इट आउट यू कैन रीच आउट टू माइक्रोसॉफ्ट ऑन दिस जस्ट वन थिंग क्यू आर कोड ये रहा फीडबैक आप दे सकते हैं बट इफ देर आर एनी क्वेश्चन आई एम हैप्पी टू टेक दैट अमार एंड कमर आई एम डन थैंक यू स्टॉप शेयरिंग कुछ क्वेश्चंस हैं तो देख सकते हैं आई 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 अमेजिंग सेशन थिंक लॉट ऑफ पीपल हैव जॉइंड अस फॉर दिस बिकॉज़ मेनी पीपल वर वेटिंग टू लर्न अबाउट द इंटेलिजेंट ऑर्डर मैनेजमेंट एंड एक्चुअली यू नो टू सी हाउ इंटेलिजेंट इट वाज और इट विल बी यू नो एंड आई थिंक दिस इज वन वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पीस इन इन द ओवरऑल यू नो न्यू फंक्शनलिटीज व्हिच आर कमिंग अप इन 365 um platform so i think some i can see some praise for your session um and the questions are any idea like when exactly this is this is coming um uh, as per my knowledge it's coming in uh, in august in uh, next two weeks keep an eye on the announcement it should be out soon so it's already in public preview but generally avail it's about to be generally available in next two weeks let's say cool uh and one more question um we have distribution order management right with in the dynamics already so i think this is uh something uh which is on a on a different note so this is just relating to one question i have here uh so uh basically just if you want to give your thoughts about separating these two things so distribution distributed order management which is in dynamics 365 finance and operation is focused on the finance and operation apps it's it's fulfilling your orders which are coming or generated through your dynamics 365 commerce and your on and these stores which are configured in dynamics the idea of intelligent order management is to make it work even without dynamics so that di the distributed order management of intelligent order management is separate to the distributed order management of dynamics 365 finops although there is a connector available so it can be a bit confusing 
but I think DOM is DOM in both the applications has uh, great case studies available. I think even Satya Nadella talked about distributed order management of dynamics when the pandemic hit us and how companies leveraged the DOM module because everyone was in lockdown, but through this uh, module, companies uh, really uh, nailed the supply chain uh, problems. Mm. So I think we will have one more terminology to use, you know, correctly. Okay. Uh, another question from Amir is basically like how you see the future of this application. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, uh, I personally feel it has a great future and there is a great opportunity for ISVs and partners. So this is one key message. You can build your own connectors. You can build your own business events and expose it so that applications like intelligent order management can talk to them. Another key thing is the best selling point for this app is you don't need rip and replace that keyword, which I learned while learning about this mm -hmm. rip and replacement of your legacy application is not needed. You can onboard uh, intelligent order management along with your existing application. So it, it is a journey which customers can embark. You can convert the trial environment to a production environment. So that is another beauty. You host a trial environment, configure your uh, existing applications, check it out, and then turn it on to your production. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Thank you so much. Um, any last remarks uh, about this application? And definitely, I would I want to thank you so much, Rachit. Or मतलब एक आमेशा से आपको जब भी मिलते हैं, जब भी सुनते हैं, you know, it's an amazing experience. Thank you. Really appreciate that, Kamar. I think my closing remarks are, guys, uh, this Dynamics ecosystem is always uh, you know hot and happening. So keep your energy levels high. Do connect with the communities. Keep sharing, and yeah, uh, stay connected. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 And the next session uh, will be in English. And our presenter is uh, Ajay Singh. So Ajay Singh is a very well-known uh, name in Dynamics community here in Australia as well. And I hope you will learn a lot from his experience. Uh, and he will talk about digital transformation and learning trends. So let's, let's welcome him. Hi, Ajay. How's it going? Hey, Kamar, thank you very much. I'm good. That's great to know. So I'll just leave you and, and just want to thank you for giving uh, your time here on, on this event. And uh, best of luck. No, sure. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate being here on the Urdu Hindi Bootcamp today on the Pakistan User Group. And uh, my privilege to be here. So I'll just share my screen. And let's see if you guys can see that. Yeah, can you see my screen now? Yes, absolutely we can. Thank you. Right, okay. Right, so I'll get started. So thanks everyone. I think uh, <clears throat> we'll start with a quick introduction about uh, myself, right? But before that, uh, welcome you all to the Hindi Urdu Bootcamp. Um, <clears throat> uh, just talking a little bit about myself. Um, I live here in Sydney, um, in Australia. But I have been, uh, I spent most of my life working in Dubai, about 15 years I've been in Dubai. Uh, so not a lot of people in the Middle Eastern community and a lot of people in the Indian uh, Pakistan user community as well. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> certainly, um, as I have been transforming from uh, coming down from Dubai, living a different lifestyle to a lifestyle that I'm trying to live here now, I have uh, attained a uh, taste for cycling, you know. And uh, being a cycling enthusiast, I love my road biking as much as I love Dynamic 365, right? But before I get to the transformation, right, uh, I think I'll spend one minute talking about why I actually started with cycling, right? And what I've been able to achieve over the last um, <clears throat> um, year or so. So la last year, when we went into the lockdown early in April, uh, I was looking for a sport where I don't need a team, I don't need a lot of people to do uh, work with, and you have to maintain social distancing at the same time, right? So as a result of that, I was able to pick up cycling thanks to one of my neighbor, who I call him now my chain manager for uh, this transformation that I have been through. So when I started last year in April, we I was doing about 
15 to 20 kilometers a day. Not, I couldn't do more than that, right? But over a period of time, I picked up uh, the pace and uh, between me and my neighbor, we were doing about, about 40, 42 kilometers a day. So that was quite a lot of distance that we were carrying, right? Mm -hmm. But then uh, early this year, I had to take a break because of uh, knee surgery. And then for a couple of months, I didn't do anything. And since June, I started back again on my cycling journey and I'm back to about 25, 26 kilometers a day now, right? So what I want to say here is, guys, we are living in unprecedented times. Um, and wherever we are, wherever you guys are, please take care of yourself, pick up something that you like, something that you can acquire. And that's really, really important um, apart from work. Yeah. So just, just a key message for you guys. Um, talking about the digital transformation with D365, I'll cover a few things today. So let me walk you through the agenda for the session today. Um, I'll go through a general understanding of what the, the transformation is. We'll talk about the trends, trends, what's happening in the world of Microsoft D365, where we see um, the product is heading to. Um, I'll share some of the learnings, and then we'll talk about, while we're talking about this transformation, um, who are the people who are important uh, when the companies get into a digital transformation journey, right? And then we'll leave a few minutes towards the end for some Q&A. So first and the foremost, right? I think it's really important for us to understand what is digitization, right? And when we talk about digitization, um, I think it's about understanding the, the meaning of it, right? But as you say, uh, Nelson Mandela, um, who you, you guys are aware of, he, he did say that when you talk to a person in the language that he understands, which means the language which is our second language, not, not our mother tongue, right? Like Hindi and Urdu for some of us, right? That language goes into our head. That understanding goes into our head, right? But if we talk to you in your language, right, that goes into the heart. So unfortunately, I'm just using English today for the session. I should probably have used Hindi or a bit of Urdu that I understand uh, given, given the international audience we have here. Now, part of digitization, <coughs> um, I think we need to understand what the digitization really is, right? So the first and the foremost, when we talk about the digitization, uh, we're not talking about the companies selling products. We're not talking about uh, companies just selling uh, a new product every now and then. But we're talking about the companies which are actually selling experience, right? You go and buy a particular product from a company, not just because of the company. You take example of Apple, right? You're not just going to buy Apple iPhone. You're going in there to buy uh, the experience that you're getting. Similar to that, when you come to Microsoft, you get that experience of um, dynamics in this case, right? So when we talk about digitization, it should not be based on the product launches. It should not be based on a new product. It should be based on the new experience that we are trying to put in front of our customers, right? And hence, our focus has to be on that and, and also keeping in mind what the business outcomes we are trying to achieve. And that is prime, you know? Um, what's happening now, um, and, and has always been the case, right? Um, any organization, right, uh, or any program within an organization that is focused towards keeping promises, either internally or externally, right? Uh, if we are able to achieve that part of a transformation journey, that is normally catered to as a successful program, right? Um, where it leads to us is if we are able to do these things, we should be able to consumerize the technology within our organization, right? Which means keep the technology as simple as possible in the simplest form so that the end users of the technology find it easy to adopt. And that's the key around the experience. That's the key around the delivery of that technology that you are bringing in, right? Another important aspect of digitization is if you are able to do all of that, but if you're not able to change the uh, way the organization see the data, right, in their decision-making process. 
So you have to change the way the people used to look for data as a goal to get down to make the right decisions, right? So the goal should move from making the right time information or right time decisions to a real time conceptual uh, relevancy, which means that data should be real time. It should be contextual to the area that you're looking at, and it should be relevant that you are uh, the decision that you're going to make about that. So till you're trying to have those uh, decisions um, made through data, I think you would have achieved the digitization in, within your information, right? I will talk about the future of work in a, in, in, in a bit, but one thing that's really, really important is to cultivate our digital DNA within your organization, which means the thought process itself. Uh, it shouldn't be one-off project. Digitization or, or digital transformation is not one project. It, it doesn't start from one activity and finishes the other. It's a continuous journey, right? And organizations have to continuously start a project, finish a project, start the next one and finish the next one. Everything has to be, have a start and end point, but there is not one project that can define as a digital transformation. It's a continuous journey. And that's really, really important for us to understand. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what are we seeing in the market, right, from a digitization perspective, especially post COVID-19? So there are a lot of surveys done in the industry, and I'll walk you through a couple of them. Uh, one survey done by uh, IBM that talks about the supply chain organizations. Now, if I put all the things in context that we have just discussed, right, and try to understand how the pandemic has changed the priorities or is changing the priority post COVID-19 for a supply chain or a distribution organization, right? So what are the companies focusing on? 88% of them are focusing on obtaining operational resilience, right? Which means they want their supply chain, their demand forecasting to be as resilient as possible, right? So that they can actually deliver the services to the customers, right? 83% of the organizations are focusing on the well-being of their workers, right? Or the working environment, you know? If you are a supply chain company, you need to operate a warehouse, you need people to come into the warehouse to pick the goods. You really can't just do that sitting at home like uh, the luxury some of us have got, right? And hence, coming into a work environment, the, the right uh, well-being um, and addressability of who's who uh, who, who's where in the business is really, really important, right? 75% um, of the companies talk about integrity in their supply chain, which means data flows through from one into another. They need to ensure that whatever data they have, they can actually rely on it, right? People are looking at supply chain visibility. 71% of the organizations are trying to look at visibility, right? Where are there containers in the supply chain at any point in time? They need the EDI with their suppliers, right? They need automation in their business processes, right? And then 65% are looking at improving the operational efficiency, right? Um, and that's where the opportunities for dynamics comes in, right? Within, within those areas. So if you look at COVID-19, um, it has certainly impacted how the digitization has been uh, looked by the uh, CXOs in the organizations. That has started changing, and the attitude towards digitization is it's not something good to have, it's something that's must have because we can actually transform the way the business is done today. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to go through each and every of these opportunities, but you see, Dynamic 365 across the, the, the pandemic priorities, what we call it, um, is, is a good fit. And, and that's an area where we see people taking advantage of, right? Um, there's another uh, report from uh, McKinsey, which talks about what's happening post-COVID in the manufacturing world, right? So most of the manufacturing organizations, I'm talking about the large and the ones which are at the forefront of digitization have been moving towards Industry 4.0, right? And if you talk about Industry 4.0, uh, 
the it, it relies on four fundamental uh, ideas around their value chain. The first one is around the connectivity. The second one is around the analytics, right? Third is around the human machine interaction, as in how people uh, interact with the machines, talk about the RPA, talk about the automation in that area, right? And, and the last is the advanced engineering, taking um, benefits of um, areas like 3D printing, right? Uh, introducing renewable energy uh, to run your operations rather than using normal electricity, right? So there are multiple initiatives in those areas and multiple technology um, uh, adoptions that have been happening in the manufacturing organization, right? And all of these, they create opportunities for the D65 platform as well as for uh, the services. But most of those organizations have been actually relying on the existing tech infrastructure. And I think that's something uh, important for us to note, right? Companies are not looking at replacing their tech infrastructure. A, they have been using that infrastructure for ages. Infrastructure is costly. They can't just change their infrastructure. And hence, it's really, really important to understand that whatever transformation journeys these companies are going in, they would be going into that transmission journey, trying to utilize whatever they have and trying to bring the um, add-on technologies. They're not looking at um, what uh, Richard was saying before, rip and replace, right? That's not what um, organizations are actually looking at, yeah? So if you see, uh, there are organizations which are at the advanced stage of their capability, right, uh, who are looking at digitizing the work instructions, right? What does it mean for us in the in, in the dynamics, like using dynamics guides, right? We can use that. Yes, we have got the solution part of it, right? We can bring in the performance ma management using IoT devices. We can bring in augmented reality using HoloLens, right? We can retrofit some of the automations for loading in the conveyor belts, either through the automation integrations or through um, uh, some of the EDI. Uh, capabilities, right? So if you look at it, in overall, there are companies who are at the very basic or no capabilities with regards to the transformation journey. Them, at the same time, the organizations which are very advanced stage of their transformation, all of them are looking for opportunities. And that's the opportunity that exists for us in the Dynamics 365 uh, ecosystem. Now, where does Microsoft fit into all this, right? Now, as you know, I mean, the statistics I have is from, from um, um, last year, 2020 um, financials, right? Now, as of last year, Microsoft was a $3 billion um, Dynamics business, just Dynamics, we're talking about Dynamics 365, right? Uh, I think this year, Microsoft announced that they want to be in next three years time, they want to be a $10 billion business. That's where the opportunity for us lies, right? If I look at the organizations, it's 4,500 organizations which have taken up supply chain and finance, right? The overall growth that you see is pretty much 60% um, coming from cloud for Microsoft. And it's one of the fastest growing SaaS solutions, right? Similar to that, if you look at the Power Platform, 170% um, year on year growth or uh, uh, 75% on um, actual uh, per user growth, right? MEU growth. So, so that's where the momentum sits with us. If you, if you try to break that further into C, FinOps, and data platform, um, and try to look at what and how is Microsoft actually doing, right? So whereas the market is doing about 16% on customer engagement, Microsoft has done about 20% last year, year on year. Whereas market is doing in the finance operations or what I call the conventional ERPs, about 19%, right? Microsoft Dynamic 365 has grown at about 40% year on year, right? The data platform, it's all about acquiring new customers. And the great thing is that 49% 40, customers which have come to the data platform, there were the customers which were new to Dynamics 365 environment, right? Similar to that, if you look at the 
platform services, we talk about the BI, right? 18% is where the market is in terms of the growth, whereas Microsoft BI services, or what do you call Power BI, has been growing 65% year on year. Yeah. Um, in terms of the application platform and automation platforms, right? When you talk about IOTs in the automation, application platform is in Power Platforms, right? 441% and 1,024% year on year growth. These are some very good and very promising numbers to where we sit currently at this stage um, with Dynamic 365 community, right? And this, this is where the opportunities for you and us lie, right? Being a Microsoft partner, B being in the industry itself. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll move on to talking about some learnings that we have in this transformation journey. Uh, what we have seen over the years, right? And I'm taking some excerpts from um, a, a book called Building a Digital Future by Lippi and uh, Vinnie Benzel. Uh, so I'll just load the page and then talk around it. So if I talk about what's happening, I spoke about what's happening in the, in the industry. We spoke about what's happening with Microsoft, right? But implementing a D6 Drive project is not or, or any kind of a transmission program that you go with D65 as the as the core, right? It does require a level of planning, right? Uh, what Winnie and Leapy mentioned in, 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 in their recent book is about, they, they, they break that into three major stages. The first one is about creating a case for change or creating um, um, internal, uh, case which talks about what do company needs to what do companies need to actually go into that chain why do they want to uh, transform their strategy why they want to look at where they are right now versus where they want to be right so creating that case for change is really really important right which is all about trying to find the funding trying to talk about uh, where where the company is where the company can get down to what the to be state for this organization is going to be and in the end, how we are going to get there. And that's the transformation of strategy. So that's a step one, right? Once we have identified um, what and how of it, right? It's about executing, right? That's a step two. When you talk about executing, you need to create, you need to have a roadmap and you need to look at your readiness of the organization. And also the gap between your as a state and your to be state where you want to be. Right, and at every stage of the organization or any level of the program that we talk about, right, we need to understand a level of change management. What is the change management that we need to do? Now, that could differ from one part of the organization to another, right? And, and that's where the program for overall transformation should not be built based on uh, one part of the organization. Every part of the organization that needs to go into a change program, right, or a transmission program at this stage, need to have a relevant uh, uh, program and need to have relevant principles that will achieve the objectives of the of the organization, right? Once you start executing, you're ready to execute, right? Then the next stage comes in is about driving that innovation and the and the improvement, right? which means you're actually talking about the life cycle. You're talking about measuring your customer experience. Now, this customer experience is not just the external customers, but they're also your internal customers, right? Uh, you need to identify what your support model is going to be, right? You need to identify what are you going to do to stabilize the system once you have gone live with it, right? From a, from a Dynamic 365 landscape perspective, right? So it's really, really important that at every stage of the uh, the life cycle of your uh, transformation, you define those matrices that you need to achieve, right? So you'd be defining a service or a quality matrix just at the, when you're defining the case, because that's what you need to achieve, right? You'll talk about uh, your conversion matrix when you talk about uh, digital transformation or execution part of it, right? 
you'll be talking about your program dashboards, like DevOps, those kind of tools, right? And I will touch base on that in a bit, right? Um, when we talk about the execution of the program, and that's really, really important, yeah? Now, any digital transformation program actually cannot happen without the relevant chain management behind the scenes. Yeah. The, it's really, really important that we understand that the people are at the center of that change. It's the people who make a transformation program a success or a failure. Now, the change needs to be applied on the organizational level and it needs to be applied on the project level, right? On the organizational level, you're talking about creating a competency, competency that would enable the change within the organization. And this is where that executive sponsorship, right? Or a responsive leadership is really, really key and, and desired for an organization. On a project level, it's more about the, the tools that you will put in to help the people lead and see the side of change, right? So that you can actually structure the people uh, to get on a journey and for you to achieve a desired outcome, right? And that's the two, two major uh, levels. Now, when you talk about applying a chain management to a digital transformation program, right? The reason you're doing that is you want to increase the probability of the project success. You want to make sure that the people who might be resistant to change, right? You're bringing those people onto the journey, right? You are managing the people who might be worried about the change. You're bringing them into the journey and ensuring that you can minimize the resistance to that, that change, right? Uh, other important element is you are putting an investment into the uh, program. And as a result of that, there are people dependent ROI, and what you're trying to do is you want to capture through value performance matrices uh, that that dollar number, those dollar values. Yeah, and and as a result of that, you are trying to create a competency into the organization because this is not the first transmission program that you go into the organization. This is just the starting of multiple programs that the companies will go over the years, right? And then it's really, really important that when the companies go into a digital transformation program, they really focus on the change management. Yeah. Now, what, what I was talking about the people, right? One important thing is is all about how do we keep people interested, right? How we we keep people comfortable and secure enough to remain invested into that change management program. Yeah. Now, Prossy, Prossy is a UK-based uh, change management organization, right? And it's it's their model, um, quite, quite well known. And what to talk about here is the people, when you talk about the change, the first communication or the first rumor, right? Now, rumor is also a type of communication. We need to understand that. So, so once that information about a change to the organization is out there, the people would not be feeling comfortable enough to go ahead with the change straight away, right? Depending upon you are in a supply chain organization, you are in the management, you are in the support functions, or you are on the at the warehouse level, right? Or if you're in a manufacturing organization, are you at the manufacturing floor, right? How does the change impact you? And this is what the people need to really know, right? Now, if the, the time between the communication, right, and in terms of managing that change is large, right? As you can see, as it goes further and further, right? Over a period of time, people will come back and they would be much more comfortable. They would understand that their jobs are secure even though the jobs are changing, right? But there's a period of time where the they would be uncertain and they would be really worried about what's going to happen right and at that point in time they will be dissatisfied and you will start seeing the passive resistance right now if this is this is for a situation where someone 
those worries and those uncertainties are catered to at the very onset of the program and they come back into the green zone, right? But if this is left um, unanswered, right? Uh, uh, and they're not catered to at that point in time, this graph will go certainly or down into the risk or a flight zone where you will see turnover of employees, right? There could be active resistance or people might be opting out of the program, right? And and this is this is what you see, right? Now, now a particular project or a particular program that you run part of your digital transformation, right? If it's the same person who's involved in multiple projects, that's another aspect to look at, right? Part of the change management. If you have got the same person involved in multiple things, right? People will behave differently for each of those change opportunities, right? So in this example, one person could be very happy with the project one, right? Uh, and they come into the, the, the yellow zone much later, but then you could have a particular project where they're actually spending their time being uncertain and even to the degree of being so much worried that they are even thinking about leaving an organization, right? Now, in the scenario, the organizations have to try to minimize the period, right? If you cannot increase the resist, decrease the resistance, you need to minimize the period because if the time that they spent in that zone is less, it it will be much better to get them out back in the green zone compared to leaving them much longer and for longer projects uh, uh, across across the transformation journey, right? Now, one one thing that I would just like to add here is these are the compounded risks. Right, um, which means that especially when you are in a transformation journey, the organizations have to ensure that the communication is as crisp and they see the senior management involved into that uh, communication, right? And, and, and even the senior management has to be part of that change altogether, which means, um, trying to understand what, who are the players that are required to communicate that change, right? Now, a model uh, that can be utilized to identify who your transmission players would be uh, is like you create an op chart, but that chart, op chart is to understand who are your chain drivers, right? So you need, you, need, you need a primary sponsor, and the role of a primary sponsor is uh, the executive for that particular project, right? Not just funding, I'll talk about it in a bit, about how a primary sponsor should be involved in the, in, in the project, right? Then you have secondary sponsors who are like chain managers, program management, your stream sponsors. Very important aspect is to identify the impacted groups. So if your transmission program has got the, the, the key leaders who are actually impacted because of that transmission program, being part of it, you will see it much more easy to handle that change, handle that transformation, right? Now, in this model, a um, couple of things we need to address. What you should try to do is you try to designate a person who supports the change and designate the person who opposes the change, right, in the org charts, which means either, either you have A people who are supporting the change or you might have, let's say, B people somewhere who are actually impact part of the impacted group, but they are opposing the change at the same time, right? Similar to that, we need to understand from a sponsor level, your primary and the sponsors, that who of them have got experience in a prior change management, who are the people with limited experience or people with no experience or skills? Because it becomes the job of a change manager to bring in uh, the relevant training <laughs> for those sponsors so that they can actually do their job, right? And that's, that, that's why it's really, really important to bring, bring that level of expertise and create the capability model for your senior management teams into the change management program as well, yeah? Now, um, as, as I mentioned about the, the primary sponsors, right? Now, there's a, <laughs> so, so part of my, uh, what we call is the leadership triangle, right? Or the change triangle. Uh, the leadership being at the top, which is the sponsorship, the project management, which is the execution guys on one side and the change management guys on the other side. 
the three teams actually work hand in hand to manage, monitor, and communicate the change. <coughs> right now, most of the time, the executives they see their role in making the decisions for resourcing, strategy, and timing. Right, which means they're talking about the uh, costs, people that can spend time onto that particular program, and how soon they want it. Right, but a lot of senior executives delegate the actual executive actions which are required um, to, to take on a program like this. Now, we see a lot often that a CEO of an organization becomes a, a sponsor, right? But then people only see the CEO coming once in every quarter, once in every month, just to talk about the program and talk about um, how the program is tracking, right? But they don't see the person, or in this case, their sponsor, very visible in the decision-making process. And this is really, really important that organizations have a active and a visible leader, right? Who is actually part of that journey with them, not someone who actually comes once in a while or sends an email to people just talk about the change. So that's really important, right? And the sponsor has to be part of a, the, the chain management team that actually builds the coalition. It means um, it, it creates a positiveness around what the program is going to deliver, right? Those positive change agents, that's an important part of it, right? And that's the area where we see, we have executives trying to make a decision, but the actual actions, most of the time, they lack uh, from the executives. And this is an area which um, every time we see this on the projects, we see it's somebody else who comes in and takes the role of an executive sponsor rather than the actual designated executive who has been given that responsibility. So it's really important for us to know uh, the, the prior experience of executives in managing that change then only they can be active and participative. Yeah. Now, last but not the least, because we're talking about Dynamic 365, there are two elements that we spoke about, right? We spoke about the change at the organization level and the change at the project level, right? Now, to have the change at the organization level, I spoke about the, the, the project triangle, the chain management triangle, where the three teams have to work together, right, and with a common objective. And on the project level, there are tools that we'll be using, right? Primarily like Azure DevOps. That has become a standard way of managing any of the D365 projects, right? <clears throat> uh, use Teams um, as your uh, collaboration platform, right? Create power apps uh, within the organization that you think you can communicate about the chain management that's actually running in. You can do surveys around what people are feeling about, about about the transformation program that's going in the organization, right? Um, Ship one for repository, right? Look at uh, and you use use BI, deploy BI that can run on top of your Azure DevOps, or you can actually uh, run it to measure some key matrices like your service matrices, right? We spoke about before. So it's really important that we understand at the um, at the organization level that these tools needs to be provided to the projects. And most of the companies are adopting it. More and more we see that. Uh, I haven't seen in my experience over the last year, year and a half, when any project is being run without Azure, Azure DevOps. Right? I think gone are, are those days. So uh, I think that's, that's pretty much it from my end. I'll probably open for some uh, questions. Yeah. So thanks for coming here today. I think if you have. Any questions? I'm happy to take them in. Hi, Ajay. Thank you so much. It was uh, really amazing, you know, hearing all this uh, digital transformation journey. I think we, we have a few questions. Um, so yeah. I'll quickly ask one by one. Uh, so first one, like you mentioned that you worked in Dubai as well, and obviously you have experience uh, working in different regions. Um, so what's your take on like, what's the difference between let's say Indian market, a Middle East market and a market like Australia in context of digital transformation, adaptation, and what will be your advice 
uh, about these markets and if they can learn anything from each other. Thank you. I mean, so thanks. I think it's a quite a quite a good good question, Kamar. Uh, I mean, on, on a very likely note, uh, a customer is a customer, and customer is all the same in every market to an extent. Yeah. Right. Um, certainly, there is a but. Uh, if I look at the Australian market, right, the customers are uh, a bit more informed and a bit more prepared whenever they go into any transformation project. They spend enough time preparing before they start something, right? Whereas in the Middle Eastern market, right, um, I would say they are early adopters, right? They see something new, they want to have it, right? And that's mm -hmm. that's that's a cultural uh, fit to the Middle East as well, right? Which means uh, if there's a new technology that can benefit the customer, they don't want to wait uh, before 100 people in the, uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, region have tried it, they want to be the first ones. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I look at from an Indian context, uh, it's, it's a bit different. And I think uh, the Indian businesses have to pick up a lot in terms of the transformation. Right. The large organizations are um, uh, pretty much doing it and they're doing it well. Whereas the, the mid size, the SMC market, what has been the bread and butter for us for a long time, that market hasn't really picked up uh, from a transformation journey perspective in India. And, and primarily because the cost of labor is mm -hmm. low. Right. So, yeah, I think that's three major the differences between the three markets. That's great. I think that's a very comprehensive answer. Amar, you have any question? Yep, I have uh, one more question, Ajay. Uh, as we have found that uh, you are just jumping into a new world or just, uh, you know, uh, uh, just organizing a new company or gen uh, creating a new company, working with a new company with new brand name. So what are the challenges which you see while uh, you know uh, just going into the uh, that new company and working again as a you know starting as a leader there so what challenges do you think you will be facing and how you are planning to cater those challenges all right okay that's a, that's a quite quite a good question Omar. um i mean i have been part of the the sim similar journey before when i was in middle east right uh where, we, where i had the opportunity to create a company and and run it successfully um I'm looking forward to that challenge. I think that challenge of being an entrepreneur and being able to make the decisions on the fly is really, really um, uh, rewarding, right? Uh, you don't have any red tapeism. You don't have a lot of uh, company process to follow through, follow through, and there's no one saying that, okay, you know, take the 10 boxes before you can move the next step, right? So that's, that's a big positive um, of what I'm trying to do. But at the same time, I'm quite passionate about uh, the services I can bring to the customer, right? And and what I have seen in the Australian market that uh, over uh, a period of time, uh, there are some very good partners. There are partners who can cater to uh, small businesses, but there are not too many partners that can cater to the large international uh, businesses who needs to execute a D65 project across 10, 15 countries. And I think that's the capability I'm looking to bring into the region. And okay. my next my next question will be what you are planning to do different than the companies you have uh, already engaged yourself with. Yeah, I think I've come out uh, two two major things, right? Your customer is always a prime, and I think till you work with that model, that you are working for the customer, you're not working for a company, and you become a customer advocate, right? Hmm. That will always bring the right, uh, and you'll always try to bring the right services to the customer from that perspective. Right. So I think keeping the customer at the forefront of what we do is really, really important. And I think that's also the, the mantra that Satya, has, Satya Nadella has been working with, right? Um, and, and try to bring that experience of a transformation. So do not try to tell the customer of what to do, but teach them how to do things, right? And then they will become part of that journey with you. And that's really important, right? So I think a lot, lot of times yeah. we haven't uh, I myself haven't been able to do that but that's something I want to bring into to the customers now to teach them the tools not um, uh, really and, and and then let them use it rather than me trying to teach them how to use it I think that's great we wish we wish you very best of luck with that so just I think one audience audience question has popped up here if anyone wants to grab new clients for digital transformation any tips of marketing Right. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what I'm doing. Uh, 
I'm not the best in yeah. terms of marketing, but, but yeah, give us your secret recipe. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what what we do. Uh, so, so I mean, in, in terms of the marketing, nothing works better than the word of mouth, right? Which means you must have a customer that you have provided an excellent service, and then they go, uh, and they they go and then talk to you, talk about you to to their peers, right? That's the best way of marketing, right? However, when you talk about digital transformation, you need to have your digital transformation portfolio, which should be crisp and clear. What are you going to deliver as part of the transformation journey, right? You can use tools like LinkedIn to actually uh, go and propagate that message, but you need to be very, very clear that you are, are you going to provide the chain management? Are you going to provide just the technology? Are you going to be the enabler in the end about the, the transformation? There are multiple roles you can play. And if you're playing all the roles, you need to be very clear with that as well. That's, that's a great hey, answer. Thanks, Ajay. Um, uh, any other questions, Amar, we have? Um, uh, I think I we have we have one uh, more question from uh, from the audience. Let's let's take it. Um, if any company is planning to partner with Microsoft to deliver 365 consultancy services, um, what initial investment budget is required? So maybe you you may not want to you know like give the give the figure or something, but yeah, yeah. this is what your thoughts are. Um, okay, so I mean there, there are multiple uh, methods and ways to it. The first thing is, if you want to deliver Dynamic 365 as a consultancy services, right? There's a minimal investment required from uh, Microsoft to become a Microsoft certified partner, right? That's the first thing you need to do. Go to this website called MPN, uh, mpn.microsoft.com, register your, yourself into the partner network, and it, it's a very good place to get it started with, right? Second is you need to build certain competencies, right? These are the people who are certified in delivering D365 services, right? Now, you can start with two people. You can start with 100 people. All depends upon the budget and the funding that you have got, right? Um, but uh, so, so there's no real initial uh, major investment that required apart from being a Microsoft partner and then create a portfolio of services. I think, yeah, that's great. Thank you, Ajay. Uh, I hope that, yeah, okay. Mark, please. No, thank yep. you. So thank you. Uh, we know that many people, uh, you are already, uh, already inspiring many people. So we have now Jalees, and uh, he's, I think, uh, who's saying that Ajay mm -hmm. always inspires. So uh, we have found many people from the Middle East Australian region who really inspires you. So thank you very much for your time at Urdu Hindi Bootcamp 2021. And we really appreciate that you come here and see you soon. For sure. Thank you. Thank you, Amar. Thanks, Kamar. Uh, really a pleasure and my pleasure to be part of the Udu Hindi Bootcamp today. So wish you guys good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. See Thank you, you next year. Same to you. Bye. 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 All right, Amar. So I think what do we have now? I think we are just yep. going on a very small break, um, which should not be longer than 10 minutes, you know. And yep. once we'll come back, we will have a next session. Yeah, let's come uh, just listen some good Pakistani music and just enjoy the landscape of Pakistan. Sure, not a problem. So let me play that. There we go.
Pakistan user group. Today, we're going to be discussing D365 security tools, tips and tricks, and going in and seeing what uh, available reporting, um, different features and functionality are available to help you set up, configure, and maintain your D365 security. Quick introduction about myself. My name is Alex Meyer. I'm the director of D365 and AX development at FastPath. Uh, my contact information is there in the middle as well as my blog. Uh, and a little background about me, I have a, a Microsoft MVP in business applications. I've been working in AX for the last eight years, FNO for the last five years, and I've done speaking engagements and webinars uh, and a number of different user group conferences in both the United States and Europe around uh, Dynamics AX and FNO uh, security and native controls in both versions. So a quick agenda for today. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, talking about security reporting, what is available within FNO currently, um, and what options you have there. Uh, some best practices about security setup, so where you can go in and what's the best practice from, from that perspective. Uh, how security and user licensing are tied together. So looking at the implications of your licensing based on the security you have set up. Some overall best practices when looking at setting up, configuring, and maintaining your security. And then some security tools that are available, uh, that uh, free tools that I've developed to help with this particular process. So let's go ahead and jump in uh, with our first section here. Uh, we're going to talk about security reporting. So what uh, reporting exists within FNO natively that we can actually go in and look at? Uh, and first, we're going to talk about different, uh, a little, one of the topics we're talking about the reporting side of things you can do to help with this particular process. And the first thing is trying to minimize administrator assignments. So when you're talking about uh, security reporting, right? One uh, thing that you can do uh, to help with your security setup uh, and, every, and part of that is to uh, actually go in and assign the sysadmin role to a user, right? Um, this is obviously something that uh, can be done during testing uh, or should probably only be done during testing um, and then, you know, define what that user can actually do um, as part of their day-to-day uh, -day operations. But one thing we see um, as part of um, you know, looking at users' environments is the fact that in some cases, even in a production environment, uh, you know, users will sometimes get sysadmin because you know, the, your current IT team or security team can't figure out what actual security the user needs, or maybe they pushed off security to the very end of the implementation or upgrade cycle. And so it's very easy to just go in and assign sysadmin to a user because you know they're going to be able to perform the tasks they need to. Um, and, and so, you know, why, what are the implications of that? Well, the first is that it's, you know, obviously this is an easy way out. It's going, you know, the user is going to be able to perform the actions in the system, right? Because they can perform every action, uh, but it's very hard to undo. Uh, we kind of uh, jokingly talk about this internally as uh, trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube. Right. Once you assign this admin, it's very difficult to go in and take that access away from an end user. Uh, the more sys admins you have in your system, it's going to introduce more risk, right? Because you have to account for all of these users having these privileges. It's going to cost more money from a licensing standpoint, and it's going to increase your time for audit. So if you have internal or external audit requirements, the more sys admins you have is going to increase your time uh, and you know, the money spent and time and effort for your particular audit. So the first report that auditors will normally ask for if you do have to go through some sort of audit is a sysadmin report, right? Who's a science sysadmin in your system? Um, and what are they doing with their access? There are normally two questions that uh, go together. Um, for who's a science sysadmin, right? You have the out of the box user role assignment report, which can be found at system administration, inquiry, security, and user role assignments. Um, some other types of access reports that we can look at our role access report. So if you go into your security administration, again, that security configuration, and you select an individual role due to your privilege, you can then select a view permissions button. And this will actually go in and show you the complete hierarchy of that particular um, structure of the security uh, from either a role due to your privilege point of view um, and be able to show you every object that that particular role due to your privilege is assigned and the access for that. 
uh, particular object. The other part that it also does here is that it will give you the license that's required. So in this case, we're looking at the accountant role. We know that if we assign the accountant role to a user, they're going to require an operations level license. And in this case, that license is going to be the finance license um, within the new licensing type of, of uh, 365. You can also do the same type of reporting from the AOT by going into the Visual Studio, going to your Dynamics 365 tab, going to add-ins, and then do related objects and licenses for all roles. One thing to note here is that it will actually show you all roles uh, in your system and it'll export it to an Excel file. So instead of having to go role by role like you do in the user interface, you can export every role um, in one click from the AOT. So that might uh, could possibly save you some time. All right. In the next, next section here, we're going to talk about security setup. Uh, and the first thing we're going to discuss here are the pros and cons of using the default security uh, from Microsoft. So, uh, you know, obviously D365, just like AX2012, ships with out of the box rules, duties, and privileges, right? You can absolutely use those um, to get, uh, you know, for easy, fast setup um, as far as assigning those to users. The uh, other part to it is that security layers, uh, those rules, duties, and privileges provided by Microsoft will be automatically updated during Microsoft updates, right? So, you know, if you're staying current with Microsoft as, you know, the out of the box, you know, accountant role or accounting manager or whatever other role uh, you assign, right? Those will be updated when Microsoft adds new features and functionality. Uh, some cons with this though, is that uh, it's very easy for that security to be over provisioned. The out of the box security roles are great from a functional perspective not so great from an audit perspective, right? They, uh, Microsoft wants to go in and show all the bells and whistles between in every feature and functionality within a particular module. And so they over provision those uh, different roles uh, to, to kind of uh, give users visibility to those. And that may not be, uh, you know, what is needed in your particular environment. The other part to it uh, is that, again, you'll notice that I added this again, the security layers will get automatically updated by Microsoft as a pro and a con. The reason I have it listed both is that some companies want those security layers to be updated while others have very strict audit requirements that their security doesn't change. And so that can be a con as well um, if you fall into that category. So you wanna make sure you understand what your audit requirements are um, if you are gonna use the default security from Microsoft. Um, other uh, thing we wanna understand from security setup perspective is the different objects that exist within uh, the system that you can actually assign. So the first one we want to talk about is menu items. Uh, menu items come in three different types. The menu item displays, outputs, and actions. Menu item displays are tied to forms within an application. So anytime you go to a particular page in the application, uh, that's going to be driven by access from a menu item display. Um, the other, the second type is menu item output. So anytime you run a report that exports either to the screen or to some shared, uh, you know, uh, uh, reporting share or whatever. Um, that's going to be controlled by menu item output. And then anytime you have a task that you're performing in the system, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, closing a fiscal period, um, some sort of um, processing that has to occur, uh, that's going to be controlled by menu item action, right? So those are the three different types from a menu item side. Uh, and the second object type you have is tables. Um, so you can actually, and these refer directly to SQL tables, so you can set your create, read, update, and delete to an actual table as well. Um, the third type are data entities. So these are a new um, object type within FNO that allows you to combine multiple SQL tables together for to form a business process. So things like sales orders and system users, um, uh, you know, will, will span across multiple tables um, on at the SQL level, but a data entity kind of combines all those together and gives a more human uh, readable and consumable uh, endpoint that you can use. One additional feature here is they also allow for CRUD operations, right? So you can actually create, read, update, delete uh, users or sales orders uh, externally um, if you're gonna, going to use the data entity. The last one, uh, last object type I want to talk about is service operations, and these actually refer to X++ API endpoints. So again, you can hit uh, use these for external services, uh, but they are uh, actually run X++ code uh, when you actually utilize them. 
Next piece here we want to talk about is the different types of access levels, right? So we talked about um, object types. Now we're going to talk about the different access levels that you can assign to those object types. So um, there's, we can talk about access types first. So this is going to be hierarchy based from least to greatest. So when you go into an object, you can uh, normally assign read, update, create, and delete. Um, and those are hierarchy as you work your way up the chain. And this can be used for uh, menu items, tables, and data entities. The service operations actually have their own access type called invoke, and you either have access to it or you don't. Um, and so that's what the invoke is, is used for. So uh, those are the two different um, types of accesses that you can assign. And then from an access level, um, each access type, you can either, uh, you can set the access level for these as well. So you can either grant access to that object, right? So you're going to grant the read permission or grant the delete permission to an object. And then the other two uh, access types are actually new uh, within FNO. Uh, so if you're coming from AX 2012, these access levels didn't exist, uh, but they are the, de the deny and unset. So the deny is actually an explicit deny. It will go in and actually uh, explicitly deny a particular uh, access type to an object for a user assigned to that role due to your privilege. And those denies are going to override any grants that are occurring to that particular user. Um, so if you go in and you, uh, even if you have delete permission to an object, if you have a deny also assigned to that object, that deny is going to supersede uh, the grants uh, assigned to that object. Uh, and so the last access level here um, is the unset. And so that's basically there um, if you don't want to grant access to an object, but you also don't want to deny access to the object, you can just leave it as unset. It's the default state. If another role of your privilege comes along and grants access to that object, right, that's not going to stop it. So the unset, you can kind of think of as just that uh, default uh, setting uh, for your access levels. One thing uh, we want to talk about when you're doing your security setup is always remember the company restrictions. So it's very easy to go in and assign roles to a user. Uh, but one thing that is somewhat unclear to some end users is that by default, when you assign a role to a user, that user gets that access across all legal entities or companies in your uh, D365 setup. And so uh, you want to make sure that if that user should be restricted to only seeing particular companies or legal entities that you're going in and actually performing that restriction process. So once you go in and assign a role to a user, you can go in and click on the assign organizations button. Um, and then you can go in and actually determine which or uh, legal entities or companies you want that uh, user to have that role access within. Once you assign one company restriction, that user only gets that access within the companies that you assign. If there are no company restrictions assigned to that user role assignment, that user gets that access across all legal entities. One thing you can use to help with this is organizational hierarchies. So you can actually go in and set up uh, a hierarchy of legal entities um, and have the purpose of those, that particular organizational hierarchy be security. And then you can utilize that when you're actually going in and setting, uh, assigning the organizations to your user role assignment to assign large numbers of legal entities uh, to a particular user role assignment very quickly instead of having to go one by one. Another thing we want to talk about is this idea of setting up least privilege security. So what is least privilege security? It's really a methodology or a mindset that a user should only be granted access to the minimum amount or should be assigned the minimum amount of access they need to perform their day to day operations or their job assignment. Right. And uh, so why is this important or why would we want to do this? The first is that we want to minimize environmental risk. Right. If a user um, has more access than they need, they can go in and intentionally or inadvertently uh, perform actions that would put your company at risk, right? They may go in and click a button not knowing what the ramifications of that are or change a setting and uh, you know, inadvertently change the you know large uh, chunks of your environment um, just because of that, right? And so we want to make sure that only users that should have that access um, you know, are assigned to that access. Uh, the second here is that we're going to lower licensing costs, right? If we're removing security and licensing as tight as security, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, we want to remove all of the access that user doesn't need because that could potentially save us money from a licensing perspective. Uh, and the final piece, again, ties back into uh, the other two points that we talked about, but it's going to reduce your segregation duties risk as well, right? If you remove the access from the user, 
um, and the user doesn't need that to perform their daily operations, you're, you're potentially also removing segregation duties risk that you could have to uh, go in and address um, as part of an internal or external audit, right? So it's very important um, to actually go in and this lease privilege idea, uh, it can be very powerful within your organization to help save you money and reduce your risk. The other parts to this, when we're talking about lease privilege is, um, you know, some organizations look at this and go, you know, there's no way that we would be able to implement this, you know, it's too costly, um, you know, we're just going to use out of the box security. And really, when you talk about your security design and implementation, there's really three approaches that you can take. Uh, you can do the top down approach where users go in and they use out of the box security layers and they go in and modify them to remove the access that the uh, user doesn't need. Um, obviously, this is going to be faster and easier, right? Because you have a starting point and you're removing access. Uh, the cons for this is that the user can still be over provisioned, right? Even if you go in and are starting to remove uh, duties and privileges, there's still going to be the potential of a user only needing, needing part of a particular duty or privilege. Um, and in that case, right, that user would be over provisioned um, at the end of the day. The other process or the other idea that you can take when you're doing your security implementation is this bottom up approach, right? This is where you would go in and actually build up your um, privileges to only require or only be designed to assign access that this user needs on a day to day basis and then build those up from you know, your privileges to your duties to your roles. The pros of this, right, is that it's truly privileged. The cons of this is that it's slower and it's more expensive, right, than using the out of the box roles as a starting point. So those are kind of the two extremes. In the middle, you have what we call this hybrid approach, right, which is where you take a risk based approach um, and say, you know, I'm going to apply the bottom up or the least privilege idea in the areas that are going to introduce high risk into my organization, you know, around financials, um, things like that, and maybe take and use out of the box security around areas that are lower risk to my organization, right? So you don't have to go one way or the other completely. You can use this hybrid approach um, and, and kind of use that to, to help soften the, the impact of, of least privilege security. The next thing we're talking about uh, security setup is this idea of extensible data security, right? And a lot of companies want to implement this, but they are maybe afraid uh, of, you know, they've heard horror stories uh, of other users trying to implement this. Um, the whole idea about extensible data security is really providing record level security. Um, that's kind of this is the, the answer that Microsoft has for trying to implement record level security. The idea being is that you, you only want the user to be able to see certain kinds of objects of a particular type. So maybe in this case, and the example here is that a user should be able to only see customers that have a cusp group of 10. Right, so they have access to customers, but we're going to restrict it further by saying that the they can only see customers with group 10. And so you can see once we apply XDS from this top screenshot to the bottom, right, the user is filtering out the other uh, exam or other customers within uh, within this listing. A um, couple things about uh, XDS is that it's done by a code, not through security configuration, so you can't do it through the user interface. It has to be done through code. And there is the potential of having a performance impact if you don't apply the queries and the indexing correctly um, on the tables you're looking to uh, utilize as part of the XDS policy. So um, I do uh, within the PowerPoint here I have a couple of different uh, blog posts about you know how you would go about setting this up. So I would recommend you look at those if you're looking for more detail there. The other thing, other uh, security feature that you can utilize here is the Table Permission Framework, or TPF. Um, this Table Permission Framework is used for providing an additional layer of security for your high business impact or HBI data, things like credit cards, social security numbers, etc. cetera. Um, there's actually a parameter on every table and table field um, called AOS authorization. And if this is actually set to yes, then a, a TPF is turned on. If it's set to no, then it's turned off. Um, if AOS authorization is turned on, then a user has to be given explicit access to that table or table field for the user to actually have that access. So even if they have delete permission, again, to the menu item, all right, and this table and table field fall under that menu item, you still have to be go in and give the user explicit permission to the table or table field wherever you have the, the TPF enabled 
for the user to be able to perform that action, right? So it's just another layer of security so you don't unintentionally grant access. Access to uh, things you don't possibly want to give access to. Uh, another uh, key piece of this is we want to leverage the deny permission successfully, right? Because this is a change within FNL, um, you know, the deny permission didn't exist in earlier versions of AX, right? There are going to be situations if you're upgrading from AX2012 to FNL where the deny permission could potentially help simplify your security. And if you're a new user to FNL, Right, it could be a way for you to, uh, again, simplify your uh, how you're trying to set up your security within your organization. Again, that deny permission is that explicit deny, which means it's going to override any grants from any other security layers, and so we can deny. Um, you know, one of the uh, feature or one of the requests that we get quite often, um, and, and where you could potentially utilize this very easily is on the sales order. Right, so we want a user to be able to um, go in and actually be able to modify, edit and modify the sales order lines, but not actually modify the sales order header. Right, so we can actually go in and um, deny the update, create, and delete permissions of the sales table itself, and then the user can't modify the sales order header, but they can still interact with the sales order lines just as they would before. Right, and so this would be an example of where that deny permission can help um, set or help. Uh, your security setup and make it a little bit easier um, as a uh, process. Uh, the next thing we want to keep in mind is where our security is stored, right? So where your security is stored is going to be dictated based on where it was either created or modified. Uh, if the security, if your security, your roles, duties, and privileges are created within the AOT, uh, that security is going to be stored as code or a development artifact. So you can actually go in and see the XML file that gets generated if you go in and mod or create a role due to your privilege there, right, it'll actually show that. If your security is created or modified within the security configuration area, uh, on the other hand, your security is going to be stored in the database. So it actually is stored as data and it's not pushed back to the AOT. So that's something you want to keep in mind um, as you're going through and designing your security uh, because uh, you, know, you want to have that maintainability across environments. So uh, you know, how you're actually going to move security between, you know, your development to your test UAT to prod is going to be very different if you're making changes in the AOT compared to the user interface, right? So you want to make sure you understand the implications of where you're making your security changes and how that's going to impact you moving that security or, or uh, migrating that security to another environment. And the last thing we want to talk about is utilizing task recordings. Um, uh, to uh, in the security diagnostics for task recordings feature to help with the least privilege idea that we kind of talked about earlier. So task recordings are a native feature with an AX and FNO. Uh, it allows you to record the steps um, that a user is performing within the application. It's going to be normally it's used for documentation or testing purposes, uh, but you can also use those to uh, actually see which uh, securable objects are being utilized or consumed during a particular task. Uh, and so there's a feature within a native feature within finance and ops where you can go in. It's called security Di diagnostic for task recordings where you can upload a task recording and it'll show you um, the objects that were uh, utilized during that particular task. There are some gaps um, within this this feature. Um, the first is that it only works for menu item displays, not outputs or actions. It doesn't show the access required to an object. So it won't tell you if you need read, update, create, or delete permission to a particular menu item. Uh, and it doesn't show menu items tied to form or form controls. So if you have form control that has a uh, menu item behind it, right, it's not going to show you that, that that is being consumed. Uh, it also can't analyze certain security situations where security is done either in code or stored in tables. So things like workflow, 
um, are, are is one example where security is actually done via code and sorting tables, right? If you start going into that area, the, the security diagnostic for task recording really won't show you um, uh, the correct permissions. And so this is actually one of the areas where I have a tool to help with that particular process. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and jump into user licensing and how this is tied together uh, within uh, FNO. So one thing to keep in mind is that your security and licensing are connected together, right? What a user assigned from a security perspective is going to impact their licensing, right? And so you need to understand that relationship um, because if you go in and start modifying security without understanding that, you can greatly impact the licensing uh, requirements for your organization. So there's really two different types of licensing uh, methodologies that are utilized uh, currently. The first is this entry point based licensing. Uh, entry point based licensing is what was used in ANC 2012 um, as well. Uh, and it's brought over into FNO. Uh, for each entry point, or in this case, menu items, there's two different uh, parameters on that each object. Uh, there's a maintain user license and a view user license. Um, a maintain, basically, these are the two parameters that tell you which license type is going to be required, uh, and what, uh, how they determine what is required is going to be based on the access to that uh, menu item. So, if you have create, update, or delete permission to that object, right, whatever license is in the maintain user license parameter is going to be required. If you only have read permission to the object, right, then whatever license is in the view user license. Uh, parameter is going to be required, right? So in this case, we can see that an enterprise license is required for the sys user info detail object, uh, which cor corresponds to an operations license in FNO, and the view user license in this case is universal, or which corresponds to a team member license, right? So we can kind of see that if you had create, update, or delete permission to this object, you'd require an operations license, but if you only had a read, you would only require a team member license. Um, the other type of license is actually what we're going to be, or the license methodology that's used is going to be covered here in the next steps, uh, or next slides um, as we go forward. So when we're looking at the licensing model, I like to show this one just to show where we came from and then kind of where we are now. So the old licensing model, when I talk about old, this is pre-October 2019, uh, used to have the ability to, eat, to buy uh, Dynamics 365 plan, which covered both the CRM or customer engagement side, as well as the FNO uh, side of things. And then you could also just buy you got a unified operations plan, which, which we cover finance and ops, talent and retail. Um, and then you could also just go in and, and buy finance and ops or talent or retail uh, individually, right? So you had a lot of different options as far as covering those plans. Post 20, October 2019, Microsoft changed to this idea of um, then, you know, there's no overarching license going across these. You get, have to pick and choose which modules you want a user to be able to access. And so they had this idea of, of having a base and an attached license. So there are uh, basically the first license that's assigned to the user is going to be your base, and then you can attach additional license at a much uh, lower rate to that particular user. Uh, there are certain combinations of licenses that you can that are valid as far as base and attach, and you can find those um, within the licensing guides from Microsoft. All right, so we already kind of talked about this already, but the licensing reporting is on this view permissions report that you can find in the security configuration area, right? So you can actually see the license to the very right hand side um, that is telling you based on this particular access to this object, here's a license that's going to be re required. Um, you can also get the licensing information as part of the license uh, user license count report, which uh, will tie or show you the license that's required for each role. And the user license counts history report will also have this as well. So you can this will this report allows you to see the changes over time uh, by the number of users that require an operations uh, activity and team member license. And you can do the same reporting again. Um, in AOT, the that view related object and licenses for all roles report or that we looked at earlier also has the license detailed on it in that Excel file that it generates. So I, I talked about the idea that there are two separate methodologies. There's that entry point based licensing. The other methodology um, 
from a license perspective is the privilege or is at the privilege level. Um, and so this is where your new finance, supply chain management, retail project, uh, enterprise asset management uh, licenses come into play. Uh, and so there is one report within FNO that does show this. It's the user license estimator report. And this is the only report that, report that shows that new methodology um, other than the view permissions report that just includes and says, here's the license that's required. Um, there's not really a good report within FNO that shows why a particular user or role or duty or privilege requires a particular license. Um, and so that's where other um, you know, ISVs come into play to help with that particular task. Uh, but as far as, uh, you know, the next question that you have when you look at this is, well, how, how are we actually generating this, right? What, what is, how is this, um, you know, how is this access that this user has generating and, and requiring this particular license? And so um, how this is actually done behind the scenes is that at the privilege level, Microsoft is basically, basically determining which license SKUs are going to be required. So if a user is assigned a particular privilege, um, they're going to have, be require a particular license because of that. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, moving parts behind the scenes here, but basically there's a, a JSON file um, that gets populated into the licensing service plans privilege table. And this is then going to dictate which uh, license is required for a particular privilege. Uh, but now that we have these two licensing methodologies, how do those work together? Really, right? How do those go in and, and how do you determine which license is going to be required for a user? And there's really, you have to combine both the entry point based licensing we looked at earlier, as well as the privilege based licensing we just looked at, and um, to determine what the licensing requirements are. So I created this Visio diagram to kind of give you a waterfall method to, to show, or decision tree to actually show, you know, what, um, you know, if you follow this, it'll, it'll actually show you you know what the determination is of how what license is going to be required right so again there's um, i have numerous blog posts around this as well so if you want to go into a deeper dive you can absolutely uh, find that on my blog um, but this uh, uh, video diagram is very useful uh, when you're going through and, and looking to say how is this user um, you know what licenses does this user require all right the next section we're going to talk about here is best practice so what best practices can we find and utilize within our, uh, from a security standpoint? Uh, one big thing that I have have found that is very helpful for users in, in how they should treat security um, is really looking at as, as security as the same you do, same as code, right? Whatever um, process you have for code, right? Going in and go, moving between your different environments, that's how you should treat security as well, right? So just like you can't go into production and make changes directly to security or make changes to code directly in production, you shouldn't be making security changes directly in production either, right? It should go through your same development ALM process that your code is going through while you make the changes in the development environment, it gets promoted to a test UAT QA environments and then finally gets promoted to prod, right? So you don't wanna be making changes in each making security changes in each environment individually, right? It should go through that same uh, promotion process. Another thing that we talk about is this idea of taking that risk-based approach uh, to your security reporting and reviews, right? So we talked about a lot of different reports that you can look at um, from a security perspective, you know, and there's going to be hundreds of thousands of objects on that report. And you really don't need to be going through uh, and looking at every object individually. Um, you really should be categorizing your access and your risk um, into different levels, you know, maybe high, medium, and low. Uh, maybe you have different levels in your organization, uh, but you really should be focusing in on those high risk areas first and then working your way down to medium and low um, after you've already done your uh, reviews at a higher level, right? So reviewing your high level access, right, is going to generate your highest ROI as part of your reviews, right? That's where you're gonna find the most uh, you know, the mo the riskiest access, that's where you're going to find the ability to, you know, maybe lower licensing costs uh, for a particular user. Um, and so that's going to generate that ROI that you're looking for as part of your access reviews. Um, it's going to be less data to review, right, because you're only focusing in on certain objects. Um, and so that's going to lead to more accurate reviews, 
as well because you don't have hundreds of thousands of lines for um, to review. You probably have, you know, hundreds to maybe a thousand lines, right? And so you're cutting down the number of uh, records you have to review. And then you can also spend less time in your reviews as well because you're, again, you're not reviewing uh, that large amount of data um, at the beginning. And one last thing uh, we want to talk about here is uh, this idea of that security is more than just dynamics, right? There's going to be other systems outside of your ERP that can also affect your overall security. Um, so just securing dynamics correctly, right? If you leave the rest of your environment um, without um, taking the ideas of the security that you uh, have implemented in your dynamics product, if you don't implement it in other areas of your environment, right? Um, that's going to lead to, uh, you know, the uh, weaker, uh, it's going to uh, introduce risk into your organization in other areas that could potentially impact your ERP uh, in other ways. So you wanna really think of this in terms of rings where each ring will build on uh, the inner, or build on the one before it. Um, so you really have your database at the center of it, right? That's where your, your data is gonna be stored. You have your application surrounding it. So that would be your ERP in this case. Uh, but can be other applications as well that are interacting with a database of some kind. You have your network and infrastructure around that, you know, how you're actually accessing an application. Very rarely do you have on-premise applications anymore. They're more going to be cloud-based. Um, and so you want to make sure that your network and infrastructure are secure. And then finally, you have your user around the entire piece here because your user is actually what's interacting with the system, right? So you wanna make sure that you're instilling those ideas, those best practice security ideas um, at your users uh, level and you know working your way uh, through those other rings as well. All right, and so now we wanna look at some uh, security tools that I've developed to help with this particular process. Uh, the first is going to be the task recorder parser. Um, and so I mentioned this earlier, but this is actually going in and allowing you to take those task recordings that you've uh, recorded of yourself within this uh, for a particular user um, and going in and, and utilizing those task recordings to actually look at the uh, objects that are gonna, going to be um, consumed or utilized during that, that process. So I went in, um, I actually developed this before Microsoft had uh, their uh, tool. Uh, but the one thing that, that I have here is that the Task Recorder Parser will also work for H2012, R2, and R3. Uh, and it will also work for um, all menu item types. So it will work for menu item uh, displays, outputs, and actions. Um, and so this is, again, available on my GitHub. Um, and we'll take a look at actually all of these products or all of the solutions that I have um, that are available for free on my GitHub. But we'll look at it in a live demo here uh, in just a second. Uh, the next one we have here is the security converter. So this is actually allowing you to take uh, security from your, uh, that you've either created or modified from your user interface within D365 and actually allows you to look at the different changes that you made or all the different security layers that you've touched. Uh, it allows you to make changes to the name, label, and description of those. Um, and then also allows you to uh, export, uh, you know, select individual uh, security layers that you want to take to another environment. So maybe you don't want to move your entire, uh, everything that you've modified in security in one environment to another. You only want to take, you know, an individual role uh, due to your privilege. Uh, and so you can absolutely go in and select which uh, security layers you want to take. Um, the default feature from FNO for this is just to move everything over, right? So this gives you a little bit more control over what you want to do there uh, as part of that process. And finally, here we have the security test workspace. Um, this is the my newest tool that I've released. Uh, this allows you to actually mock up security. So it allows you to take any combination of roles, duties, and privileges, actually mock those into a new security role, assign it to a test user, log in as that test user to actually see what that uh, role would actually end up being able to do. Um, and so it allows, it automates a lot of that process so you don't have to go in and individually do it. Uh, or manually do that process, 
The other thing that allows you to do is to um, load your load user roles from a uh, user that's already in your system. So maybe you want to, in this case, take the Alicia user, you can load her roles and actually then make changes to them and say, what would happen if I removed this particular role from this user? Or what would happen if I added this additional duty, role duty or privilege to this user, right? I'd be able to, to see that, the impact of that, right? So um, this just allows for your testing side to be a little bit easier uh, from that perspective. So with that being said, let's go ahead and look at the demo of these tools. All right, so now let's go ahead and look at the uh, security solutions that are available for free on my GitHub that can help you uh, with your security setup, maintainability, and configuration process. And so the first is this task recorder parser. Uh, again, this is going in and taking the task recordings you have from your X2012, R2, R3, or FNO environment and analyzing those to see which uh, what menu items were actually consumed or utilized during that process. So the first thing you can do here is go out and select a task recording. I have one from both an FNO and an AX2012 instance. This is going to be from an FNO environment. You can see that we're able to go in and see the menu item name and then the label and the menu item type as well as the form name that is being uh, utilized or consumed along with this menu item or that's tied to this menu item. You then have the ability to either export this to Excel or CSV as part of um, if you want to export the, the output or uh, from this. Uh, and you can also do the same thing from AX2012, in this case, an R2 uh, task recording as well. So once I hit parse, you'll notice the task recording type changes because the solution recognizes that it's a different um, task recording type, uh, but you still get the same output here. You can see what was consumed. And then again, you can export these um, as needed. Uh, the second solution I wanted to look at was the security converter. So this comes in and allows you to select a uh, security data customization uh, file, which is what is actually exported uh, from the uh, from your D365 environment, if you go to security configurations and then actually go up to data and export, this will export all uh, changes you've made in the user interface to your security to an XML file. Uh, you can take that XML file and go and actually uh, import it into another environment directly, uh, but it's gonna take across all of your security changes. Uh, and so in some instances, that's not uh, what the, um, you know, um, the output that we're looking for. And so in that case, then you can use the security converter to help with that process. So in this case, we can come in and uh, process this file. We're able to see that in this case, this uh, security database customization um, contained these roles, duties, and privileges um, that were modified. Um, I can then come in and make changes to this. So um, this duty was created in the user interface. Maybe I don't want it to, uh, the name of this to be uh, the GUID that was uh, assigned by Microsoft. And so I can come in and I can actually, um, you know, change this uh, to whatever name I would like. Um, and so I can do that same modification at the label and description level as well. I then can then select which um, roles, duties, or privileges I want to actually move. So maybe if I took, um, if I wanted this role, uh, you'll notice that it also will select this privilege uh, because this privilege is assigned to this role. So to maintain the uh, validity of our security setup, we actually have to uh, export both of those. Uh, you then have the ability to export this to a UI um, file, which will actually export another XML file with just those two uh, pieces or security layers um, as part of it. Um, and so it would only, if you were to import that, then in another environment, only these two uh, security layers would be brought across. Or you can actually export this to code, which actually export this, exports this to the XML files that are utilized in your AOT. So you can actually take these uh, those files back and actually add them to a project, a uh, security project. So if you've created your security in the, in the user interface and you want to move it to uh, the AOT, you can absolutely do that as well with this um, solution. Uh, and the final um, piece I wanted to show here, the final solution is the security test workspace. Um, again, this allows you to come in and actually um, mock up your security 
uh, and, and test your security without actually going into um, and manually setting it up in the user interface or um, assigning it to a test user or any part of that. It handles all of that behind the scenes. So there are a couple parts of this you have to set up. The first is the uh, connection window, which is telling you where you're actually uh, pointed to, uh, which uh, FNO environment you're going to point to, because we're actually going to have to go out and mock up this security. So we're actually going to make changes to your security setup, um, as well as the user wall assignments. So you have to give it a service user that you're going to use. So which user are we actually going to assign this mock role to? You can select a web browser that you want to utilize and then the service operation endpoint. So there's actually a deployable package um, as part of this out of my GitHub that you can utilize if you're not a FastPath customer. If you are a FastPath customer, um, then you can utilize the already um, existing endpoints that we have as part of our security designer product. Um, but the idea here is that what this is doing is it's creating a new role. It's going to assign whatever roles, duties, and privileges you have uh, set up in this assigned security layers area to that role. Um, and then it's then taking that mock role and assigning it to that test user. And then it's going to launch a test workspace as that test user um, in your system. So what we can do in this case is we can take a um, any role that we would like. If we want to add a duty to this, we can do that as well. We just go out and load these. We can um, assign these uh, to this test user as well. Load up the um, privileges here. So now you can see we have a role, duty, and privilege um, that we want to test in this case. So we'll go ahead and launch a test workspace. We can see in this case that it's going to load this in. We can see that it's the we're signed in as this fast path user in this case, and we can come over here and actually see the modules that we can do. And in this case, we can interact with the system. Um, from an administrative side, I actually have, I'm logged in as another instance here just to show what this is doing on the back end. Um, there, what we do is we I created the security role test workspace. You can see that there are uh, sub roles, duties, and privileges assigned, and we can go through and actually see that the security role test space, uh, test space or test workspace role is created. It then assigns that batch job manager role that we had, the maintain absorption cost duty, and this view abbreviations privilege to that role. And then if we come over to the user side, we can actually see that this role is going to be assigned to that fast path user, right? So it does all of that uh, behind the scenes um, and, and um, handles that for you. So that's from the administrative side. If we jump back to um, the workspace here, uh, one last piece that I wanted to show in this case um, was the idea that we could actually uh, load these roles from a uh, user. So if we go to the Alicia user, we can load her roles. These are the roles that the Alicia user is assigned. And now we can, uh, again, add in any additional roles, duties or privileges we want. So, you know, if we wanted to uh, come in at a duty level and assign, you know, what would happen if we assign this additional duty to this user and maybe an additional privilege? Right, um, we can absolutely do that again, um, and um, then go ahead and launch this test workspace. The uh, just to help with the uh, again that that load user roles is just helping you um, as a starting point. It allows you to test you know your user uh, security setups in a little bit easier way in that regard. So you can see that the. Workspace here has changed um, because of the role, different roles that we're assigning in that case, right? So you can continue your testing in that way. Once you're all done, you can click this remove security test role option, and that will actually remove that uh, mock role that we've created from your environment. Um, so then you uh, know that, um, uh, you know, it's cleared out from your system um, and it's not going to impact or be accidentally used going forward, right? So. Those are the three options uh, or the three solutions that, that I wanted to show. Um, go ahead and quickly jump back into uh, the final piece here of the, uh, the presentation. I will note that there are uh, uh, on different slides, there are notes that include you know different blog posts or different things that I found. And then I also have a resource deck here at the end 
Um, that includes a lot of the, the different um, uh, resources I used to, to designing this uh, presentation. And then the final piece here as well, I want to thank you all for joining me today. Uh, I hope you found this presentation beneficial uh, and educational. Uh, and be sure to check out all the other sessions as part of the Urdu Hindi D365 Bootcamp. If you do have any questions, go free to reach out to me via email. My blog is listed there as well. Thank you for attending and have a great day. Wow. Hello, everyone. What a great uh, session. I think this is one of the very complex area when we talk about uh, security in the FinOps. So hope you have learned. And again, if there are any questions, queries, feel free to reach out, uh, Alex, and reach out to any of, of us. We can support and provide any sort of a detail required. Now I'm going to... Uh, to have next session, uh, this is from the Andre, and Andre will be talking about the FinOps connector for Power Automate. Uh, so I'm going to add Andre on the platform now. Andre, are you there now? Hey. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Andre, how are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you right. very well, yes. and I can see you. That's also good. Then the camera uh, is excellent. working and the mic is working. That's great. <laughs> excellent. Thank you, Andre. And it's always to you know pleasure to have you. Uh, I know, Andre, you have been working and supporting the community over the years. And once again, you're here. So thank you for your time. I will hand over uh, the platform to you. And you can start your session. Thank you. OK. Thank you all. Um, today. Uh, first of all, welcome. Um, I'm going to be a bit out of my comfort zone. Usually my comfort zone is um, also security, a lot of more uh, the, the details between the fully technical and uh, functional. So a bit in the middle of that um, is where I have all my uh, knowledge and, and just things I like to talk about. Um, actually, Alex already had a great session about security, so I thought I had to do something different, and let's talk about the finance innovations uh, connector in Power Automate. And I called it Ledger Operations Flow. Today, um, I will first give you a brief overview of what um, we're going to talk about in this session. Then, um, well, actually, finalizing the agenda will already give the, all those highlights. Uh, just a brief introduction in automation introduction. What type of automations are there and, and how can we leverage them? Um, then a bit more on the Power Automate FNO connector, some uh, backgrounds and, and what actions and triggers are available. And then also I will provide some examples what you can achieve with the Power Automate flows. So let's continue to the slide um, where we will start with explaining there are several options for doing some process automation. Um, one of them is the business process automation. And on the other hand, there's also robotic process automation. Um, when talking about the, the a, a few years back, uh, somewhere in 2016, 2017, Microsoft came with the product Microsoft Flow, which is now rebranded as uh, Microsoft Power Automate. And at that time, uh, there were also other uh, programs like UiPath, uh, which were more capable of doing things automatically and, and more um, act like a robot. Um, so the real difference between just a business process automation it's just where you can just streamline your business processes, um, pick um, some details from one application, probably convert a bit and move it to another process. Usually work what you did do manually, like for example, typing over an incoming email with an, an, an order details. Um, it would be possible to just integrate different applications and do it automatically. And that's also all about 
what we today call is the digital transformation. If it is possible to do or just pick up things which is already digital, sent in a certain way, if it's structured, if it's structured, then you can also get it in another place, also automated. Uh, now the difference between the business and the robotic process automation is that the robotic process automation, like also visible on the on the image at the right side, um, you can use software robots to complete certain tasks for you. And also add some artificial intelligence like uh, where the system can think for you and make some decisions automatically. Now the story from Microsoft, it already began before 2019, um, but Microsoft started with the Microsoft Power Automate, initially called Microsoft Flow, where you could link one application, get some details and move it to another application. There was more indeed the business process automations. And they announced somewhere in that year or around that year, we want to focus on RPA, robotic process automation. But when you look at the Descartes Magic Quadrant, there was no Microsoft at all. And they announced we are looking for 100 plus uh, people to help us on the RPA story. And then move one year further, what we see is that Microsoft was already in the quadrant as a visioner. So they had a great vision, they hired a lot of people, they were uh, just completing things, like it was not only the, the cloud flows, but you could also do some more robotic actions, um, automate your desktops. And now just about a week ago, Gartner again published a new quadrant on the robotic process automation. And as you can see now, Microsoft is together with the common um, vendors like UiPath, Automation Anywhere and Blue Present, they're now one of the leaders in the world uh, acknowledged by Gartner. That's a great story. However, I will not go into the robotic process automation today. Um, I just want to show you everything that's related to the finance operations connector, because uh, my background originally was also finance operations, but I'm also looking around in other uh, products and solutions related to Dynamic 365 and the Power Platform. But with the business process automation, um, with help for of over 500 connectors already, you can just do a lot of automation, uh, like receiving alerts, uh, some data exchange, you can collect data, you can use some uh, approvals, really different things. Um, and even just when I started to play with Power Automate, then it was possible to just click a button on an app on my phone, and at that time it, it will collect it it collected the location where I was, the timestamp in an Excel sheet. Uh, so in that way, I could probably very easily in my vacation, just know this was a beautiful place, just click on it. Then I know for, for another time, I want to go back there and, and see some more in, of that environment. Now, when we talk about the, the finance innovations connector available in uh, Power Automate, then we can do some CRUD actions, like we can create a record, we can update the record, we can delete records. Um, using the list items present in a table, you can also read data. And when you read data, you can also move it to other applications like a SharePoint list or an Excel file or whatever you want to do. You can also create an email out of it. Uh, the, the get a list of entities. That one, I'm not using it quite often. Actually, I, I looked at it once, but it's only getting the list of the available entities. And there's also an option to, uh, which is called execute action. I will come, I will tell that within a minute what you can do with that one. And also the finance operations connector has one trigger and that's what a business events Occurred. 
coming back to the first ones, the create, update, and delete, um, it's quite easy to work with the connectors in Flow. Um, for creating the record, it is straightforward and regardless any setting in finance operations, you can just pick your um, data entity, check some, some fields what needs to be inserted, and then just click on uh, get started. For the update and delete actions, um, that's a bit more cumbersome as there are some restrictions today. Not sure if Microsoft will solve that, but if you want to update or delete a certain record, then regardless of the setting you do in um, the action itself for which legal entity, it, it's always also looking at the settings of your own user. And that means that the user executing a certain update or delete tasks should have um, the default company set for the legal entity you're working in. Um, I will show you also a demo how you can bypass it later on and show you more details of how to get started with the Power Automate itself. In the, in the past, there were some great examples where it was really easy to start with, um, but Microsoft did um, disable those um, examples and they replaced it with the help of, of doing an approval or work with the business event, uh, which is also a great guidance to get started with, with those two options. But sometimes you would like to just also get started with reading or inserting data in finance operations. Now the execute action, that would enable you also to um, start a certain action um, like posting a journal or approving a bill of material, if that's also um, created as a certain action on a data entity. And I wrote all on all of these actions. I wrote several blogs. You can also find it on my um, blog website, dynamicpedia.com. If you search for let your operations flow or just the keyword flow, then you can find um, series of about seven, eight blocks explaining uh, in every block one of the actions. Um, create, update, delete, um, execute action is well explained on those blocks. What you need, the finance operations connector is working with data entities which are set to be public. Uh, when you develop or look at the available data entities in finance operations, they can have a setting, um, is this one public, yes or no, and is it enabled for data management, yes or no, and there can be sometimes a difference in it. So if you can find a certain uh, data entity for import exports the data, then it's not a 100% guarantee that you can use the same entity also for the finance operations connector in Power Automate or any other public um, places. Um, it's based on the OData protocol. And as you might have noticed also, sometimes there will be a new version of a certain data entity created by Microsoft. For example, if you look at the customers, it had a base one, but later on a version two and also a version three of the customer's entity, um, you can uh, just use one of them. However, Microsoft also is marking them sometimes as obsolete, meaning that they can be uh, really removed from the system within a certain period of time. Um, so that means that you sometimes have to check if there will be a new version available, if there's a new one, also check if you can update all your flows or other um, OData actions using the older data entity. Now there are also, there are also some, uh, some caveats um, using data entities or using the Power Automate. Um, you have to 
consider the performance. Um, if you are working with the Power Automate uh, using the OData, um, the performance is not designed to do a high load of, of, of records. So that means that just a few records would be great, but doing 10,000 of, of records, inserting or, or updating, it would be really slow in performance compared to just doing the same task with the data import export framework by importing a file in finance operations. Uh, also, sometimes you have to do some development effort, and you really have to take care of, of things that should work correctly. Um, when you add new fields, or probably if you want to add some virtual columns, then you really have to test if it will be working correctly. Sometimes the reading part is okay, but updating might take some additional efforts to get it really correctly working. That's about the demo time. And I will show you some examples. And the first one is how to get started with a first Power Automate flow. Then I will create one example where we will insert some customer groups from an Excel file. And this one is just having some standard customer groups 10, 20, 30 until 90. And in, if you um, go to flow, if you want to start flow, you can go to flow.microsoft.com. If you are already a user, you will be logged in and you can continue to work. If not, you can just start for free the, the first 30 days and depending on certain um, uh, licenses in finance operations, you also have some rights to use Power Automate or Power Apps. Um, that means if you're a finance user or a supply chain user, at least on operational level, you are able to work with flows using the finance and operations connector. The team members and activity users are excluded from the rights, so then you need to purchase additional licenses to also have them working with the finance operations. I will start by creating a new flow now. It will just an instant cloud flow. I will, I want to manually trigger this flow. I didn't provide a name yet. And for the flow, as first of all, I want to insert an input. And the input would be, I need a company where the data needs to be inserted. Copy to insert the data. Then as a second step, um, I have a list with a file already in Excel available. So I want to use an Excel online connector and I want to to list all the rows present in a table. To be able to work with Excel data, all the data needs to be present in a table. Uh, it's not possible to just read an additional, or just an individual cell. It all needs to be in a certain table. Now I have to find where is my file. I have it on my OneDrive. Power Automate, next one. The demos, and I created one file with some customer groups with three records in it. And when we open the file, there's one table available, customer groups table, which is having now four columns, um, just the group name, description, the text group, and also the terms of payment. This will just read the table. Officially, I have to create a loop first before I can work with the individual rows, but I will directly just start with the finance and operations connector now, because when I click a certain action, uh, at a certain point of time, when I will use some data of the Excel sheet, it will just add automatically uh, the loop, which I will show you within a minute. 
I want to create a new record now, then you have to select your finance and operations instance. I'll take this one. And as the entity name, should start with a customer. Oops. And this error may occur when there's a, a bit of timeout before you really select the entity name. So it's a bit of impatience. It's not a serious one. Just ensure you have the correct entity name and then the error will be gone as soon as possible. Now we have the entity name um, provided as the customer groups. It will now show you all available fields. Init initially, just the key fields like the customer group and for what company. And with the advanced options, you will get all other fields as well. So the customer group is in my Excel she sheet. And when I click the group, it will just link the group, but also now apply to each to loop the whole table present in Excel. When I open it again, I also have to provide the company. But that was insert, inserted as a parameter. I'm not able to see it now as an automatic content. There it is. For the company, um, for the description, I can link the name field. Then we have the terms of payment. And it's just clicking and the fields will be linked. And it's not possible to do it on all fields. If you have a date field or a quantity or integer field, you have to use an expression to convert the text to the data format for financial operations. And I have another example um, also by creating purchase orders from a file. It's, it's using quite a lot of quantities and, and date fields. Um, that one is also available on my website as a blog, but you can also download the example and then um, learn from it in your own environment. Now, what we have now is just when we start the flow manually, we have to provide an input parameter. Um, it will pick up the list with records and for each record, it will create a record uh, in finance and operations. Uh, it would be best practice to also just rename all the actions with just meaningful names so you can not only you, but also other persons, probably in the future, need to review or, or enhance the flow, will be able to understand what's going on. I'll save it now. And once it's saved, I can test it or run it. And testing is in fact also running. It will ask you, do you want to use the Excel online and the finance operations connectors? This is what I already provided before the first time you will link an Excel or uh, what type of connector, you have to provide some credentials which will be linked in your flow. Now, when I start the flow, I have to provide the company. So I will provide now USMF. I will run the flow. It is running. When I click done, you will also get an overview of what is going on. It will now list the rows present in a certain table and apply to each. You can see there, there were three records. And when looping all of them, they did not have any issue at all. Uh, when you open the details, you can also find details of what was read or what actions were done by the system. And also in case if there are certain errors, you can do some troubleshooting by looking in the details or the steps which did fail. Now, going back to the customer groups form, when I refresh this one and read the data again, let me check, uh, I'm in the wrong company, so that's, To the USMF 
company. Open the customer groups. You will see that there are three records inserted for the Urdu, Hindi, group 10, 20, and 30. Also, I mentioned when you want to update records or delete records from another uh, company compared to your base company, then you can expect an error. Um, but there's a way to get around it. Uh, first of all, when you look at my user options in this environment, as preferences, my default company is now USMF. So when I go to my flows, I already uh, created one. Um, that's a demo how to temporarily change the user default company and then act, add a certain action. I will open this one and first show you in detail what I did. It will be just for this demo now and, and, and manual as well. And it will use an, a variable where it, the current default company of the user will be stored. Um, that variable will be filled in this group. Then I will change the default company to DEMF. Then I can create a record and also update that same record. And at the end of the script, you can reset the default company um, of the user. This is working if you know if, if there will be nothing impacted in between. If you intend to run 10 different flows at the same time, all for different companies, then it might just not work at all. Then you probably need to have um, certain users in your finance operations uh, environment using different legal entities as a base legal entity. Um, but in this one is just get the system user records. It's just um, using the list items in uh, an entity. And this one is just looking at um, the system user's entity where it will filter the alias field with the user email. And that's the current user starting this flow. When we have that user, it will use the apply to each, but it will only return one record because I said I need only one record. Then it can just fill the default company with the company value of the record found. Then we go For updating the record, then we have to provide certain fields mandatory. But we can copy that one from the record already read above. And we can change the company to DEMF. Then we can create a record and update a certain record. And for updating a record, you can define also the finance operations environment, the customers groups, um, entity and the object ID. The object ID is the primary key of the table. Um, could be one field or multiple fields. And in case of multiple fields, um, you have to separate all field values with a comma. And in this case, it's just an, an entity which is uh, where the data is separated per legal entity. So you have to start with the company ID, then the comma, and then every field part of the primary key of the table. So in this case, uh, the EMF and Urdu Hindi is the customer group I created just the step before. And this one will be changed. Like there will also be a description provided in addition. And at the end, it will reset in the system users the company, which was stored in a variable default company. Now click on test, then we can run this one.
And as you can see, for certain actions, you can look at the number of seconds, then you know uh, the time used for, for processing. It can vary a bit of uh, depending on latencies or just uh, responsiveness of the application. But it's correctly set already. And now and when I go to the DMF company and the customer groups, you'll see that without any error, a record was not only inserted, but also updated in another legal entity compared to my base legal entity. And when you look at the user options, the company is set back to USMF like nothing happened before. When you look at the time, um, the time flies. Um, I also wanted to show you something about uh, importing the purchase orders, um, but actually I did create a blog, but also a video, how that's all working. So on my website, you can find um, that demo and also download it and, and how it's working together. Um, sometimes, um, but, uh, just another topic, um, in the past, I got sometimes questions. I want to have just an, an email once in a, in a week about certain alerts of things that happened before it in, in the environment, like um, um, which positions were created last or, or were linked to workers or just position changes of last week um, or other things. Um, when you look at the alert functionality in finance operations, it will just alert directly for every change in the system. Um, then I thought, well, I could try to use it using Power Automate and read all records um, created or uh, changed after a certain uh, timestamp. And when you look in finance operations, you might know that um, there will be, if enabled on a table, and create a date time or an, a modified date time. However, those fields are in the most cases not enabled on data entities. And if you want to enable it on tables uh, and the data entities, there will be you know, quite some, some additional development effort, um, which can be bypassed in a, a completely different way. And what I did do is use an, an bring your own database a new database on Azure. Um, when you do certain settings, you can export data initially, but also then um, incremental. So in the system administration data management, you can configure entity export to a database, which what I did now. And for these settings, I published certain entities and in an alert email, I'm combining now the vendor information and the bank account information to be displayed and only the changes of last week. Um, apart from this, you have to just, when you enable the change tracking, you have to create an, an data job which will export the data regularly and you can set it to return every hour or every day and in this case i did it every day it will have a result in the database and now with management studio i'm able to look at the details so we have the, the vendor staging the the vendor bank account and the dear party and every time when you change something, the change tracking will tell um, the data job to export only the new created records or the change records. And what happens with the export of the entity, it will also include another additional column, which is the sync start date time. And using this timestamp, we can loop all records and 
filter out which ones we don't need. So for example, all records created on 27 uh, of, of July are not interesting any, of interest anymore. I only um, uh, would like to see data of the most recent changes in an email. Uh, what we can do is just loop uh, or take the base table and then have another action to also collect the vendor bank account details or from the SQL or from a data entity in finance operations using the finance operations connector. But actually you can also create a view already in the uh, bring your own database, which will then combine the data required for your flow, which is just having a minimum of inf information, the, the vendor account number, the bank account, and organization name, and some of the details, but also the synchronization start date time of the vendor again. Now I created one simple flow. Go back to my flows. The vendor change tracking and edit. I'm using some uh, variables. It will run daily at seven, but you can also set it for weekly. Uh, the days of history, it will look at the last four days, but you can also say, I want to have it for seven days. Um, and one example of, or just one variable to check if any record was found in the log or not. Um, if there's nothing, then we don't have to send any email. Um, there will be an, a log text. That one is used to collect data in a certain table, which will be included in the email. And we need to split the dates into a day, month, and year to be able to get the data um, as of a certain date. And actually, it's, it's looking at um, multiple different uh, settings to, to check for a certain date. It's not just greater than uh, a date of four days ago. It's just looking at or uh, the day is greater or equal, or the month is greater or equal, or the year is greater uh, than something. Um, and that's just something related to, to the way of, of getting the data um, out of the SQL database. So it will look at USMF data only, uh, sorted by a vendor organization name. And for each change found, uh, it will, first of all, say, I, I found one or more records. Otherwise, it, it remains false. And it will just include a certain text um, for each row, um, a table row, if which is HTML format, with the table data, all different columns with uh, values out of the SQL connector and the full details will be sent by an email in a certain HTML format showing some data having some um, table headers and then the full text which is linked here uh, just as part of the loop um, it will be appended and that will um, ensure an email will be sent, including all the details. I will run this one. And then in between, go to the emails. When I go to Outlook, I will show you one demo, which is already sent earlier today. What you can see is this is a demo email. You can create a certain HTML format with just any logo or text uh, demo email, and you will find the details sent uh, um, just collected over a period of time instead of just getting alert uh, per individual change. So we're almost at the end of the time for, for my presentations. Um, I would like to thank you for attending. I would like to tell more and more about all kinds of changes, difference, and, and tips and hints, but unfortunately, there's no time for it. If there are any 
questions, I would like to hear them. And if there's no time left for, for, for questions, then just also please reach out to me or on the Dynamics community and ask your questions and I would be happy to assist you. Hi, Henry. Um, thank you uh, for the great session. Uh, it was quite intense and a lot of information was there. Um, so I can see there are a couple of questions. If we can spare one more minute just to quickly ask. Uh, so the question is coming from Ratchet. Uh, and that is, uh, I think, about some rumor uh, on the FinOps uh, connector. They are going to be depreciated. Uh, so do you know anything more around it? And what's your thoughts on it at all? No, I, I don't think the, the, the finance operations connector will go anywhere. I think it will stay as is. Um, however, Microsoft is investing um, in getting data in um, or just connected with Dataverse as being a just a converted, just it, it, it looks like it is one. Um, as you can already work with virtual entities. Um, so I, I think there will be probably more ways to, to interact with the data in the future, um, but the finance operations connector will stay as is, as part of my information. Excellent. All right, okay, I got another question I think that's coming from the community again. Um, where we can find the list of all available Power Automate connector? Um, the list of all available connectors is available also on, on Flow, uh, or, or this on the Microsoft Power Automate website. If you go to the initial um, web page, there's an option to look at all the connectors. Uh, quickly, where is it? Uh, there are popular services, but you can also look at see all 507 services. And then you get a list of everything that is available to connect with. Yeah, even applications which I'm not aware of uh, uh, that they did exist or what they should do. Great. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I think these are all the questions at the moment. I can see a lot of appreciation. Um, people have. Uh, put it in the comments. So thanks for the great sessions. Thank you for your time. Uh, and uh, we look forward for having you again uh, in the upcoming sessions. I hand over it back to Kama. Okay. Yeah, once, That's great. Once, Thank you. Yeah, please, Andrew, please complete. Thank you so much. And uh, I just really want to say it like when I started my career, I was seeing your post on the community and I was very inspired by by those. And now, you know, I came to a point where we are hosting you in our community. So I think uh, I just want to thank you, you know, for all the work that you have done over the years for the community um, and thank you so much. Thank you and I will continue sharing. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so Atif, um, the next session that we have is actually a recorded session so unfortunately mm -hmm. you know with our uh, with our speaker there was some family emergency due to which mm -hmm. um they were not available on time uh live for this event mm -hmm. so what we want to do is we're gonna uh, play that session but uh, for the audience uh please uh, stay tuned because after this session we have a very great uh session coming up which is about the git and alm uh, from Nathan Klaus, like this will be yeah. after the session that we are just about to play. Um, and, you know, that session will be live. So Nathan uh, Klaus will be live with us. So, um, uh, sorry, Kamar, uh, what is this session we are going to play? It uh, is there any sort of an introduction if you can provide for the audience? Yes, so the session will be presented by our um, speaker, Sir Faraz. And Sir Faraz will be presenting on the custom business events creation in FinOps wow. via Power Automate. So uh, I'll just play. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks.
Hi guys, this is Safraz. Um, I hope that you guys are having quality sessions so far in, in, in this program with all the industry experts and uh, MEPs speaking up from this platform. I am really honored that I have been provided the opportunity to present from this platform. The moderators have really done a fabulous job. This uh, the event has been turned out to, to be a great success. So let me provide you an introduction for myself. I am currently positioned as a technical solution architect with Expels uh, Technologies Pakistan, and I have around good eight plus years of experience uh, working in dynamics uh, practice. Today I will be discussing about uh, business unit framework. What are the capabilities of the framework? How we can really uh, customize the framework and what things to be considered and what are the do's and don'ts of the framework. So let's start, let's start the session, let's dive in and uh, I would be stopping my camera feed at this point let, and we'll be sharing my screen to you guys. So I've really divided this uh, session into four parts. Firstly, I will be providing a generic overview of the framework. What are what are the capabilities of the business unit framework? Why it is here? When to use, when to utilize it? What type and what kind of business units are there in the framework? <laughs> in the second stage, we will discuss about how we can customize the framework and how we can write our custom events and. Uh, at the for that we will discuss a little bit about the endpoints. We can also customize the endpoint that we will discuss. After that, I will try to demonstrate you how we can consume the events uh, more precisely through Power Automate. So that will be a little demonstration. I will try to uh, send a sample email notification uh, by sending out a business event from an and operation. We will have a QA session uh, as usual. So let's let's see. So business unit provides actually a mechanism that lets external system receive notifications from finance and operation applications. Uh, in this way, the systems can perform business actions in response to the business events that are traced in the finance and operations. For example, hypothetically speaking, that uh, you are posting an invoice in finance and operation. And on, on each every successful invoice got posted in finance and operation, you want to raise an event and send it out to an external system so that then it can launch its own process. That process could be anything. That process could be a creation of a new business document or that process could be a, a launching a payment process, any kind of a business process that the external system will launch on behalf of the notification it will get received from the finance and operation. So that is actually the use case of the business human framework. This is why business human frameworks have been came into existence in the first place. So business uh, action that we will perform in a dynamic 65 that eventually raises a business event could be anything could be a workflow action or could be a, a non-workflow action approval of a purchase acquisition is an example of a workflow action whereas current information of a purchase order is an example of a non-workflow action so both type of actions can generate business events that external system can use integrating indications and notification scenarios there are quite a few types of business events in the session that I will discuss later. First, let's see what where we can find the business events in Dynamics CX app. So you can go at to the system administration module under setup, you will find two uh, two links. One is business event catalog, the other is business event framework. Before moving forward, let me actually show you guys what I'm trying to say. So here we, let's see. So if you go to the system administration module and 
here under setup, we can find business events catalog and business event parameter. Business events catalog form actually gives you a full list of business events currently available in the instance that you can figure out on based on the category, based on the name, business event ID. It has a few tabs, uh, for example, endpoint tabs. There you can see all the endpoints that you are attached to a particular business event. And you can see your active events. For example, in my case here, I have activated several most posted business events so that I can demonstrate you the notification scenario later on in the session. <clears throat> then you can see your errors and on the active event you can see if, if, if they've occurred any exception message that messages that you can find here so it's quite comprehensive in the catalog uh, catalog tab you can also view the payload <clears throat> that is part, being part of the uh, event that you have selected so there's a present all the information that the event would be passing out as part of the notification. You can also download the schema in JSON format that you, that you can consume in the consumer side that I will discuss later. So the other form that is uh, present for the business events is the parameters form where here you can set your defaults like how my MOI number of Time you want to retry a certain event if event if it gets failed, how would what could be the waiting time between each each recursive retry? Uh, how many endpoints are allowed per event? These all you can uh, do here in the parameters form. So coming back to the presentation. So there are quite a few types of business events present in the system. You can actually categorize it uh, in four different types. Uh, application business events, workflow events, alerts, based business events, and batch based business events. Application business events are merely uh, business events that are part of a certain process. For example, here I am showing you three business events that are part of code to cash process. Invoice created from a sales order is triggered when a user posts a sale or a sale order invoice. Free text invoice posted triggers when a user posts a free text invoice. Payment posted triggered when a user posts a payment. So these are all are part of the code to cash process. So application business events are those which are part of which are part of any particular business process. You can find full list on the documentation page, and you can also find it in the uh, business event catalog form. The other type of events that are available is workflow-based business events. So there, are, these are quite a few. Uh, these events will get fired uh, based on how you progress with your workflow. For example, uh, when you create a workflow, when a workflow is started. You can get, you can through the, uh, through the capability to raise a uh, business event that a workflow got started. Similarly, when your workflow gets completed, you can raise an event that workflow is completed. So this is called workflow type event. Similarly, you can raise an event when an individual element is started. For example, if there is a approval step in your workflow, so whenever that approval step is started, you can raise an event that okay that particular element has been started. Similarly, there are there is an event that you can raise on a completion of an uh, of an of an of an element that are called workflow element uh, based events. Then you can raise a workflow event when you have an external task is started. Similarly, you can raise an event when a work item is created for a user. So there are quite a few types of workflow business events are available. Uh, you can find a comprehensive list uh, in the uh, business events catalog form. The other type of uh, business events are batch based business events. These are uh, that caters your bad jobs. Like when, when you can raise an event when bad job is started, finished, failed, or cancelled. Purpose is to, these are. Uh, Actually, uh, you can use it to monitor and uh, identify your uh, jobs 
jobs like you can identify long running jobs these are there just for the administration purposes you can notify the administrator when a particular job is started or you can notify uh, admins when a particular job is finished or when a when a job is failing you may when, when somebody have canceled cancel a job so you can eventually uh, you can effectively monitor your uh, bad jobs through bad job based business units and you can notify you can send out emails and that are and these kind of uh, emails are quite useful uh, in the administration process but, and then there are alerts uh, you can also configure your alerts to raise business events uh, there are two kind of alerts chain based alerts and due date alerts both can be configured to send out uh, uh, event or, and uh, the process is fairly simple. You just need to check set alert with me uh, and set external APS to in order to enable a certain alert send a business event. Now let's uh, comes toward the basic idea, the basic uh, main idea of the session that is the customizing part. How you can really customize the business events and when you should consider to customize the business event. The first question that when you are going to customize it, when you are going to go to customize a business event, when you want to write a custom event, the first question to ask is what is a business event and what isn't a business event? Uh, in order to get an answer for this question, you must need to consider the intent. What is the intent behind capturing it? And business event. So the, so the intent should be very clear. If you have a clear intent only, then you would be able to translate that into a good working event. And then only then you would be able to design a good uh, sketch, a good approach for yourself. What is the reason for capturing the business event and how it would be used by the recipient? You need to have a very valid intent. What do I mean by valid intent? So now consider a scenario uh, of a valid intent. I want to capture packing slip posting business event. I, what I want to do, I want to raise a notification now from D365 whenever a packing slip is being posted by a user. Purpose is purpose is that I want to send that notification to an external system so that I can then create invoices or any other business documents or the payment process in that external system. So my purpose here is that I want to, to raise events on packing slip posting so that I can create a separate, I can launch a separate business process based on that events that, are, that is being generated for FinOps so that I can then launch a separate process in external system. So that is a very valid reason and, and, and a very valid intent. The intent should not be to transfer the data. For the data transfer scenarios, you already have port export to data management framework is there. Even with the business event framework, you must try to keep the payload as minimum as possible. And then if you require more fields to feed into the external system, you should be using the data uh, management framework in cohesion with the uh, business image framework to pull out the relevant fields from the DST5. So the payload should always be kept minimum. So that I will discuss later in the session. So once you have established a valid intent, then you then come the reality part you need to consider what would be the best approach to capture the business event what do i mean by approach it's like you have two kind of uh, captures available for the event framework you can raise the event from a business logic level and you can raise the event from the table level as well you need to determine what suits best in your scenario as a best practice, business logic level is always best to try to raise the event from, the, from there. I will discuss it further. So in order to determine a good approach, you need to consider uh, 
three things how durable durable is the event target how targeted it is and how noiseless it is what is meant by durability so the durability part comes into play you see if you are if you are confirming a purchase order and you are sending out a purchase confirmation didn't seem it out the reception experts accepts and must trust that the purchase order was really confirmed there shouldn't be any false positives because now your external system would be launching a whole business process of its own based on the event it received from the 365 finops so whatever that external system would be doing would be doing by trusting you the financial operation that it has sent out a very genuine and valid in this event like a purchase order confirmation if you are sending a purchase order confirmation even it was really really happened in in 65 so there shouldn't be any false positives then the even should be very targeted they shouldn't be any generic events so this so that the recipient do not have to filter out its particular use case and then it has so it so it don't it shouldn't be adding extra logic on the recipient side to filter out the actual uh, use case for itself so they must be designed to optimize the consumption it should be easy as easy as possible for the recipient to consume in this event therefore events must be as specific as possible and must be targeted to specific use cases as i said they must not be generic noiseless what do i mean by noiseless the design should include a little little very little effort to filter out noise Uh, the chosen approach must help guarantee that the business unit is implemented in code at a very specific point from where you do not have to write any additional logic to filter out the noise for example if you are uh, sending out a voice posting or tagging for posting the business unit you should raise that even from a very very specific point from where you are sure that the noise has been posted and and now you do not have to clear out extra you know uh, extra noise and you don't have to implement extra logic to just gain the payload context so the payload should be very clearly available to you at that point any additional logic that you mingle in 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 in, in at that point it would have performance impact and that is really not desirable this framework is 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 kind of a real time framework the recipient accept a real time notification so there is a chart that compares uh two captures uh, logic level capture and a table level capture both guarantees the durability power part because both occur in the transaction but at a business logic level uh at a it's, it's at a glass level that your actually business logic and business logic has been residing you can generate a very targeted business event and that is not true in case of the if you are uh writing at a lower level if you are writing at a table level or if you are overriding insert methods of the table to read that even it's um, it, it it wouldn't be very targeted a table can can have the insert of operations as part of the of too many of the business processes a single table could have so many business processes processes could have been uh, could have an insert operation into that table so then you have to implement an extra logic to just to clear out the noise and just to uh, just to get that relevant business operation and raise that event in, in that relevant uh, process is a bit of a hectic thing and it could also have a, a performance impacts similarly as i have discussed uh, it's easy to remain noiseless at the business logic level and that is not the case true at the table level one other thing is that at business logic level you can easily very easily uh, improve the quality of the payload and you can 
you can have access to the or you can you can easily uh, you can easily assure that you have uh, access to the all the payload fields and that is not the case at the, at the table level you may need to write extra logic and context to get the context of the of, of the payload so in the end uh, business event alert should be raised from the business logic level that is the best place uh, table level captures are not successful and you have to do a lot of extra work and it, it has its performance issues if you are doing at a table level <clears throat> how we can implement a business event now once you have established a genuine intent and then you have picked the right approach yourself the, the rest of the process is fairly simple you just need to build a contract you need to build an event itself and you need to find a good place to raise the event and the code so there are merely three artifacts involved two classes and one extension in this event class that extends the business event base class it supports constructing the business event building the payload and sending the business out in this event out the other class is business event contract that actually extends the business event contract class and it defines the payload of the business event and allows for population of the contract initial assumption of the contract at the runtime. So at this point, let me show you how you can implement a simple packing slip posting business event. So see, you see. Here I have uh, two classes, taking the posted business event, taking the posted business event contract, and I have a extension of sales, taking the general post class. So let's first dis discuss what the contract is all about. Uh, as I have told you, it's extending business event contract and it's just defining payload. So I have created the private variables to hold the state of sales ID, legal entity, and taking slip ID. So one other thing to consider at this point is that we, what we shouldn't be trying to do, we should be trying to do is to minimize the payload as possible as it could be. So what I would suggest uh, that only if you, if you are sending out, like in my case, if I'm sending out a packing slip hosting event and, uh, and I need to pass on the packing slip information to an external system, then so I just I should be just minimizing the payload to the, to the primary keys of the packing slip. Just only those fields I should be included, including into the payload from which I can clearly identify individual packing slip. The rest of the field, if they are required, then we can pull it up through data entities framework or the data import export framework easily. So here yeah, I have my constructor that is just returning me my object uh, new form it's just initializing me the contract for me and uh, returning it its object uh, contract object then here is the actual initialization method where i'm initializing sale id and picking slip id then i have a private void new method new constructor then i have these two cutter setter pump methods where I'm setting my table order ID, picking slip ID, and the legal entity. So these are all decorated by data member attribute and business human data member attribute. So the process is fairly simple. Uh, there are no additional complexities involved. Now, I, now let's look at the business event class. So the class itself is decorated by business events attribute where I have defined the contract and these two things are actually labels. This sets the name and the other label is sets the description in the that would be shown in the in this even catalog form. So as I've told you, it's uh, just extending in this even base class. Um, at the palm method that is just returning me custom Taking the juror instance, then I have a constructor which is running static constructor which is returning me a business event contract object, business event object. Then I have a new method that 
just gonna be called from the static method itself. Then I have a method that is building the contract for me and building the payload for me. It is decorated by replicable true and replaceable true just to uh, provide the extension extensibility support if I want to extend it in the future. So once I have uh, constructed and developed these two classes, then I need to find a very good place to insert, to raise my event from, from where I'm, I'm actually sending the event out, the you know, notification out. So in my case, I've extended the sales and the general post class. Uh, there is the end post method available as the name suggested here, the post has been ending. So after the system logic has been called, I'm just sending out my Event out that okay, uh, invoice has been posted, and here I have. And yes, you can already see that at this point, I, I have the all the information of the payload is available to me. I do not have to write extra code to gain context into the payload. And that is not the same. If I would be writing it at, at, at any table level, then I would have to ensure that I would be sending it out. And the invoice is actually, uh, and the packing slip is actually posted, and then I, I may need to do extra work to get the context of the payload. But here is not the case. I have simply passed the class packing slip to our object, which was already available as part uh, of the uh, of the class, and I have just passed it to my method where it is getting initialized. So when I will build this. After successfully building this, I can clearly see here that I have an, have created a new business event. Its name is packing slip posted business event. And here you can find okay, okay. Yeah, so here the description is the event this event is triggered when I use the process or packing slip as part of the code to cache process. And these are the two fields, three fields that I have made part of the payload. The rest of them are the standard that will be part of each and every event that you will create. So unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to consume this particular, particular event for the demonstration later in the session because I have subscription issues. What I would be doing, I would be utilizing other sales order event that is invoice posting event in order to generate a sample email when the voice has been posted into the system. So let's uh, carry on with the, with the slides. So as I mentioned, a code to send in this event should be added at, at, at a very specific and appropriate point from where you can get full context of the payload and where you are sure that the process has been ending, process has been ended. All those documents that extend source document are a common point for trading and sending up in the sequence. To take advantage of this capability, you can uh, create an, you can implement an extension of the source document straight in process or get business even method and create and return the correct document based extension type. Similarly, other framework also provide common point for sending with this event. For example, class when voucher class is a post method for that you can utilize to send out business events related to the posting of posting customer or vendors voucher. Uh, since uh, the thing is linked to the commit of the uh, underlying transaction, so if the transaction is reported, or for example, if you are in my uh, posting an invoice and you, you incur some kind of an error, so then this event won't be sent out that ensured the integrity of the the framework that ensure the integrity like I have talked earlier in my session about the durability part. So that would ensure the durability if you are assigning or sending out to the same appropriate place in the transaction. So it, it, it ensures itself that uh, uh, that it is not being sending out if you have incurred some kind of an error. So, Now let's uh, move towards the endpoints a little bit uh, 
of a discussion which we should be doing on the endpoints at this point. So there are quite a few endpoints available, and then you can add your custom endpoints to the mix as well. So all the Azure messaging services are available as an endpoint, and HTTPS and Microsoft Power Automate is also available as an endpoint. In some scenarios, you might require to attach uh, multiple endpoints to a single business human, and that is possible. That could be done uh, for organized distribution of business humans to the consumers. So that is possible, possible, and can be done. For all those endpoints that are in Azure, uh, that must reside in the customer's Azure subscription and it will incur cost. So that is something to be considered. So if you are, or if you want to customize any given endpoint, the process is fairly simple. There is a, uh, you know, available business event endpoint. The first step, you need to add a custom uh, enumeration into the, you know, and after that, you need to create a separate table for your endpoint. And then you need to extend that by business event endpoint table uh, with the inheritance property being marked as yes and extend property being marked to business event endpoint. After these two steps, you need to add a new adopter class, implement the I business event endpoint interface that must implement the I business events endpoint. It also be decorated with business events endpoint attribute. So you can find the relevant uh, uh, code snippet into the documentation, the helper documentation that is available in, in as part of Microsoft uh, documentation. I've also attached the links at the end of the slides. So once you have created the interface class, you, you can easily extend the endpoint configuration form to add in your custom field and your custom endpoints. So that is uh, fairly simple and doable. Uh, these are the sources and references from which I've extracted information for this, uh, uh, this session. Uh, at this point, let me show you guys how we can actually consume a business human. So what I've been gonna doing is I will try to raise a simple sales invoice posting event. So here I have written a custom uh, flow or automatic flow. So what I, has, I have done, I have added a, when a business event occurs trigger. Let me show you how that works really. That is the con trigger control that I have added. It provides you a set of fields that you can choose from. So I've selected my instance that from which I want to capture the event. Then I've selected the event category. Then I've selected the actual event with which I'm, I'm, I want to work. Then the legal entity. If, if I keep this field empty, I would be uh, consuming events from every legal entity that is present in the in the instance, but for the in my case, I was just interested in the SMF legal entity. Then I added a path JS JSON console. Remember that I have told you earlier about this this thing download the schema. From here, you can get the JSON schema for all the payloads that is available. So that I can simply download and then I can copy and paste into this control, and this will actually providing the values and context for the payload. After that, I can, uh, what I've done, I've written a condition. If your watch is not equal to null, then just shoot me an email. 
once I've completed this flow, uh, I am now able to consume the business human from finance and operation apps. And at this point, it has already created an endpoint for me and it's marked the business human has activated. This is the endpoint that it has created. This is the URL for the Power Automate. And you can see here, this is the active event that is attached to this endpoint. You can also see it in the active events tab. So let's try invoice a sale order. I don't know why I'm not able to see my emails. So let's see if we can successfully raise a notification email for ourselves. Let me pick up something sweet. So let's see if I can invoice this sale order. Okay. So you see, I have got into some error. So at this point, it shouldn't be raising any kind of an event for me. And uh, fortunately, it haven't did that. It haven't raised any event. Yeah, I haven't got any event. So let's try to pick up any other record that we can invoice. Okay, this is empty. I need to get something that would work for my scenario. Okay, let's try with this one. Ah, uh, I believe I do not have sufficient inventory available. Okay, let's see what it is saying. So what I wanted to do with this is I wanted to add the dimension, location dimension. Okay, save it. Okay. Okay, this is something coming up straight from the load, so I must be collecting some other field order that I can invoice. So let's see if I can pick something else for myself. Let's try to go with the delivered ones.
There's only one player left, and I did not. I'm for the noise. It will take some time. Already in Nova is a lot of these while testing out. No way. Let's try with this one. Really should work. I hope it should work. I'm really out of luck with this. Okay, okay, I'll reduce the quantity. So 25 for them to very well. What I can do, I can it. Yeah, I'll do that, do that. Let's see if I can watch it now. Oh, so just seeing it tomorrow. Let's see. I hope that it will work this time and I will be able to show what I want to show you guys. Ah, thank God. So finally, I was able to pull the invoice and I believe at this point, uh, I would must have an event with me and here it is. So we have generated a uh, sweet little modification new notification via business event, event framework and uh, that's it guys that's it uh, i believe that this session was useful to guys useful to you guys and uh, you have uh, always been able to add in to your learning uh, marathon that you are having uh, in the, this boot camp. Uh, thank you very much. Keep learning, keep exploring, and keep your spirits high. You'll be hearing me now. Yes, thank you. you know, so I thought you were just. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a hint that we are moving towards the last sessions of the day. And, you know, <laughs> the day is getting bigger on us. But I, I am very excited that we have a very good speaker waiting for us in the lobby. Um, uh, our, our very great, um, you know, Nathan Klaus. And I think you, uh, you already know him. And he will be you know, presenting about uh, Git and ALM. Uh, so let me just add Nathan. Hey Nathan, how are hey, you how doing? Are you? Hi Nathan. Good. Hello. All right. Okay. So great to have you, Nathan. Um, again, another exciting topic uh, from the today's uh, list of many other sessions we have gone through. Um, so you are going to talk about the how to do the better code management using Git. 
and more respect on the ALM side. I'm sure uh, it, it will be very valuable to a lot of technical people uh, listening to you today. So I will hand over the stage to you and yeah, uh, crack on. All the best. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So just one moment when I get PowerPoint all squared away. Okay. So hello, uh, welcome. Um, my name is uh, Nathan Klaus. Um, I'm a technical architect with Invista Corporation here in the USA, uh, headquartered in Carmel, Indiana. I'm a business applications MVP, um, and I've been working with AX um, for 12 years, give or take. Um, and I really specialize in uh, various integration technologies around FNO, uh, not so much FNO, just FNO anymore. Um, and I'm really passionate about application delivery, code management, um, you know, handling um, complex uh, modifications, um, sort of all, all around that stuff. Um, and also I write on various topics at my blog at atomicax.com. Um, my email um, is right there on screen and my uh, Twitter handle if you'd like to get a hold of me. Um, so let's go ahead and um, dive right in. So this will be uh, Dynamics uh, 365 Finance and Operations, Git and ALM, how to deliver more faster. Um, sort of before we get started, I'll reference a lot of other people's materials. Um, I'll include, I've got three slides at the end with all references um, to everything uh, that I, I've talked about with more technical details if you really want to get in and, and do it yourself. If not, uh, we're going to talk about a lot of different topics, but um, I just didn't simply didn't have time to dig into all the technical details I'd like to. So, uh, but others have written about it um, for me, so I, you know, we can we can certainly use that. Uh, but we'll be talking about you know what is source control, sort of philosophically, uh, hop into some Azure DevOps basics, um, how to get started with Git, um, some of the automation and action available options related to Git. Um, you know, as well as uh, YAML, um, ATL, um, SysTest, um, if you're unfamiliar with those frameworks. And then at the end, we'll have um, a QA. and a um, So first, you know, let's sort of just dive into, you know, what is source control? So if you are, have been with AX since it was, it's been called AX now, now you know, finance and operations. Um, when you think of source control, you, you typically think, oh, it just tracks and manages my code. That's all it really does. It might do some other stuff for my functional consultants um, or my solution architects or my end users. Um, and really, we have two options in FNO uh, for source control. That's TFEC, commonly known as just TFS, um, or Git. And Git is available via GitHub, um, Azure DevOps, um, and GitLab, if, if, if you're familiar with GitLab. Um, but ever since um, we've Microsoft has really started investing heavily in uh, FNO, um, we've had sort of a shift in how we manage stuff and manage our, you know, just manage our work because we're not just delivering software. This isn't just software development where we write a bunch of code and it just goes out the door and we never hear about it ever again. Um, and again, this isn't either soft. This isn't software delivery either because FNO is very complex and integrates with a lot of other things. Um, so we have to sort of make the transition away from just the software development lifecycle to the application development lifecycle. So we're delivering an application and a solution, not just throwing code out there and, and hope it works. Um, so we sort of have to make this, this transition from just you know code management uh, to what source control really can do for us in FNO, and that's manage plan, create, verify, package, secure, release, configure, monitor, and protect our application. So current state, uh, we cannot do all of those inside um, Azure DevOps. Uh, some of that is handled by LCS. There are APIs available inside LCS to do some of that stuff for us, but we're still interacting with LCS. We can't directly, like, we can't directly deploy um, a production environment from a build pipeline in Azure DevOps like you might be able to do with like a C-sharp web app or something along those lines. But the story around this is, has gotten uh, much more um, I guess more, more robust, we have a lot more features and we sort of need to play catch up and start using some of those features uh, for, for our end users. 
Um, so when we're talking about TFVC as our source control system, um, I, 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 this is a very watered down slide. Uh, I, I, I'm not a fan of TS, TFVC, um, but the one, the one here thing I hear when I say, hey, let's start using Git, um, is people say, well, TFVC is supported by Microsoft. Yes, it's technically true. Microsoft will support TFVC in that it's a product that they make and still provide support for. That doesn't necessarily translate to they will provide support for your finance and operations implementation if you're having issues with TFVC. They verify the product works and doesn't have any bugs. They don't necessarily provide support specifically on how you've implemented it. Um, so that's, um, yes, it's it's supported, but um, it's more of a like technical bullet point than, than anything else. Um, <clears throat> Next, it's push-based, so you have to manage all of your change sets. If you've got a large team, um, let's say 20 developers on one project, um, you've basically made a new job where it's one person's job to manage all of those different pushes and make sure they go to the different environments um, from all your different developers all at one time, which can be a full-time job, sometimes even more than a full-time job. Um, next, branches last forever. Um, when you set up a branch, it's either you need it or you don't, and typically you need it and just keep it around, um, especially in NAX 2012. Um, and that makes these branches monolithic, which you just sort of drag these things around um, and have to keep maintaining them, even though they may not be doing anything for you. It just it's part of your maintenance plan to make sure everyone's up to date, um, which you know sometimes it's just work for the sake of work. It doesn't really get you. Um, next, when talking about Git, um, you know, the main pushback I hear is, well, Git isn't supported. Well, y yes, it, it's technically not supported in finance and operations by Microsoft, uh, but Microsoft uses it internally. They've, they've gone on record as saying that. Um, and I, I think if it's good enough for them, it can be good enough for us. Um, you know, and Git is just more of a modern um, version system. Um, you know, it just sort of keeps track. Uh, you know, it's, it's if you're, if you're a C sharp person, you you probably used Git. Um, you know, if you're making the transition from C sharp to X plus plus, or maybe you're going to do both, um, that can be a, a challenge for some people just to wrap their head around how TFVC works because it can be a little bit goofy at times. Um, Git is pull based, so that means we create a workspace for you. You do your work, and then we pull all your work in. We don't have to manage individual change sets. Um, and either your work is taken as is, or we provide feedback, you make some alterations, and we try again. Um, and branches are short-lived. Uh, so, you know, we'll get a requirement. Let's say we need a new data entity. Um, we'll make a new branch for that data entity development. You work on it for four hours. You say, yep, I'm done. Here's my, you know, here's my code. Here's my pull request. A more senior resource reviews it and says, yeah, looks good. We'll take it. Um, it goes into the main branch, and then it goes up, you know, it ships with the next release whenever that next release is. Um, so for me, that story is just more um, more natural for the way that we implement and develop um, software, either whether it's um, implementation or even just you know go you know after go live support or continued enhancement um, for your end users' needs. Um, this is an example of a you know typical TFEC um, branch structure inside AX2012. Um, so here I'm developer one, you know, I've, I've committed a change and uh, now I need to merge that change, that single change set up to dev release for whatever this might have been. Um, you know, I, I have to uh, manually merge it here and then here and then here. And let's say no bugs were found. It worked great. You know, it gets released to production. Um, or, sorry, it gets deployed to production. Uh, but that's sort of I'm half done at this point because I've got to move manually merge that back to all my other developer branches, so all my other developers get the same thing that I just did, um, which it's it's not a it's it's a small thing when you're looking at a single chain set, but if you've got 50 chain sets in a day, um, you know your work quickly adds up um, for all this just code maintenance to make sure everyone's running on the same version. Um, next, you know this is what you might see um, in uh, TFEC uh, with FNO. Um, it's less complicated, but you still sort of have a similar problem where I might write something down here in um, the dev branch. It needs to be manually merged up to trunk, merged up to release, and then uh, deployed. And when you look at the, the TFVC conceptual diagram from Microsoft, you can sort of see the issue that I'm getting at um, in that um, 
when you've got your main branch, so it goes all the way along the top, and if you look at the arrows pointing off to the right-hand side of the slide, um, that means that that branch goes on forever, which is what you would expect from a main branch. Uh, but then when you get into servicing and hot fix and release, um, you can see I've got four branches that do basically one thing, and I've got to maintain four things to get my one thing, which is my release. All I care about is my release. Um, and that can just become a lot of extra work that doesn't really get you any value. Um, next, if you look at um, the Git sort of conceptual um, diagram from Microsoft, you can sort of see along the top, we've got our um, topics. Um, a topic can be whatever you want it to be. It can be a single requirement. It can be a set of requirements. It can be a hot fix. It can be a bug. Um, you sort of define what that topic is. Um, and you're sort of incentivized to keep that topic small because you create a workspace for that topic, which is a branch. Um, you assign work for that branch, say, hey, you know, I need to do data entity that does X, Y, and Z. Um, Someone works on that, they deliver your data entity, and then it goes back into your main branch or master branch, the green line in the uh, in the middle. Um, and then when the next release comes out, it just ships with the next release. Um, so it's really, you know, small change sets that amount to, um, you know, minor features or bug fixes here or there that amount to when you actually get to your release. Let's say you release bi-weekly. Um, a lot of different things can go in there. You're delivering stuff a whole lot faster than um, you know, typical waterfall SDLC where um, you gather requirements, a bunch of stuff happens over a year's amount of, you know, worth of time, and then here's your solution. Um, but real quick, I don't want anyone to think I'm just sort of, um, you know, trashing uh, TFEC. Uh, TFEC has a lot of cool features that I don't see get used a lot. Um, so if you're interested in uh, taking TFEC sort of the next level, um, I've included some things you'll want to check out, which are self shelf sets, uh, gated check-ins, um, and policies, along with some links for um, you know, how I typically would set up my projects um, and just some of the benefits that you get from those. <clears throat> um, but Git also has you know, a lot of good things with it as well. Um, so Git will allow you to um, source control a single folder. That means you have to move your projects into um, you know, that, that folder that you have under source control. Um, so you can do that per package um, inside your lo uh, local packages directory, or you can just do it over an entire um, local package directory instance. Um, really just however you want to work, however you want to manage your projects. If you want to have your projects be package-based, that's fine. If you want it to be instance-based, that's fine too. Um, Additionally, you can work offline with Git, so you don't have to have an active internet connection um, in order to continue to work. Um, now, I don't think that's um, such an issue, uh, but when Git came, you know, was, was coming around and sort of growing up, um, that, that was. Um, but again, you know, if you're on a, a flight and you want to, you know, you, you have a VHD that you can use, you can um, work, get stuff done, commit it, and then when you land and have internet, you sync all those changes back up. Um, and you know, Git doesn't really care how or when you did it. Just you know, the the central uh, remote server um, gets those changes and it just accepts them and, and records them on your work items. Um, next, the the sort of fundamental change is this branching uh, per item or per uh, requirement. Um, so we don't have to manage change sets anymore. We're managing branches. Uh, that comes with both a positive and a negative. Um, when we're managing uh, just a branch, everything inside of that branch gets taken when we when we pull it. Um, but that means anything in there, if there's something that you didn't want to include, it's coming with anyways. Um, so you got to sort of pay attention to that and plan ahead. Um, you know, conversely, you know, if let's say you have a requirement that took five change sets, um, I don't have to merge five change sets like I would in, in TFBC. I just say, all right, well, here's your branch with one or more um, commits in it, I'm going to take the whole thing. Um, just as part of the um, basic life cycle of changes inside Git, we get automatic reviews. Um, and those are handled by pull requests. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, but when you create a pull request, you say, hey, my code is, is done. It's ready to be checked in. Um, and it would go to someone to review it to accept that pull request. Um, that may be a more senior resource or just another developer who didn't um, 
develop the code just to uh, make sure no one is being a bad actor in any way. Uh, but here's where we get into why I think Git is better. You know, it's more modern. Um, it matches how things work in the real world. So, you know, you typically don't get a change that says, I want this massive sweeping, you know, set of changes across my entire FNO instance. It's, I want this report to look like this. I want to add three fields to my customers. Um, I want to have a data entity that does this. Um, or this data entity doesn't work the way I want. I want it to do these other things. Um, and those are individual requirements that we can make a branch for. Um, and then potentially, if we have developers available for each one of those changes, they get their own branch. They do all their work. Um, and in a week, we've delivered five things rather than TFPC, where we might um, sort of stagger them one after the other. Um, so it's more, more quote unquote, agile. And really, just for me, meeting requirements one at a time is, is, is really important. Um, this opens up more tools, um, automations, and actions that are available um, inside, you know, inside Azure DevOps. <clears throat> so when we convert to Git, um, really quickly, um, if you're using TFCC and you want to switch, um, it's really simple. Create a new Git repo inside Azure DevOps. Make a new branch. Copy your code over. Add a .git ignore file. Relook at your Visual um, Studio projects and do some basic cleanup with a pull request. Delete the old branch and then you lock TFCC. Um, and if you're interested in more um, detail on that, um, I wrote an article on that whole process and actually moved some code from a private DevOps repo into GitHub, um, which is now free and open source. Um, so you can check out what that looks like as well. Um, when converting to Git, you sort of have to convert your brain to Git as well um, because we're, we're not doing change sets anymore. We're doing branches, so everything that happens in there goes along for the ride whether or not you want it to. So you just have to change how you work, change how you think, plan ahead. Um, and it's just sort of the cheesy one-liner here. You know, we're, we're pulling together rather than pushing along. Um, so when to, looking at when to commit, you know, what, as a developer, what, what would my experience be like? Um, you know, we've got this uh, new requirement called the requirement one. So my tech lead or my tech arc will create a branch for me to work on requirement one. Um, I can go ahead and commit as many times as I'd like. Um, those are the green arrows. Um, and then once I'm done, I say, hey, I'm done. We can create a pull request, and then we'll go back up into main. Um, and then we can get rid of the requirement one branch. Um, some of the more um, complex examples of a branching strategy um, is this one right here. Um, so I source this from a post on nvie.com. Um, but you can see you can sort of do, I don't want to say you can do whatever you want, but you can get more complex with how you manage your branches and how those interact with your master and release branches. Um, so it's it's much more flexible than, than TFBC. And since we're managing uh, branches, we don't have to worry about chain sets anymore. We can do a whole lot more, more stuff because we don't have to manage, you know, individual grains of sand uh, which would be our change sets. We're just managing, you know, entire sandcastles and moving those around, uh, which would be our um, Git um, branches. So real quickly, you know, what is a pull request? Um, a pull request just says, you know, when you've got a branch, so just lets everyone know you you basically you think you've done your work. Um, you want to discuss and review any potential changes, um, and then have that be accept, accepted into the branch you're you're pulling it to. Um, when to create a pull request, um, you know, obviously when development is done, um, ideally when your test cases are created and it's been tested, um, you know, that's, that, that can be difficult. Um, if you're a, a, a consultant and users typically don't want to play, pay for that, um, that additional cost of um, your test case development, but the way that Microsoft is now shipping FNO with uh, 10 updates a year, um, it's making a whole lot more sense to do that because we can just run automated testing when a new version comes out and say, yeah, here's here's what this looks like. Everything passed, you know, we're, we're fairly comfortable. Everything will work when we get to 10.0.21 or 10.0.22, whatever the case may be. Um, but still, you know, that that's that still can be a hard sell to get um, budget or time to do that. Um, but it will start paying off um, and it has paid off for some of my clients. You know, real quick, uh, how to create a Pull request. Um, this is one of the things I just wanted to highlight, just how much more friendly um, Git is relative to um, TFBC. 
Um, you can create a pull request inside Visual Studio, DevOps, GitHub, GitHub or GitLab um, just by in Visual Studio. Just there's a button, new pull request. Um, inside um, Azure DevOps, this is inside a web browser. I can do this inside a web browser. I don't even need Visual Studio, uh, which can make um, managing some of this stuff um, a little bit easier. Um, if you only have Visual Studio installed on, let's say, development um, VM out in the cloud, it's off, and you just need to quickly create a pull request, you can do it via the web. Um, so just much more flexible um, and, and lightweight so we can get more done. Um, <clears throat> what this, what pull requests allow you to do is um, add in um, some additional actions or changes or automations around whatever it is you're pulling. So you can pull, um, you can do a build as part of a pull request before it gets to a review. So what that means is, um, let's say I have a developer who developed, uh, let's say a new table and form um, and a data entity that, that goes along with that. Um, let's say they forgot their staging table for their data entity. Uh, when they committed everything and they could do a pull request, they would build that and say, hey, we're missing, you know, missing these artifacts, so I can't complete a build. Cancel the build request, you know, have it go provide that feedback back to the original developer and say, this failed to compile check. You need to, you know, resolve these issues. Um, you can also have um, automated testing um, and builds included in that as part of that pull request. Um, and what this opens up is the idea of what I call the quality bar. So um, what, what state is the code that you're accepting as part of that pull request or reviewing? Um, is it if? Does it just compile? Which is obviously good. We, we need our code, code to compile. Um, but does it compile and pass unit tests? Or, you know, as well, does it pass AC, ATL tests as well? So we can get into a real high degree of code um, quality code delivery just by adding in some additional testing. And this all happens before um, a more senior resource would review it. So let's say I'm a developer, I make some changes, I you know build, I commit it, that would kick off um, some style of uh, you know quality bar checks, whatever you know we want to have configured here. I do a pull request and that ha uh, activates even more stringent quality bar tests to make sure what it is that I'm delivering won't break anything. And really what that looks like, um, again, we're back to requirement one. Um, you know, I've got my commits here. Um, and on this particular branch, I've enabled continuous integration. So every time I do a commit, um, behind the scenes, it'll kick off a build um, and do just a, a code compile check. You know, it'll just compile my code to make sure I'm committing all the uh, artifacts that I need to. Um, and it'll send me an email with a report of, you know, here's your build report. It failed because, you know, you forgot your staging table or it built successfully, nothing really to report. Um, and once we've done that, we can create a pull request. And then as part of our pull request, we can add in um, all sorts of various automations and, and um, just tests to make sure that um, what is being included in the pull request meets a certain quality bar. And you can define what that quality bar is. So real quickly, um, when you're when you've got a, a pipeline, you can turn on continuous integration in any pipeline. It doesn't have to be Git or TFVC. It can be any pipeline. Um, so you can go to triggers, um, select the schedule, um, and then filter on the branch if you want this to be branch specific. Uh, but check that um, enable continuous integration checkbox. Um, and anytime there's a commit against that specific branch, it'll kick off a build and let you know. Um, what happened. Um, an example of a pull request, so I'll, I'll speed through this um, fairly quickly. You know, I'm, in, I'm um, pulling feature one into main. Um, you can see here at the green arrow, I've got an X++ class um, build pipeline uh, queued. So right now, I'm just waiting for the result of that, that build. Um, I've got three other or three total checks um, on this pull request currently. Um, it automatically merged all my code for me, which is nice. Um, if it couldn't do that, you know, we'll review what that would look like. Um, you can see I've got my linked worked items at the, at the red arrow in the bottom right. Um, and right now, this is not assigned to a reviewer because we haven't um, made it past our quality bar checks to make sure 
this merges, this this compiles, this passes, you know, X, Y, and Z tests. Um, this particular build pipeline I set up with, it has to pass a build um, in order to be um, considered for a pull request. Um, it has to have work items associated with the um, commits. Um, and additionally, this is just an optional one. Uh, code coverage, uh, the code coverage result from my classic pipeline um, is checked here as well. Um, so this is, next we'll cover an example of just what a merge conflict would look like and what the experience would be. Um, so, you know, I'm committing feature two. Um, I'm pulling that from feature two branch into main branch. Um, I do have um, a required check that was successful. I do have work items linked. Uh, but if you look down here, I've got some merge conflicts. Um, and now I'm going to have to manually resolve those merge conflicts. Um, I do this by clicking on the conflicts tab, but I just wanted to call out um, the reviewer is now assigned to me. I, in this instance, I'm, I'm the only user, so I had to go back to me. Uh, but it would go to um, either the developer who created the merge conflicts or a more senior resource to resolve those merge conflicts. Uh, but we failed some tests. We can see what those tests were, and now it's going to a senior resource uh, to review disposition, disposition and append, potentially send it back to the original developer. Um, so, you know, real quickly, um, if you're familiar with um, uh, this sort of looks like an upgraded version of what you'd get in Visual Studio. But you can see I've got my conflicts on the left, um, my specific um, errors down along the bottom with the green arrows, um, and then I can take uh, left uh, or keep target. I can also do a manual merge as well. Um, but you can sort of see feature one and feature two. Um, it's just an info log in, um, a main method on runnable class one um, are incompatible. So when I look at the um, sort of the workflow for this, um, I've got my requirement to commits with my continuous integration uh, builds. I've got my pull request. And now I've got a conflict. So I've got to decide what I'm going to do here. Um, and this all happens prior to making to the main branch. So uh, yes, we have some issues, but they're being created and called out before they make it into our main branch. Um, so no end user would potentially see this and it's sort of kept on the back end for us to resolve um, rather than have it be visible uh, by an end user. Uh, so next, uh, when, when talking about different branches, um, you can talk about new and sort of different ways to manage your resources. So let's say I've got two developers um, and I need to deliver what's on my screen in a particular uh, time frame. Um, so time is just an arrow that's pointing to the right along the bottom. Um, I could have developer one work on the items in the boxes in blue. And you can see they don't overlap. So I you know, make a branch for requirement three. They commit it. I create another branch for bug one, and they commit that. Um, and it gets pulled and accepted. Um, and then you know, the items in the green box, that could be another developer uh, working on other things. Um, but you can still see you know, a branch per requirement. Um, those are typically short-lived. And then we pull it up into the, the main branch um, and just sort of carry on. Um, additionally, you can um, have one developer flip between branches. This gets into some more technical um, considerations because X plus plus doesn't exactly like the way that um, Git manages stuff. So you might have multiple versions. So you'll have to use multiple versions of files related to different branches. So you have to use same links. Um, there's a link at the end where we discuss how to manage that. Um, but just, just call that out. But really, you want to try and keep it one requirement per developer per amount of time. And then when they finish that, they move on to the next thing. If there's a bug in the original, um, you know, like let's say there's a bug in requirement one, um, we can just make a new branch to resolve that bug in requirement one. It doesn't necessarily have to go back to the original developer. So it um, allows you to, you know, play, um, you know, mix and match with developers and bugs and just deliver more faster. Um, Next, we're going to talk about YAML. So this is a high-level um, slide. Uh, YAML is really cool. Um, so it's a human readable data serialization engine. Uh, what it means is you can use this to build a pipeline, uh, whether it's a uh, build pipeline or a release pipeline. You can add it to source control. 
And then you can tell DevOps to say, hey, I want to build a pipeline from this artifact and source control so you can create uh, your pipelines on demand. So you can basically create them once and recycle them throughout all of your different branches. Um, and you don't have to keep on building new pipelines. Like for TFBC, you build your uh, like pipeline for dev, you build your pipeline for, let's say, trunk or main, um, and then your pipeline for um, release. So you can just add it once to source control, and then it'll just recycle it and um, use it as many times as you'd like. Um, so next, we sort of briefly touched on testing. Um, and I wanted to run through um, the two types of testing systems that we'll be using when working with X++. Um, and that is SysTest and ATL, or the Acceptance Test Library. Um, you know, SysTest is automatically discoverable. It's already built into the template. Um, you just have to tell it which DLL to use. Um, and SysTest is based for unit, um, best used for unit tests. I'm um, going to work through a couple examples. I'm um, similar with ATL. Um, it's just more component or uh, simple integration testing. Um, and we're going to review those real quick. Um, so first, you know, this is what an example of a SysTest uh, class would look like. This is pulled right from Microsoft Docs. Um, along the top, we have a class called FM Unit Test Sample, which extends this test case. Um, this is an example of a method um, that uh, runs a test. And at the very end, you can see this, you know, we have this dot assert equals. I um, mean, the expected total should match um, the actual total ref, you know, calculated in this. Um, and if it does, then that test passes, otherwise it fails. Um, and similarly, you know, this is a more relatable test. Uh, we're doing a um, validate field um, on a car class um, based on the number of doors. So, you know, can a car have negative one doors? No, we would ex expect that test to fail by design. Um, but then can a car have four doors? Yes, it can. That, that should be a passing test. <clears throat> um, so next, this is what ETL would look like. And ETL is very powerful. Um, and very easy to work with, sort of once you wrap your head around um, the, the fluent um, model of how, how it works. Um, so real quick, um, this is again pulled from Microsoft Docs, so you can go check this out. There's a link um, at the end of the presentation for how to, where to find this. Um, <clears throat> we have um, in the blue box, you know, we basically set up our tests. We create, we get a default warehouse based on the company we're in. I will create an, a new item. Um, based on the warehouse that we're in. Uh, we adjust the inventory for that item to be 100 in our default warehouse. Um, next, we create a sales order. Next, we add a sales line to our sales order. We set the item on that, and we set that item to have a uh, sales quantity of 10. Um, next, we uh, reserve three against that sales line that we just created. Um, And then finally, you know, we'll um, take a look at um, what the result of all of that was. So we should have a negative seven with an on order because we have to flip the sign, um, and then negative three with a status um, of reserved physical. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. <clears throat> this kind of stuff in 2012 specifically was unimaginable. To create a um, item, you know, find a default warehouse, create an item, adjust it in create a sales order, create a sales line, reserve on that sales line, and then check the values. Um, that I mean, I, I can't think of a way that you could do that in 2012 uh, without at least 200 lines of code. Um, and here we, we're doing it. I mean, we almost have as many comments um, as we do lines of code here. So ETL is super powerful for when you need to generate test data um, and build stuff in a known state and then test against that known state. <coughs> Um, so next, uh, when talking about tests, um, we have different pipelines available for builds, and that limits limits how we can use those tests. Um, so like if you're using the serverless builds, which is the free option for Microsoft, um, that will do a simple build. Um, it's Azure hosted. Uh, but all it will do is a build. It won't do anything, any of the more complicated tasks, like uh, do a database sync to make sure people aren't changing data types um, on your tables which can happen. It happens maybe once a year for me. Um, but you know, it, it catches it, and then we resolve it. Um, you know, so the serverless builds cannot do unit tests um, or ATL tests. Um, 
as well. But when you get into a dedicated build server, it doesn't necessarily have to be hosted in Azure. There, there are other options. Um, when looking at the infrastructure side with Azure hosted, um, that's all orchestrated through Azure DevOps um, with uh, pipelines. You don't have to do anything. You just have to configure it and basically tell it what to install, how to do the build, do the build, and then you review the result. Um, if you'd like to do a cloud-hosted environment, that's provisioned uh, by LCS, hosted in your Azure, um, and then there's a build agent from Azure DevOps installed on it, and it just does whatever Azure DevOps asks it to do, uh, which could be a simple build, a database sync, um, running sys tests, unit tests, restoring databases. It can do all sorts of things. Um, and the third option um, is really either on-premise or other. Um, so you can modify the VHD from Microsoft um, to build your own virtual machine. Um, you can host it wherever you would like, um, and you can do these builds on demand. Um, so it could be in Azure, it could be on-prem. Uh, it's really up to you. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about um, setting up a um, build pipeline where we dynamically create a, a machine, a VM to uh, do your builds, whether whatever that build may be, um, check out Andrea's article right there. Uh, when looking at test classifications, um, there are two that we're most interested in really on the tech side, um, and that's because we have to write code for them to work, and that is uh, SysTest um, and ATL, uh, the numbers one and two there. So you can sort of see what their quote unquote sweet spot is um, and how we'd want to use them. So when we're writing code, those are the kind of things that we could test. Uh, but then if we need to start getting into more um, functional or user-based testing, we would want to use RSAT. RSAT is a huge topic, which I'd love to talk about, uh, but I think I need a whole day to cover everything. Um, but you can sort of see, based on um, the developer-focused um, testing, I'm sorry, focused test types and the user test types, we have pretty good coverage across that whole pyramid um, for what it is that our test will need to do. Um, so we just have to start um, writing and integrating our unit tests and component tests um, using SysTest and ATL um, to really start you know, driving value and, and um, getting rid of end user testing on you know, common stuff. <clears throat> um, next, we're going to cover automated release. This has been out for a while, but I just wanted to touch on it real quick. Um, you can release uh, from Azure DevOps to LCS2 uh, or to UAT. Unfortunately, production is not currently supported. Um, but inside DevOps, you can um, set up a pipeline to build. And then as the, after the result of that build, uh, create a release pipeline to send your deployable package over to LCS. Um, you can see it right there in LCS. It's easy to select from. Um, you don't have to download it to your machine and then re-upload it. Um, the only call out here is if you're doing this a lot, you will have to manually per, um, periodically clean, uh, clean up LCS just because there's no built-in functionality to you know, delete packages that are more than 60 days old with no reference to an environment or this, that, or the other thing. Um, but still, pretty easy. So um, as you're creating builds, they can just be sent over to LCS and you can take them from there. Um, conversely, you know, this is where the we see it start to see a lot of value is we can start um, setting up release pipelines to release to a specific environment. Any standard environment in LCS uh, we can, can be deployed to. Production is not currently supported. Uh, but what that means is um, here's an example of an LCS um, project. I have a client that has multiple um, standard acceptance test environments. I can deploy from a build with a release pipeline uh, to any of these on any schedule that I set, um, you know, really any of these will work. Um, and it'll send emails out and I can orchestrate, you know, when this would happen, let's say every Friday night, I want to play a new build and I send an email and say, here's what's in that build. Um, I can do that against all my standard environments, but not production. Um, you know, sort of lastly, um, if you want to find out more about how to configure um, this type of pipeline, um, there's a link here from again from Andrea um, for how to how to get that all configured. Um, so now uh, when we sort of take a look at all of that stuff that I, I've just talked about, we we look about look at and I call this the, the new feedback loop. Um, this is again a slide from Microsoft. This is more C sharp centric, uh, but it, it can apply uh, to us in a lot of areas as well. Um, 
you have your engineer, um, you know, working in Visual Studio using Azure repos like Git, um, and using test plans like Sys, um, SysTest and ATL, uh, in conjunction with pipelines, um, and that will build, um, so build, test, orchestrate, and deploy um, some of our apps, which will be finance and operations, uh, using uh, LCS. Um, and then inside LCS, we can get feedback as to what's going on in our apps, and then we'll go back to our engineer and our Azure boards to resolve. So it's um, this infinite loop of, you know, we deliver high quality code, we monitor it, we get feedback, um, you know, as things change, you know, let's say we added a table, that table now has a million records and um, we need to add some additional indexing, we'll get that feedback um, and address it and then go right back into Visual Studio to add that index um, commit it, do a pull request, and then complete the circle again. Um, so another way to look at this, um, and this is how Microsoft does it and how they deliver the product, um, is to you know release, release, deploy, operate, monitor, plan, code, build, test, um, and then just keep that going forever uh, because Microsoft, that's how Microsoft delivers it to us. We get 10 updates a year um, and we have to keep track of um, sort of all of our changes. Sometimes they, they do introduce um, breaking changes and we have to be prepared for those. Um, but really it's it's less just, you know, get software out the door and we never see it again. Two more, we're gonna have to continue to manage the stuff as Microsoft keeps on providing updates. Um, so we've covered a lot. Um, here are all the sources um, for various things um, that I've talked about in today's presentation. Uh, these are much more deeper dive articles uh, from myself. Um, Adria, who's a fellow MVP, and uh, Paul Heiskamp, who's also a fellow MVP, as well as Microsoft Docs. Um, so if you'd like to know more and start like getting your hands dirty and, and setting this up uh, for yourself, um, here's here's a lot of good documentation on how to do that. Um, but lastly, you know, just sort of in summary, you know, I think Git can really help you take your delivery to the next level with automation around building, testing, and deployment. So. Um, Thank you, everyone. Uh, right after um, this uh, presentation, my, my slide deck will be uploaded to my GitHub. So if you'd like to um, pick that up and take a look at all the links I included throughout the presentation, feel free. Thank you. Uh, did we have any questions? Thank you, Nathan. This is Rachit. Uh, uh, the session was really uh, a good beginner's guide for anyone who wants to embark on dev, uh, this Git uh, version control. I know this is so much in uh, an area of interest for every technical person. Everyone wants to use Git now for version control. So thanks a lot for sharing these insights. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, so first question is the way we can link uh, the change sets when we are using TFVC to the DevOps requirement, can we still do it in Git? Like when we do a pull request, can we link it to the DevOps requirements? Yes, we can. Um, and that's, um, it's optional. I typically set up that rule to be enforced um, so that when I commit something to a branch, it'll reject it and say, hey, I need to know what work item this relates to. Um, and then when you do a pull request for all commits on that branch, um, it will pull in all of the work items associated with all those commits onto your pull request. Right, that's a great uh, benefit because generally when we run a build, we need to identify which features or which bugs were uh, developed or fixed as a part of that release. So that answers, thank you for that. Uh, there is another question like uh, when we are using uh, Git as our version control, does it impact the way our release pipelines are configured, like there are some release tasks released by Microsoft to deploy uh, the packages in tier two environments. Does it impact if we use TFVC or Git in our build? Um, it does. Um, I believe it's the very first step uh, where you have to map your version control, um, okay. where you're pulling your code from to build. Um, so you'd associate that with Git, and you only do one folder. Um, and then I think it's step four, you have to basically tell it where to find your projects and where to find your code because now they're in the same place. Um, but yeah. it's very minimal. Um, I think Paul Heisterkamp actually wrote an article on, on how to find that. And I believe that was uh, one of the linked um, articles that I had near the end. Uh, but but otherwise, you just it, 
the build pipeline doesn't specifically care so long as it knows where to find its projects and where to find its code. You, you could host it in Subversion if you really wanted to. I mean, please mm -hmm. don't. Uh, but the pipeline doesn't care where it gets the code from, just as long as it consistently can find that code. Perfect. Thanks for that. And just one more last question, like, are there any uh, best practices or guidelines around naming convention for these branches, which developers create when they do a pull request? Um, not really that I'm aware of. Um, the branches themselves, when you make them, um, will be should be tied to a work item. Um, and um, Paul actually wrote an article on that as well um, that I referenced. Um, when you make a new work item, you can just say make a new branch for this work item, and that takes your branch, whatever it's called, and ties it to that work item. Um, so you don't necessarily need to know branches or naming conventions. You know, it could just be branch work item 154. It, it, it doesn't really matter because you put the two together and then you can't separate them. Cool. A lot of comments about the appreciation of this session, Nathan. Uh, everyone is liking this uh, so thanks a lot for coming on a sunday and giving this session and sharing your time with us we really appreciate it yeah no problem um and if you have any more questions or follow-ups you know I'm, I'm on twitter um so feel free to question you know send questions there yeah we all are following you there yeah, yeah. thank you cool. all right thank you nathan have a good day thank you too Cheers. Hi, Ratchet. Hey, Kamar. That was such a good session from Nathan. Indeed, it was. So yeah. I think we are now moving towards the last session, AMR. And, hey, everyone. Uh, so, right, so what we're going to do now is that we will uh, stream live um, you know, our next session, which is about certifications and Microsoft Learn. Um, so it's going on in our Power Platform stream, but don't worry if you are tuned into this stream, um, I'll just bring it live in a few moments. And we'll just have one more promo to watch. So when you watch the promo, I'll bring it up. All good. All good. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Just. Hi, uh, thank you, Ruj, for having us. Uh, I guess uh, the session may I let's see how this session goes. Is the share the recording, and in case uh, we need to answer anything, feel free to contact us. So, first of all, uh, everyone, I think I'll be good to start, uh, Ruj. If that's okay yes yes sure all right brilliant so first of all um thank you um for joining me and Majid. Uh, and sadly this is uh, going to be the last session of uh, this amazing uh, three days of urdu hindi boot camp 2021 uh, we have gone through lots of lots of uh, sessions have learned uh from the many of the great speakers Microsoft MVPs and Microsoft professionals, jinhone apne apne experience, apni knowledge, aap logo ke saath share ki. I hope ke aap logo ko wo useful laga hoga, and I'm hoping ki ye jo session se hamara uh, it will help you out as well in your career planning. So before I start and go further, can I just check if you guys can see my screen? I can. Okay, perfect. All right. So let's get the ball rolling. So 
let me know if it's going okay. Uh, okay. All right. So this session, uh, we will be talking about, I think this is going to cover Microsoft Learn and Microsoft Certification. So I welcome you all, Hoshamdi, and Aap Sabka Swagat. And uh, moving further, I will now go through the agenda. And uh, before even I go to the agenda, um, let me just introduce myself so you know who you uh, who we are and what uh, what we have been doing and what sort of knowledge we carry at the moment to share with you. So myself, uh, I'm Mohammed Atif. I'm the VP Solution and Services, Magic Global. Uh, I got the 20 plus years of experience on solution design and delivery. I got a number of certifications uh, as I've earned it during, throughout my career. Uh, I'm the Princeton certified, I'm the Scrum Masters, I'm the Togo certified, and I got a few Microsoft certifications as well. As my day to day, I'm empowering and supporting my customers in their journey to digital transformation. And this is all using the Dynamics 365 and Power Platform, which I am enjoying it and loving it. And that's the reason I'm sitting in front of you guys as well. Uh, other than my day-to-day -day job, I'm actively involved in many Dynamics and Power Platform community. I'm also one of the organizer, uh, organizer for uh, Pakistan UG. Uh, and will continue to support this uh, community activities. I'm happily married with two uh, lovely daughters, uh, Anaya and Alisa. And uh, when I don't have anything else, which is very, very rare, but uh, I like to spend some time with friends and family and uh, to keep myself fit, uh, at least uh, uh, to keep myself ready for the work. So I love playing badminton and do some sort of exercise and traveling. So that's what I do. Majid, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Atil. So myself, Majid Ali Nagori. Well, I, I have a 15 years plus experience, mostly in uh, I think Majid, uh, is that me or I think I'm noticing some internet issue? Uh, let is me, better now? Let's, let's try it again. Okay. Let's try it again. <laughs> okay, let's continue from there. I think I have left. So I have 15 plus of uh, years of experience and I'm Microsoft certified trainer for 13 years now. Alhamdulillah. And other than that, most of my experience is uh, uh, Microsoft related, providing enterprise services. Well, earlier uh, I was providing. Uh, Ajit, could you please turn off your screen uh, camera so that it would be, I think, better that we can hear you. Yeah, exactly. Please turn off your camera. Let's try that. So is it better now? Yep, much better. OK. So I have done, uh, I don't know, uh, so many certification, mostly in Microsoft. But other than that, I'm ITIL certified, and I'm CH certified. And uh, I have also done some certification in networking also. Uh, as far as Microsoft is concerned, I'm working since the era of uh, We're still having yeah. problem to hear you. All right. So, 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 Majid, if you can kindly check uh, your connections while I'll continue in the meantime, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so that 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 was a very interrupted <laughs> Majid introduction. I uh, hope you can see the, on the screen, but feel free to contact for more details about Majid. Uh, so, I'll move on to the I think uh, the topic uh, or the agenda what we'll be covering. Um, 
we will start our agenda and cover the introductions. Uh, what is this session about? Uh, I'll try to keep it very, very high level. Uh, I'm conscious this is the last uh, session and everyone is really tired and it's Sunday as well. So we'll keep it very, very short. Then we'll talk about the tools, uh, what uh, Microsoft has provided us is Microsoft Learn. And then uh, we will be talking about Microsoft Learn TV. This is another platform which helps lots of um, uh, professionals and people like me to learn more. So we'll uh, give a little bit more insight what exactly it's all about. And then we'll go to the main topic of the day is the Microsoft certifications, what we have it and how you can get more out of it. OK, so that's what we'll cover in the meantime, if you have any particular questions you want to ask, feel free to leave the comments. Um, uh, if you are using LinkedIn or Facebook or, or YouTube, just leave the comments and uh, our moderator teams uh, should be able to pick it up and we'll answer it. And if you don't end up having a lot of time left, then definitely we'll come back to you uh, through the emails and you can respond it. OK, uh, let's uh, move on then. Introduction. So in these three days uh, of event, uh, I guess we have learned a lot of things, functionalities, dynamics, ki, power platform ki capabilities. Uh, our Microsoft professionals have given us a product roadmap. Ka thoda sa idea diya hume. Bahut sare logon ne implementation ex ki jo experience hai, jo challenges hai, wo sare chize share ki. Humne bahut sare chize learn ki. God knows how many other things. There's a long list. If you'll see, go back to the agenda. So we see a lot of lot of things we have learned. So ab iske baad, what exactly uh, we need to do? How you get involved? How you uh, up the skill yourself, you, uh, you need to improve or enhance your skill set uh, for your career. So we will be talking in this session. So how you can start your learning journey about the platform itself, because this is all the platform here. You have seen it, people talking about it. Even people have shared it, how they have been using it and how they can better use it in the situation where we are. This uh, COVID situation, this is a very, very weird time. We are, all have been going through. And that's this time is forcing us uh, like, uh, you know, for the ongoing continuous business transformation. Uh, this is forcing us and especially businesses as well that they need to start considering and they are doing it. A lot of people have started considering that how they need to move into the digital transformation. Things have changed. People are not going to the shops anymore because six o'clock in Pakistan, uh, everything is closed, but you still have to do. Girls have to still do shopping, how they can live without it, right? So we need to provide them the platform. And this is where we will be helping and Microsoft is ready to help. So how you have to do it? So this certification will give you an age with the industry recognized skills and credential that would help you to enhance your career and become part of the successful implementation and delivery team. Avoid implementation or delivery team depend on your career path, your uh, interest, your functional, you can be a tester, you can be a developer, you can be a solution architect, you can be a delivery leads, you can be a project manager. There are so many options available in the, through this platform. Okay, so we'll be touching all these things and then it will definitely give you some idea how to move forward. So to start this, what we have, Microsoft Learn. So what Microsoft has done it, Microsoft has created a platform to help you learn at the pace of this fast change. This is going through, right? So this is a platform. So this is a one-stop shop, I would say, that you anything you want to learn, just come here and learn it. So what it is, MS Learn, is Microsoft Learn, is an online platform that offer free interactive hands-on training. And the beauty is, is 24 hours, seven days a week. So you don't have to even wait uh, for the evening or uh, go to offices or some training institute. 
you are just there turn on your laptop connect with the internet and there you go your training is start so this is all there on the fingertips right and these training if you will see uh, uh, there is a link as well so when you will further explore it so these training the trainings are very much concise now and help you to learn the new technologies in a very very short span of time means ki aaj jo aapko sessions dekhenge usme content milenge pehle hamare paas ghanton ke wo sessions hote the to log sun rahe hain kar rahe hain isme aapke 5 minute 10 minutes 15 minutes maximum 60 minutes se zyada ke koi content nahi so it will help you to quickly learn things and pick up without getting bored so this is the platform जो कि आप अपनी लर्निंग को मैनेज करने के लिए भी कर सकते हैं इसको आप टैग कर सकते हैं इसको बुक मार कर सकते हैं इसके अंदर कुछ पॉइंट सिस्टम है दैट हेल्प्स मी टू मोटिवेट कि मुझे आगे भी पढ़ना है क्योंकि मैं देख सकता हूं कितने पॉइंट्स अर्न कर लिए हैं तो वो सारी चीजें आपको इस प्लेटफॉर्म पे मिलेंगी मूविंग फर्दर इन दिस सो इफ यू विल सी फर्दर ऑन द लर्न माइक्रोसॉफ्ट लर्न इज एक्चुअली consolidated all the training asset and all related material at one place so you will find everything here and before we were spending hours and hours of the long materials reading it through getting bored is not anymore right this is a very very simple and it's kind of a mix modality of some of the text video quizzes uh, hands on lab which is a beauty so you can see and that would help you to learn think quickly so without any instructor lead sessions microsoft has uh, implemented this platform in a way that you are working with some instructor and they are just guiding you okay do this and now do the follow the steps do the hands on lab and i will check it so they are giving you everything and someone is checking it for you you are earning the point so this is the platform will help okay so that's another aspect and if you will go further how do you track and when you're going through this microsoft learn you will see a terms or somewhere on the link you will see the learning path so what is a learning path is actually learning path guide you the series of logically connected module based on your chosen career journey okay so you can pick up any route and you will see in that learning path all the related contents all the modules which helps you to quickly pick up things and as you are learning uh, you pick up any certain path you will see there are some points available you are running it so that's called xp if you will see on the screen xp is the experience point so as you are going through with your learning you can carry on and it will start adding up in your profile which uh, obviously we are all living in the social world and we love to share all the good news of our achievements on the social media with our friends and family to usi cheez ko concept ko zehen mein rakhte hue microsoft ne un cheez ko implement kiya hai to aap jab apni training kar rahe hain learning kar rahe hain all those points you can easily learn it okay so that would go through that would help you so just for your future reference when you're going into the microsoft learn learning path is a just a series of logically connected module based on your chosen career journey which you will see it and it will help you to do pick up what exactly you want to do it all right uh moving further uh, we talked about the microsoft learn tv uh, what is this learn tv is actually again you have seen microsoft learn uh, offering hundreds of free self paced learning module which you can use in your time but what does this uh, learn tv uh, helping how what is the purpose of this is actually expanding it further and what is expanding it's actually bringing lots of live stream session like this and many other sessions wo live stream mein bhi aa rahe hain wo shows bhi ho rahe hain usme instructional aapke paas video hai guidance hai वो कौन दे रहा है माइक्रोसॉफ्ट के एक्सपर्ट्स माइक्रोसॉफ्ट के एडवोकेट्स माइक्रोसॉफ्ट इंजीनियरिंग टीम के पीपल माइक्रोसॉफ्ट कम्युनिटी जो कि पीपल लाइक पाकिस्तान यूजर ग्रुप 
ये सारे प्रोफेशनल हैं जो कि अपना टाइम निकाल के आपके लिए कंटेंट तैयार कर रहे हैं आपके लिए सेशंस कर रहे हैं तो आपको विदाउट थिंकिंग एनीथिंग देयर इज ऑलवेज समथिंग ऑन इट इवन इफ यू विल गो ना यू विल सी देयर आर सम सेशन हैपनिंग सो यू कैन पिक इट अप एंड कैरी ऑन लर्निंग सो दिस इज द वन स्टॉप शॉप टू लर्न एंड ग्रो एंड आई हैव पुट दिस लिंक एज़ वेल सो व्हेनेवर यू गेट चांस सो यू कैन गो टू द microsoft.com स्लैश लर्न एंड टीवी यू विल सी द मोर रेलेवेंट इंफॉर्मेशन देयर okay and then the last one is comes to the main topic microsoft certifications uh majid are you there now yep i am okay do you want to share your screen or you want to you just go through uh well i already shared so i'm ready for that okay so there you go so guys uh, dosto uh, atif has already told us uh, a lot about uh, all the session and the things and the areas that we are going to cover but there are certain things that i would like to add uh, there is one thing one confusion that uh, that is for the uh, you know experienced professional they might think of this learn platform as a new it is it is new and they might think that it might uh, uh, you know th th there is some confusion uh, with this platform like earlier if uh, any of the you know uh, any of the professional who has some experience would remember that there were couple of platforms like there was a technet there was a msdn and then there were blogs and all that different stocks scattered where you use to get information and uh, where you want to or you would you would use to you know connect with the community but this this platform learn learn is also part of another big platform which is called docs.microsoft.com so this documentation or docs platform it is actually consolidated in everything here you can not only learn new things you can also interact with the the community you can also take part in uh, improving the content by suggesting anything so there are so many uh, uh, aspects of this learn platform that i'm really uh, would like to share and we will uh, we will go in depth uh in that area also while we will be demoing for demoing you so certifications so although certification is really a big uh, space uh, so that might uh, you know we might not be able to cover everything but what we will do we will try to focus on uh, with the audience that uh, uh, this event is all about dynamics and power platform but i would i would like to give you an overview of uh, some other areas also because microsoft is a really a uh, big tech company which has which has different aspects like you know whenever we think of a uh, uh, i'm just giving an example whenever we think of uh, you know whenever a name comes oracle we know that we are talking about database or maybe if uh, you know uh, some of us know that it, uh, you know it's acquisition so we can uh, we can uh, tell that okay uh, well oracle is also working in java and some other areas possibly but these are the two things that you can tell about oracle but when it comes to microsoft well practically microsoft has everything like they have database which is uh, which is really successful and implementing implemented uh, you know uh, throughout the industry uh, with really uh, you know enterprise class uh, uh, application for example even sap is supported uh, with the sql so they have database when it comes to erp well they have erp which is this dynamics 365 when it comes to cloud microsoft has a cloud and it is a really big cloud well they statically speaking they are uh, uh, you know commercially number 2 and they posted a really good numbers this uh, quarter so they are growing and growing so that was natural like since microsoft is uh, leading uh, multiple areas in the technology so the idea behind having the certificate is to act, is to accredit a person Who who has a level of uh, uh, you know level of knowledge? Uh, for example, I I will say, what is the way that you have some experience? So, what would be the way for you to get industry and people know that yes, you have some experience? So, definitely, uh, the way would be if you get accredited by the uh, that technology provider. In our case, Microsoft. So, that is 
uh, that is why certifications are necessary and it is not only that uh, you need certification to get yourself accredited but trust me uh, i'm with the industry for like 15 plus years so most of my experience uh, i got knowledge i got from uh, self learning observation well, obviously uh, with my seniors and mentors but this certifications certifications also taught me a lot of things because what happens whenever we are doing of a day-to-day -day job or we are doing some uh, projects it, they, uh, that have some scope we cannot go beyond uh, you know the, too far beyond that scope but when it comes to get yourself certified for a particular technology we have to cover that technology with respect to that uh, the creator of that technology well again microsoft for example uh, I might uh, have, which I have, like, uh, you know, experience of working with cloud for like five plus years. Okay, let's say. But have I covered all of the areas of Azure and how I can, you know, verify that thing? And what, where, where would be, you know, a point? So there would be no point, by the way. Uh, <laughs> it is always learning. And that is, this is all about, this is the reason why uh, we put this tagline learn how to learn because this is something I have learned in my uh, you know 15 years plus of career like if you want to get into some uh, bandwagon technology so first you need to have your uh, resources you need to identify those resources and then you need to understand those so this would be our uh, you know uh, our prime uh, objective of this session we will actually you know teach you how to learn uh, I would like to tell you guys this uh, a saying. There is a Japanese quote, like, so maybe rather than I have been doing a course, I have to say that 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 I have to say so that is the that is the more, you know, core of learning. So whenever we hear something, so yes, we we tend to remember that for some time. But when we do it or when we see it, we we tend to remember it a longer period of time for a longer period of time. But when we perform it or when we teach someone, this is where we actually gain the experience, and that remains with us. This is how our brain functions, our neurons. I don't know. Well, we are going too much into science. So let's focus on the uh, our main topic of uh, this certifications. So Microsoft provides certification for different area. Microsoft 365, which is one area. Microsoft 365 is Microsoft Online Services, uh, SaaS services. Uh, it has Office 365, the most popular productivity suite and uh, which has uh, exchange online sharepoint online teams and OneDrive or cloud storage and there are so many things also uh, uh you know small applications also part of this uh, uh, suite then microsoft has a uh, certification for data and ai where uh, data also include these databases and all that so we used to have sql certified uh, you know mcse but now it is part of uh, a bigger picture which is data and uh, Microsoft is also Microsoft also provides you know a complete tool set for AI and uh, machine learning ML EMS EMS is a security suite for Microsoft so enterprise mobility plus security to uh, to control to secure the endpoints uh, well our mobile devices our desktop PC servers everything when now uh, these comes uh, into the picture world Dynamics 365, Power Platform, and Azure. These are the three big platforms uh, provided by Microsoft. So Azure is a fundamentally, uh, uh, well, fundamental technology for all, all of the services that are provided here, even Dynamics, Dynamics 365, which is a cloud-based uh, platform, is it is deployed in a, uh, on Azure. When we, when we talk about any service, any service for Microsoft, well, behind the main, engine the behind the main platform which is uh, well, those services are running is azure so you must understand how important this is so well 
let, let's move forward so I can tell you like how to move your career, how to advance your career into a particular area. We will primarily be focusing on uh, Power Platform and uh, Dynamics 365 for now, but uh, you are more than welcome to connect us uh, anytime so to our LinkedIn profiles or our email addresses and uh, uh, we will provide you guidance. Uh, guidance. This is something I think we owe to the community. So, okay. So, uh, okay. Well, one more thing I would like to tell you. So, certification. Uh, certifications are really important, just like you know, uh, interviews, <laughs> because this is something I also suggest to my subordinates and my students that right? you, you should have. Uh, uh, you know, you should go to the industry and get yourself interviewed uh, by anyone, even if you don't want to change your organization, but it is good for you to, uh, you know, uh, give interviews so you would know like what exactly is running, uh, you know, what, what is going on uh, in the industry. You might think yourself as you are doing a lot of things or too much, but it might not be too much for you or for the requirement to get yourself, you know, uh, go with the pace of the technology innovation. So certification is also uh, has the same uh, criteria because technology changes. So does the certifications. So whenever you uh, attempt for a certification, you know, like, uh, you know, what exact area, even uh, if you won't succeed in getting, uh, you know, in uh, getting passed in, uh, for a success uh, for a certification, but you would know like, uh, uh, like uh, there, there must be some areas where you need to spend some time and this is where you will know the uh, importance of learn and this is why Microsoft actually is has combined this uh, learn and certification and everything all together so this is a well, an overview of uh, well most not all most of the certification provided my, by Microsoft uh, but uh, but this is not all. <laughs> uh, I can assure you that. Yeah. So I want to. Yeah, I want to emphasize on that this is not at all all. So this is a few subset of Azure, Microsoft, 365, Dynamics 365, and Power. There's a yeah. thousand and thousand of other certifications available. Yep. Yep. So, so are you ready? I might have a location holder from Microsoft. There isn't any, you know, charts published anywhere, but I think I have, you know, the highest number of certifications in Microsoft, which is, uh, I believe, 60 plus now. So that is a good number. So this is just for your motivation. I'm not into, any, I, I don't want to get into any, any race, but, you know, I just got an opportunity 15 years a lot. So this is something I actually, you know, I also suggest to every professional, whether it is my peer or subordinate or student or anyone, like you should attempt at least two to four certification per year. And I'm quite up to that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so, okay, uh, let's uh, discuss a certification. So there are a couple of certification. Uh, you don't need to worry about if you, you won't be able to read specifically uh, what these certifications are. Uh, we will tell you more. more uh, in the slides, but this is how there are certain uh, 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 you know levels that Microsoft uh, has actually levels MCP Microsoft Certified Professional, and then after uh, after clearing certain number of certification in a uh, defined pattern, we get uh, MCSA Microsoft Certified System Administrator or Solution Associate. Later, it was changed into Solution Associate. And then if we continue, uh, you know, getting certified into same track, we get uh, the title of MCSE, Microsoft Certified System Engineer at, you know, 10 years ago, and then Microsoft Certified Solution Expert, uh, you know, a couple of years back, two years back, uh, two or three years back. But now Microsoft has changed because technology and industry has changed. Now certifications has evolved into role-based certification. So what does, uh, what does that mean? So as Atif explained, like there are so many areas that you can uh, you can develop your career, you can pursue uh, for yeah, for example, you want to uh, you want to become a DevOps certified. If you want to uh, get certified, uh, you know, on, on Microsoft platform for DevOps, Microsoft has that. If you want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
actually uh, develop your career in data science or AI, you have that covered. If you want to, uh, you know, your uh, career in Power Platform, there are some certification for that. What What are those? We will uh, discuss that. And then Dynamics. Dynamics is, uh, by the way, this Dynamics and Power Platform, uh, well, are going away that uh, it might be confusing for some uh, some of us we will try to you know resolve uh, that confusion so let's move forward okay so Majid I'm just conscious of the time as well um, so we'll okay. quickly wrap up I think I am quite keen to give sort of a demo as well so we can quickly do the walkthrough on the Microsoft sure. Learn. So let me just quickly explain. Uh, as you may have noticed uh, on the chart earlier, there was some sort of a category defined like the label fundamental and the role base. So when you're exploring the Microsoft Learn, you will see certain level of uh, expertise or the label you will be doing some certification. So fundamental, this is actually the learning path for those people who are actually either new to the dynamics world or they are coming from the different they are even professional but they are coming from the different backgrounds maybe java people i've seen someone commented me on, on the linkedin that uh, he's thinking to move from java to the dynamics world uh, I, I will welcome him uh, with both hands definitely but uh, this is a uh, certification which will help you to understand actually get the flavor of everything not in great detail but it will be good enough to understand when people are talking about the dynamics you will say yeah okay that makes sense that's what i know it when they will talk about the finance they will talk about the supply chain they will talk about the ce or power platform that will give you enough information to pick it up but when you want to move further into the further detail they uh, so associate level and associate level core is actually regardless of the any industry or the module you will understand a little bit more into the finance maybe in the supply chain or ce so once you have done the fundamental then you can easily move into the certain um, certification that would cover and give you the core knowledge and then it will further specify as a specialization so in certain area where you want to deep dive into the certain area like the finance that I want to become champion of finance than anyone implementing finance module and if they need any help then I'm the person so you as a specialized person in that area uh, you can attempt the certification for that and the last one is for the people expert we call expert normally the solution architect who are covering everything and they are the people who are mainly and mostly involved with the stakeholders requirement with the business so they can map things so they know inside out so this that level will be called as an expert we'll go into the demonstration and we can obviously show you what sort of an expert level certification we have it there yes Majid Majid are you there or you got the internet issue again so uh, yeah I think, uh, yeah okay uh, well if you can hear me, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you now. So, uh, Atif has really told us a really good, uh, you know, point about this. Uh, uh, the is not uh, uh, only for the newcomers uh, who want to, uh, you know, pursue in a career, but they, it is also good for anyone who want to learn something new. Or, uh, you know, it is like uh, well. As it says master master the basics so it will actually you know get into that lingo so you will understand like uh, you know what exactly this uh, technology or this track is all about so fundamental it is not required but it is it is highly recommended to uh, to learn to to get uh, trained on uh, or if you want to then get certified on Microsoft well, great usually you know uh, occasionally provide uh, you know especially in this COVID era Free certification for fundamentals for their specific uh, program, which is uh, called virtual training days. So you guys are uh, encouraged to look into those trainings. So fundamentals 900. If you want to start your career, if you want to understand what Power Platform is all about, you should uh, start from 
PL. Uh, I will uh, tell you, uh, you know, more about it. How to get started on uh, this and how to identify what, uh, how to actually, you know, uh, to, to define your learning path in your uh, in Microsoft Learn. Then uh, you, these are the actually uh, actual tracks, associate tracks. And uh, as you can, uh, you know, uh, as you can see uh, this, this by their name, like, you know, this particular certification PL100 is for platform app maker. So anyone who want to, uh, you know, uh, who want to uh, develop apps, uh, well, uh, I'm not saying basic or something, but you know, just uh, because Power Apps are actually uh, they have uh, uh, this uh, like uh, punchline: no code or low code application. So this is for those who who really don't want to code much or who don't have uh, you know most experience in coding, but they can even start from here. So for functional consultant, why we have functional consultant in Power Platform, we will tell you more about in coming slides. But if you want to, uh, you know, build your career as a functional consultant for Power Platform, so PL200 is uh, uh, is something for you. And then if, uh, for a core developer, for a backend developer, so Power Platform developer uh, certification is for those. And this data analyst, you might see as a yeah, Majid, uh, we are running out of time. So can we just quickly run through and maybe you can use the last two minutes uh, for okay. the quick walkthrough please. So yeah, everyone can sure. oh, obviously uh, people can go into the Microsoft Learn, explore it and feel free to get in touch for further detail. But there are a list of so I really want to uh, do the quick walkthrough on the platform itself, please. OK, we got two minutes. So yeah. So you will get this recording. So just for the sake of, uh, you know, getting these covered, let me go through these slides. Uh, so this is something. So Power Platform and Dynamics, especially uh, CRM track, they uh, they run together. So, so well, that, uh, another punchline. So better together. So you will see like, you know, some, uh, some of the certification, well, all of the certification of CRMs are uh, achieved uh, after getting certified on PL200. So these are the uh, some, uh, you know, areas of dynamic CRM. And then after that, we have the last of our slide, which covers the ERP section of Dynamics 365. So there are some, uh, uh, some uh, like uh, tracks for uh, finance functional consultant for sub supply chain of area. And then even we have a app developer track for uh, Dynamics 365. Uh, well finance and operation and this is a new thing which is a business central which is based on the microsoft uh, dynamics Net